four planning board members present thus far. I'm sure we will have the fifth momentarily. Um, we have Madam Vice Chair Bailey, Commissioner Washington, Commissioner Dorner, and myself, obviously. And, um, and we have our counsel, Peter Goldsmith. Everybody will be introduced before we go to development review. But for now, I, it, um, we need a motion to go into closed session pursuant to Section 3-305B7 and B8 for the purposes of consultation with counsel to obtain legal advice and to consult with um, counsel and staff regarding potential litigation. Is there such a motion? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. We have a motion from um, Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Bailey and seconded by Commissioner Washington. Uh, Vice Chair Bailey? Good aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Um, the ayes have it 4-0. We will return um, in open session after our closed session. And of course, for anyone who signed up for development review, we will not be taking any of those cases before 1030. Thank you. Thank you. A move. Um, Commissioner Washington made a motion. Second. Second by Commissioner Dorner. Second. Um, okay. Um, Madam Vice Chair. I feel discriminated against. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. She's muted. I'm mute, please. Yeah, go on. Okay. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay, Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Um, I, what I think is there's a little delay on your part there. Not you, but on your com computer. Uh, you would never be delayed. Okay, so we're back in open session. Before we go to our development re <laughs> review items, we have item 3C, which is a briefing on the Bowie, Mitchellville, and vicinity master plan. Mr. Rowe and Mr. Lester. Mr. Lester, okay, are you are you going to start? Sure. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can we can hear you. Oh, there's Mr. Rowe. Okay. Okay. Please. I didn't know who was going to. You're going to start, Mr. Lester. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the planning board. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the Mr. Mitchell Master Plan project. Uh, next slide. Yeah. My name is Thomas Lester with the Community Planning Division, Long Range Planning Section, and I'm joined today uh, by Andrew McCray, Deputy Project Manager, as well as Scott Royal, Project Facilitator and Supervisor of the Long Time uh, Planning Section. Uh, next slide. Uh, th today I would like to provide a quick project overview and a summary of the public participation program uh, that we executed in the last eight months. Uh, then a summary of some of the major challenges as well as opportunities that we identified throughout our outreach efforts. And then I'll conclude with our next steps and the roadmap to complete the project in the next few years. Uh, feel free to ask any questions or provide any feedback on the information that you hear today uh, during the presentation. Uh, so the two main goals of the, of the master plan are to advance the policies outlined in the county general plan, transfer to the side, and provide specific implementable strategy to meet the vision of the area and create a long-term plan. Uh, we are currently crafting the vision statement based off the input from the community and other stakeholders, uh, which will be posted on our website for community input shortly. Uh, focus area. Part of implementing Plan 2035 is direct growth uh, to certain areas, such as the local town center, uh, the State University, the State, and so you can go to the next slide for focus area. Uh, Bowie State Mark Station Campus Center, Old Town Bowie, and the College and Trade Zone. And we're also focusing on the three major corridors, Merrill 197, uh, 450, and US 301. Uh, now let's go over a public participation program. Uh, and all that we've done since June 13th when we kicked off the project to the public. Uh, after that kick, 
kick off, we have held several virtual events and used various methods to gather public input um, as, as much as we could in this new digital environment. On September 16th, we introduced a draft existing conditions report and held a public presentation, uh, a meeting that provided an overview of the major findings. At this meeting, we did form small discussion groups to talk about the challenges and opportunities identified in the report, and that full report is posted on our website to download and review. Uh, we also held an eight-part uh, meeting series called Community Chat. Um, next slide, please. Uh, from September to October, uh, one for each of the planning elements, which includes land use and transportation, and among the many others that you can see listed on the slide. Uh, these meetings were set up in a way that allowed for the open discussion between staff and participants. Um, people could ask direct questions and provide the input on the topic. And next slide. Okay. So in terms of attendance, we did have pretty good attendance, including a couple of community champions who attended most, if not all, of the meetings. And as you can see, mid housing in neighborhoods was the most popular category. Next slide. So we also found two focus area tours. Uh, in our original public participation, participation plan, these were meant to be in, in prison workshops. Um, however, in this case, we did turn to video uh, and focused on two of our uh, major centers, Old Town Bowie and um, uh, Bowie Town Center. The next one. Okay. And throughout the last several months, we we have held various meetings with stakeholders, including property owners and different agencies across the county. We've also offered office hours. Uh, these were specific dates and times that people could sign up to talk freely about any topic uh, with staff members in a more intimate setting. Next slide. We also conducted a survey of students that attend Blue State University. And this was accompanied by uh, three focus groups that center around the university and the neighboring uh, areas and issues uh, that students face uh, from a planning perspective. These were mostly focused on transportation, retail development, and connectivity to other areas nearby and beyond. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, we held a public presentation introducing the playbook of strategies. Uh, this playbook is a document that reviews the information from the existing conditions report, feedback received from the community and stakeholders, and then created the design schemes for key locations in the plan area. Uh, but the playbook also includes um, a matrix of strategy uh, that cover uh, each of the plan elements. Next slide. And just to recap, the refresher, uh, each master plan is made up of eight plan elements, economic prosperity, housing neighborhoods, land use, transportation and mobility, community heritage, culture and design, healthy, healthy communities, public facilities, and the natural environment. And this master plan is part of that structure. Okay. So let's take a look at each of the plan elements and some of the information or major findings that we've heard uh, directly from the community and our outreach efforts. Uh, in terms of economic prosperity, one of the frequent concerns raised by residents, um, a theme that has been discussed across the county, is access to the higher end retail and restaurants. There is a desire to have these amenities closer to home rather than having to travel outside the current area with the county. In this area in particular, there is an unmet spending gap, meaning there is potential for businesses to locate here and meet that gap, but there are other factors, such as population density, that will continue to make this challenging. There's also a part, there's also an issue with vacant retail space. The more recent closures of the larger retailers like Trust Fund in Sears has made an impact, and with this loss of anchors, it's making it the more challenging for the smaller retailer tower to get the foot traffic needed to keep these shopping centers alive. And with the pandemic, this trend is more likely to continue into the future, uh, which means we do have to generally consider these vacant properties a uh, key location moving forward. So on the bright side, the existing conditions report does show that the Collington trade zone is part of the county's healthy industrial market uh, that is in high demand. And that this area of the trade zone is well positioned to help fill that need 
uh, and has room for expansion. Next slide. Moving on to housing neighborhoods, there's a shortage in the amount of student housing. This was data from the students and also um, from the campus planner. Uh, the survey shows that the majority of students do drive to campus, but there is a desire to live on or much closer to campus. However, the housing supply simply doesn't exist uh, that could accommodate this need. So the question here is, where can this housing be accommodated? Uh, whether it's the vacant land to the north or the campus or other places like Old Town Dewey. Another theme, uh, not just concerning housing and neighborhoods, but across nearly all of the planning elements is the need uh, to plan for the aging population. In this case, it's the need for more housing types. Uh, I know you've heard it before, but many families have matured in the area and their households have shrunk and there's, a need, there's no longer a need for the larger homes. Uh, many of these residents are looking to downsize, but so want to stay in the neighborhood. Um, but currently the area just doesn't offer the housing types, such as condos or the smaller house that will meet those needs for their budget. And lastly, this was made clear to residents who have great concern of growth in housing development. Um, the growth of housing development before the amenities and the infrastructure this is rooted in their experiences uh, with traffic and the perception of the overcrowding school. Many developments have been approved in the plan area, and residents feel that this development will outpace the uh, ability to meet the needs for new and existing residents. Next slide. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so, next concern is what to do with the Dewey Ice Rink project uh, since it's been canceled. Um, it's pretty certain that there will be some future recreational facility, but the question is uh, what recreational space, what that recreational space will be, uh, and how it can be utilized the best for the project. Uh, as we already said, there is a concern for new development and infrastructure. The biggest concern in new development is high density residential development, uh, specifically apartments and towns, there, like those being proposed uh, at former sites like. Um, the marketplace shopping center. Now, there is a desire to, uh, I guess, bring more light to these two destinations, but the preference is to introduce different uses other than residential or higher density residential to achieve, achieve that desire. Uh, and that brings us to the challenge. And another issue that is seen across the country is how to attract these uh, aging retail centers. There are opportunities to perform facelifts or to convert to new uses. In regards to the effectiveness of making physical improvements to attract tenants, there are lots of examples uh, across the county, but also within the plan area. Um, and this includes True State Shopping Center and Dewey Marketplace. Next slide. Okay, so the Bowie area overall does have a decent tree canopy coverage, uh, particularly on the east of uh, US 301. As described in the resource conservation plan, there are many areas that can be evaluated to improve coverage across the county, and this can occur incrementally as development ensues. Uh, many are concerned about the loss of tree canopy, and this stems from new developments that clear the trees and um, that they, the residents don't necessarily see off-site mitigation of tree planting elsewhere. Uh, there's also a desire to add more trees in existing development, such as shopping centers that have that overabundance of parking. Uh, there's also a lot of interest on climate change and how the plan can address the area's impact on climate and what can be done at that local level. The City of Bowie's Sustainability Plan is a great example of the ways small geographies can do their part in minimizing impacts. Uh, as you know, climate change is one of our greatest challenges, and I have to admit that it's inspiring to see this enthusiasm uh, from residents to see what they can do on that individual level. And then lastly, there is a concern about addressing stormwater runoff in new and existing development in areas that are already prone to flooding, and how this issue can be mitigated uh, now and in the future. Next slide. Uh, so one of the areas of major concern with transportation is pedestrian and bicycle safety in areas that have a high number of pedestrians, like the shopping centers along US 301 and Maryland Port Safety. 
but also areas like Church Road that have less pedestrian traffic but have proven hostile to those who try to traverse these streets. Uh, with that said, there is an avid bicycle and vehicle community in the planned area that do commend the existing trail network, uh, but also lament over the lack of bike lanes uh, along major corridors and would like to see the expansion of this type of infrastructure and also to execute the construction of the many trails that have been planned but not built. And then lastly, because there is a desire to bring more visitors to Old Town B, it amplifies, amplifies the parking issues in that area. There isn't enough uh, nearby parking to accommodate uh, the working vision of the area uh, to make it one of the cultural and historic centers. Uh, for Bowie, uh, and part of improving the pedestrian environment uh, will help make that connection to existing parking and the ultimate destinations of, uh, I guess, the key areas of that planning area or that uh, focus area. Um, next slide. And this all ties into the desire of the community to celebrate the history of Old Town Bowie with various events and festivals and using this area as one of the ways to, um, I guess, uh, uh, use the historic resources for tourism and community pride. And this can be complemented with raising awareness about many of the locally designated historic sites that people don't know about um, and to implement the planned expansion of the Anacostia Heritage Trail. Uh, all of which have been expressed by the community. Next slide. Another concern is access to supermarkets. Uh, many residents must drive when, uh, when they would rather walk or travel shorter distances. Uh, there is a definite need and market for a grocery store in the northern part, portion of the San area, such as around Dewey State University and Old Town Bees. Part of this desire is to <coughs> Uh, to provide access to healthier food options um, and also the expansion of urban agriculture and farmers markets um, in that area. Next slide. Okay, uh, overall the public facilities in the plant area are adequate and we haven't received much concern from the community regarding libraries, uh, police, fire, and EMS. Uh, but one of the concerns raised has less to do with access to recreation facilities uh, because we have seen access to recreation areas is pretty strong. Uh, but instead, the concern seems to center around the types of facilities being offered. Specifically, there is a desire for more athletic fields and courts in certain areas, and also the introduction of multi-generational spaces that bring different generations together. Uh, and caters to the entire family instead of just one smaller sector of it. Um, and then lastly, there is an overwhelming concern about overcrowding of schools, especially with new development occurring. The data shows um, on current utilization standards that the majority of schools within the planning area are either on target or underutilized. However, there are three elementary schools that have been identified. Uh, for being over the um, acceptable uh, utilization rate. And then uh, to talk about our scheduling. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, just to recap, we did initiate the master plan in February. Uh, we kicked it off with the public in June, and we've worked with a consultant since then and the community and stakeholders to produce the final existing report that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we then, next slide. Uh, yeah, so we then uh, produced the playbook of strategies and presented it to the public in November. And now we've started drafting the master plan that will be presented uh, next year around some of time. And then next slide. And then after that, we will continue through the legislative process with an anticipated planning board adoption date in December 2021 and district council approval in the spring of 2022. Uh, so what are our immediate next steps? Can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, well, since we drafted this presentation, we have organized a public outreach input and feedback by plan element 
which helped form today's presentation and also the early stages of formulating the master plan. Uh, we have started writing portions of the plan by plan element, and as we continue through this process, we will identify the topic areas where we need more expertise from other staff members, outside agencies, and stakeholders, and feedback from the community. And we'll continue through this editing process uh, and produce that staff draft uh, in the middle of next year. Uh, during this time, we do hope to keep the district council, the planning board, uh, and the city of the upstate on the project. And then, in conclusion, um, on behalf of the entire project team, I thank you for this opportunity to come and provide a project update. And I also want to say that I'm thankful for the community's desire uh, to come together in these trying times and participate in the planning process uh, to set up the vision for this area. And thank you. Okay, Mr. Lester, we greatly appreciate the presentation, the update. Um, it's great, and, and um, we're so thankful that the community has uh, participated to such a great extent. So I don't know if there are any comments or not. I know we're um, starting to run a little bit behind, but let's see if there's any comments or not. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? No comments, but thank you for the presentation. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Washington? No questions. Also, thank you for the presentation. Commissioner Dorner? Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was happy to see that you have something about the um, bike connectivity. Is it, if you try and go from like Bowie State into Jackson River, um, like the research uh, facility and stuff, and into the park, there's really no good way of getting there. Um, if you go down a couple of the roads, the shoulder is very thin and, and very narrow, so it's kind of hard to navigate back and forth. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing a little bit more protections on, on the biking and pedestrian side. Okay. And then Commissioner Gerardo. Okay. Uh, I just have one question. I want to thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, what suggestions would you have for improving the pedestrian safety at the intersections along 301 and the shopping centers? And the reason I ask you, I've been to other jurisdictions where uh, instead of just having a traffic light and having people try to dodge the traffic with the traffic lights, they build these pedestrian mm -hmm. bridges. Has there been any consideration for that? Yeah, so the, the place look strategy does look at that connection between the two uh, shopping centers, that straddle 301. Um, in terms of producing a pedestrian bridge, um, that has been looked at, I think it's been discussed in previous um, plans or discussions, and um, it is one of those uh, you know, extremely expensive and more long-term projects. So in terms of shorter term, it would be those um, humanized intersections um, that help uh, make these areas safer for pedestrians. But it is something that has been looked at, and there is uh, part of the design scheme and the playbook of strategies that uh, explore the options there. If, if I can add on to what Mr. Okay. Lester was saying. I was going to add on to what uh, Mr. Lesser was saying. Now, part of the challenges along US 301 is that it is currently and will continue to be planned to be upgraded to a full limited access freeway. And so uh, what we're looking at, especially in the area of Bowie Town Center, closer as you get closer to US 50, is the crossing of, the, uh, uh, of that future freeway from, from east to west. Um, what we're looking at for connectivity between the shopping centers on the west side of US 301 really is that north-south connectivity um, that would have to be um, created along the public rights of way or in between private properties um, to kind of make those connections as uh, the highway uh, US 301 is going to continue to get more auto-oriented mm -hmm. and less pedestrian friendly uh, as SHA implements a freeway along there. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Uh, that concludes our questions. That concludes the presentation. We're deeply appreciative um, and thank you for um, to all the citizens who have engaged as well. Um, so we look forward to the next presentation. Um, okay, um, so with that I'm going to 
that concludes our administrative items and our uh, closed session items. So I'm going to go to the announcements. Um, um, so again, good morning, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Hewlett, Chair of the Prince George's County Planning Board. Um, the Planning Board is now in session for its uh, December 10th, 2020 meeting. And in an abundance of caution resulting from the global spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the Planning Board's 31st virtual meeting since March. We did not miss a beat. During these continued challenging times, we remain committed to promoting a safe and healthy environment for our public, our applicants, our stakeholders, and our staff as we continue business operations to propel Prince George's County forward. I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone of the participation guidelines for our hearings. Speaker, pre-registration and pre-submission of comments and exhibits is required. Um, all participants must pre-register and all materials or exhibits, if any, must be submitted by 12 noon on the Tuesday before the planning board as shown on the screen as I announce in every weekly, pub, uh, weekly hearing, as posted on our website, and as clearly stated in bold red on our pla weekly planning board agenda. We announce this week in and week out and week in and week out. So it's imperative that everyone sign up in advance. Um, registered speakers and presenters connecting through a computer, tablet, or smartphone can join the meeting with the link provided via email from the planning board office. Online registered participants may be prompted to install GoToMeeting software in order to participate. Registered speakers may also listen or participate using a phone line. We ask all participants to mute your phones when not speaking, and I think we need to do that now, um, and to eliminate audio feedback, only one connected device with sound should be in a room at the same time. Of course, the public may continue to watch planning board meetings streamed live, or if you wish to become a person of record, you may sign up on our online web form. Please note the screen again for instructions. As always, we commence our meetings with a moment of silence, um, remembering those who passed away since our last meeting of December 3rd. Um, within our le um, legal community, we want to keep um, um, Bridget Ann Greer, um, Esquire, in our thoughts and prayers, and her family. She is a longtime accomplished attorney with the Prince George's County Attorney's Office. Um, tragically, she lost her nephew, her beloved nephew, who she helped raise, Byron Hicks, at age 18, who he was tragically killed in Montgomery, Alabama. His birthday would be on Monday. He would have turned 19 this coming Monday. Within Maryland, we want to remember the United States Senator Paul Sarbanes, age 87, who served five terms in the U.S. Senate, six years with the U.S. House of Representatives, and four years with the Maryland General Assembly. In 74, he drafted and introduced the first article of impeachment against then-President Richard Nixon, and he was also the co-author of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, um, also known as the Public Company Accounting Reform and Investor Protection Act. We want to remember the growing number of people who have succumbed to the widespread coronavirus. More than 15.6 million cases in the United States and, and over 294,000 deaths in the United States. This is tragic. Yesterday we broke another record. There were um, 3,157 deaths in the, reported in the United States yesterday. That is the first time it topped 3,000 in one day. Um, again, I want to remind everyone, these are, we cite these as statistics, but these are loved ones. These are um, folks, uh, these are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, um, children, I mean, it's aunts, uncles, I mean, they are people, they are loved ones, and we may know people who have succumbed as well. So we want to, to really wrap our arms around this, and there is a vaccine coming. We need to prepare for this, and we need to embrace this. It's been fully tested, um, because we really do want to put an end to this. But for now, we just want to remember those families and, and those people who passed on and their families and keep them in our thoughts and prayers. We want to remember David Lander, who is a TV actor best known for his role as Squiggy in Laverne and Shirley. Hello! Chuck Yeager, age 97, who was the legendary military pilot and the first person to break the sound barrier. He later trained crews for NASA, NASA's Gemini and Apollo programs. Rayford Johnson, age 86, who was the American decathlete. He won the gold medal Olympic um, 
the gold medal in the Olympic decathlon in 1960, and he was the first African-American athlete to carry the United States flag at the Olympic opening ceremony. In 1968, he, along with um, legendary Rosie Greer, um, raced to subdue the presidential candidate, Robert F. Kennedy, um, um, our Robert F. Kennedy's assassin at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Natalie DeSalle Reed, age 53, um, an actress who appeared in the film um, BAPS and Cinderella. Faye Fields, the founding partner for the Major League Baseball Washington Nationals. Dick Allen, former Major League Baseball MVP, played with the Phillies and White Sox. Hugh Keyes Byrne, who um, appeared in the film Mad Max, and um, Frank Carney, uh, Pizza Hut co-founder. And of course, we extend our deepest sympathy to any of you in our viewing audience or listening audience who may have suffered a loss of a loved one too. We extend our hearts to you. If we may have that moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, again, it's the month of December, which is AIDS Awareness Month, National Drunk and Drugged Driving 3D Prevention Month, Universal Human Rights Month, and National Pair Month. It is December 10th. In December 10th in 1817, Mississippi was admitted as the 20th State of the Union. 1936, Edward VIII, King of the United um, Kingdom and the then uh, Dominions of the British Empire, abdicated the throne after just under one year to marry twice divorced American Wallace Simpson, and they remained married for 35 years until his death. 1948, the, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, hence December is Universal Human Rights Month. 1901, the first Nobel Prizes were awarded. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Red Cross founder uh, Jean-Henri Dunant and peace activist Frederick Passy. Um, per Alfred Nobel's will, prizes were awarded in literature, peace, economics, physics, chemistry, um, medicine, and physiology. They were awarded to an array of different people, such as Woodrow Wilson, Ma Marie Curie, Teddy Roosevelt, Menachem Begin, uh, Bob Dylan, Yasser Arafat, Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Barack Obama, and George Bernard Shaw. All have been awarded for uh, 119 years since, and hence December 10th is Nobel Prize Day. And on, also on December 10th, 2020, um, sund at sundown, will commence the Jewish celebration Hanukkah. So happy Hanukkah, everyone. We also want to extend some wonderful congratulations to um, Tara Jackson. Tara Jackson. As of December 4, 2020, Tara has become the acting chief administrative officer for Prince George's County. Um, she was, um, she's an amazing attorney, administrator, um, who served as Deputy uh, Chief Administrative Officer with Government Operations, working with DPI and other agencies. Prior to joining the Office of the County Executive, she served as Deputy County Attorney for um, in, in the Office of Law. She also served as the Principal um, Deputy State's Attorney for, um, under the then State's Attorney Angela Also Brooks um, for seven years. I also knew her to be an excellent private practitioner um, she also has a Master of Divinity in Leadership Development from the Phoenix Seminary, and she's a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We look forward to working with Tara Jackson. Um, she's amazing. Can we give her a round of applause at this time? Go, Tara. And. Um, on the heels of that, we also want to extend tremendous congratulations to Jared McCarthy. Now, Jared McCarthy ha will, is, has taken over as Deputy Chief Administrative Officer uh, for um, Government Operations as well. He most recently served ably and spectacularly as an Associate Judge on the Circuit Court for Prince George's County. Um, prior to that, he was the county attorney for Prince George's County, serving in the, uh, uh, the capacity that Rhonda Weaver now holds and our former planning director, um, Andre Checkley, now former, pro our present planning director and former county attorney held. Um, we also want to, but, but we have to give him a special shout out because also 
Um, the Honorable Jared McCarthy also served as an attorney with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and he was a spectacular litigator, so we want to commend him as well. Um, we also wanted to say um, a happy 90th birthday to a very special woman who should inspire us all. Whenever you think you can't do something, you need to think about this woman and think, yes, you can. Um, this woman gave birth to and raised 11 children. She st then started working at, was, at, as a legal secretary, that's what they were called then, in Upper Marlboro. And, and, and while she was working there, at night she went to school to obtain her college degree and she entered nighttime school while her youngest of 11 was only two years old. And she worked full time by day, college by night, 11 children. She then graduated from college and decided, ah, maybe I can go to law school by night, work by day. Um, and so she did that too. In order to do that, she established a buddy system and she paired an older child with a younger child uh, so that everybody was paired up to help her so that she continued these quests. So graduating from law school wasn't enough then either. So she continued to work. She then ended up working in private practice as an attorney. Um, she then put in for a district court judgeship and got the district court judgeship. And somebody asked her, what would she know about children? And little did they know she had 11. And she, gave, she was able to answer that question very, very well. She then became a um, circuit court judge as well. And today, she, she retired 20 years ago because of the mandatory retirement at age 70 um, at state law. But today, she celebrates her 90th birthday. So we want to give hearty congratulations to Judge Teresa Nolan. So never doubt what, you're, what you can do. Also, the Department of Parks and Recreation, game on. The, the department's newly created countywide sports division is developing a youth sports strategic plan to establish new programs and strengthen existing ones. This is one of our signature initiatives and it's also a signature initiative of County Executive Also Brooks. So we invite you to participate and learn about the process, provide feedback by joining one of the upcoming online town hall meetings, Tuesday, December 15th at 6.30 p.m., Wednesday, the, December 16th at noon. Um, so then we have, um, and you can visit pgparks.com for more information. Also, the Department of Parks and Recreation of Prince George's County has been distributing meals um, regularly. Ever since March, we've been um, distributing meals at least four times a week, grab-and-go lunches. Um, um, so this time, we're going to host a special holiday grab-and-go meal distribution for seniors ages 60 and better and individuals with disabilities ages 18 and over. That will take place on Wednesday, July 16th at, from noon to 2 p.m. at six distribution sites across the county. Register in advance and see the um, slides there. Um, congratulations to the Commission's Department of Parks and Recreation, Aquatics and Athletic Facilities Division, honored by Aquatics International Magazine with the 2020 Best of Aquatics Award. Um, among the top 10 aquatics teams in the nation and recognized for excellence in diversity, offering safe and accessible aquatic facilities during this pandemic. Um, even before this, we partnered with the public schools to make sure that we provided lessons because uh, minorities ha drown at a much higher rate. And so we've, um, we really wanted to make sure that um, our folks in the Prince George's kind of learn how to swim. Um, as always, we thank you and appreciate everyone for your fle flexibility, cooperation, and support as we continue to keep our planning functions moving forward in a safe fashion during our new normal. We remain thankful for our blessings and ask that each of you take, make every effort to be kind, to stay safe, to look out for one another, to stay strong, to stay resilient, and remain ever hopeful as we strive to get through these challenging times together. Before I um, go ahead, um, announce everyone who's present with us today, I do want to take a moment to also say that um, we have a, um, an ambitious and robust agenda for today, but one of the things we had to do was to um, hire an interpreter. So we had to give that uh, interpreter an approximate time. So one of um, the cases that we're going to call in a certain order, um, wherever we are on our agenda, at come 1.30, 
just, just give or take a couple of minutes, but come 1.30, we plan to take item 10, which is the, um, the uh, men's facility. Um, it's uh, the Prince George's County is the applicant here, and um, we, we will hold those folks harmless. So it's the mandatory re referral um, 1915A, Prince George's County Men's Shelter. And so for any of you who are listening, you are held harmless until 1.30. Um, because we have to had to coordinate with a an interpreter, so you can you are welcome to stay. You're welcome to watch, but we will not call your case before 1:30. Um, so that's on the record now. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to go. Uh, I want to announce that we have our full planning board um, present. We have um, Madam Vice Chair Dorothy Bailey, Commissioner Washington, Commissioner Dorner, Commissioner Gervaldo. We have our senior legal counsel, um, Peter Goldsmith. We have our chief of development review with us, James Hunt. In the room, we have our planning director, um, Andre Checkley. With us, we have Kenny Flanagan here, who's um, our senior uh, planning technician who's working his PowerPoints. Um, we have our Ryan Cron, who's our visual media specialist, who's working at everything and troubleshooting. We have our um, planning board administrator with us here. Um, Jessica Jones, and we have our technical hearing writer with us as well, Lee Kratka. And so this is the team. We're trying to move everything forward. And so with that, I'm going to go to the consent agenda. Before I ask for a motion on the consent agenda, I do have some people signed up, and I want to confirm that they're only signed up in case there are any questions. Mr. Haller, are you on? Yes, I am, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do you don't wish to speak, though? Um... Only if necessary. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Carrington, Daryl Carrington. I don't see um, Mr. Carrington. Can you unmute those callers? Yeah. Okay, Daryl Carrington, are you on? Daryl Carrington. With that, I will go to Norman Rivera. Present. No need to speak unless needed. Okay, and the same for Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to go to for a motion. Is there anyone here to oppose the staff's recommendations on items 4A uh, and B, and items 4D through uh, G? And if not, is there any board member? Um, who wishes to speak? If not, is there a motion? Madam Chair, after consideration of the records for items number 4A, 4B, 4D through AG, I move adoption of staff finance and approval of items on the consent agenda in accordance with the recommendation of staff. And, and I second just noting it's uh, through 4G, Madam Chair. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thank you. So we have a motion from um, Madam Vice Chair Bailey and seconded by Co um, Commissioner Washington. Madam Vice Chair? But I. Commissioner Washington? I. Commissioner Dorner? I. Commissioner Geraldo? I. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Motion carries 5 0. I. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is item five, and uh, the item five is detail site plan 99003-01 for easy storage of buoy. I'm going to do a check to make sure that we have everyone. Adam Bossy. Present, Madam Chair. Bradley Farrar. Present, Madam Chair. James Buchheitzer. Present, Madam Chair. Craig Pittinger. Present, Madam Chair. Russ, Russ Shipley. Okay, John Ferrante. Present, Madam Chair. Frank Stevens. Present, Madam Chair. And that concludes the sign up list. Mr. Bossy, you're on. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and members of the Planning Board. Uh, just for the record, I am Adam Bossy with the Urban Design Section. Uh, this is Item 5, a detailed site plan amendment, DSP 99003-01, for easy storage of buoy. Uh, this application proposes an addition to an existing consolidated storage facility. We can move on to slide two, please. 
the subject properties in planning area 71B, Council District 4. Slide three, please. Outlined in red, the 4.3 acre property is irregularly shaped and located at the end of Gallant Fox Way, within this, again, within the city of Bowie. Uh, the site is just southwest of the intersection of Maryland 450 and 197. Uh, that's Annapolis Road and Laurel Bowie Road. Slide four, please. Uh, the site is zoned I-1, that's the light industrial zone, and it is abutted by other properties in the same zone to the north, east, and south. Uh, the linear feature that we see to the left of the site, uh, that's to the west of it, uh, is a railway right away. Slide five, please. Here on the aerial image, we see the existing consolidated storage facility building in a semi-centrally located spot on the site. Uh, with parking on its east side, that's to the right of the building, with a connection to Gallant Fox Way. Uh, the property to the north is developed with a small commercial office, a uh, series of small commercial office buildings, and other properties abutting the site are vacant and uh, actually owned by the city. Slide six, please. The topographic map shows the site is generally flat. Slide seven, please. Uh, no master plan rights away directly abut the subject site, but shown here again are routes 450 and 197, which are both arterial roadways. Uh, slide eight, please. Uh, the addition to the existing pro uh, building proposed by this DSP amendment is on the north side of it, uh, which is on the top of the far end of the building as shown here in the image. Slide nine, please. Here on the site plan, we see the rectangular existing consolidated storage facility uh, in white and the proposed addition shaded in gray to the left of it. The existing building is approximately 106,000 square feet and includes 912 storage units. The proposed addition is slightly less than 48,000 square feet and will include an additional 478 storage units. In total, the expanded facility will encompass about 155,000 square feet and include 1,390 storage units. Uh, above the building in this image is the existing parking lot, uh, and that will be restriped to provide for the required quantity of loading and parking spaces. Slide 10, please. Uh, here we see landscaping is being provided in conformance with the landscape manual. I do want to point out that here as well, during the course of our review, it was noted that uh, there were, uh, I believe, was several dozen trees required by the original DSP that were missing from the site. Uh, so staff did provide a condition for the replacement of those missing plantings as part of this, this project. Slide 11. Uh, here, the top two elevation images do show the existing four-story building on the left side of the picture separated by a vertical dash line from the proposed three-story addition on, on the right side. Uh, the top image shows the building in its entirety, and image just below that uh, provides a little bit of a closer view of the addition. Uh, as you can see, the materials and colors that have been specified for the addition uh, do ensure that it matches the colors and the finish of the existing facility. Slide 12, please. Uh, the DSP amendment proposes to remove and replace one of five existing building mounted signs on the north side where the where the addition will go. Uh, all other signage will remain the same. Slide 13, please. Uh, and finally here, I do want to point out uh, that the uh, construction of the addition will require a total of 168 square feet of temporary impacts to primary management area. Uh, this is specifically a little bit of wetland buffer that is shown on the, the lower image here in dark blue. Uh, and staff has found that acceptable. Uh, in conclusion, Madam Chair, staff has found that the expansion of the existing consolidated storage facility proposed by detailed site plan amendment DSP 9903-01 conforms with the applicable requirements of the zoning ordinance. Uh, staff does recommend its approval subject to the conditions contained in the technical staff report. Uh, this does conclude our presentation. Thank you. Smooth landing, Mr. Bassi. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if the board has any questions of you, Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Com Commissioner Washington? No question. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? No questions. Thank you. 
I'm go now going to turn to Mr. Farrar. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of the board, um, and thank you. Um, we concur in for the record. general with, for the record, I apologize, Madam Chair, for the record, my name is Bradley Farrar, I'm an attorney with the uh, law offices of Shipling Horn. My address is 1101 Mercantile Lane, Suite 240. Um, as I stated earlier, in general, we concur with staff's, technical staff's uh, report, uh, with the exception of item 1D and would request that it be um, deleted um, in as much as the requirement um, of having the hours of operation listed on the DSP is not a requirement uh, contained within the uh, zoning ordinance. We've had discussion with staff regarding that and our understanding is that staff concurs with, uh, with our conclusion on that. Madam Chair, Adam Bossi from the Urban Design Section. That is correct. We do concur with the applicant's request uh, for the deletion of Condition 1D. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bossi. Okay. All right. Any, um, Mr. Farrar, anything else? No, ma'am. That's it. Okay. So now you've got a lot of people signed up here. Is that here? Are they just signed up in case we have questions? Just in case there are any technical questions, um, they're, they're here to answer those questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Farrar. I'm going to turn to um, uh, Frank Stevens from the city of Bowie now. Mr. Stevens. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Frank Stevens from the city of Bowie planning staff here this morning to review with you detailed site plan DSP 99003-01 for an addition to the existing easy storage facility on Callan Fox Lane in Bowie. The Bowie City Council conducted a public hearing on this case on November 16th. At the conclusion of that public hearing, the council voted to recommend approval of this detailed site plan with two conditions. Those conditions and the city's position were transmitted to the planning board in a letter dated November 19th from the city council. The city's conditions are contained in the county staff report as conditions 1F and 1G. We appreciate the opportunity to work with your staff on this case and for the city's uh, conditions being included in their report. This concludes the city's presentation. I'll be happy to answer, and answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, let's, see if the, here. let's see if the board has any questions of you, Mr. Stevens, or Mr. Farrar. Um, Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Washington? No questions. Commissioner Giraldo? No questions. Okay. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Thank you. Okay. So that concluded my sign-up sheet. There is no one else to speak. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DSP-99003-01. Along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report with the exception of condition 1D. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Madam Vice Chair? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Commissioner Giraldo? I vote aye. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0. We're going to next take item 6, 9, and 7. Um, so item 6. Item six is the detailed site plan 20028 for Brandywine Commercial Center. Again, Mr. Bossi. Present, we're looking at you, okay. Um, yes, thank you, okay. Mr. Mr. Gibbs. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Hewlett, present on behalf of uh, the applicant. Okay, wonderful. Wade Collison. Present, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Mike Novi. Oh, you got him covered. Yes, we got him covered here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Bailey? Present, Madam Chair. Wonderful. And then we have one exhibit. We have applicants exhibit number one, which is the proposed modification to condition um, 1C. Um, okay. Ready for takeoff, Mr. Vasi. <laughs> well, thank you again, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Again, for the record, Adam Vasi with the urban design section. 
Uh, as you mentioned, this is item six, a detailed site plan, DSP 20028, which proposes the development of a new consolidated storage facility. Um, and as the chairwoman already mentioned, uh, we did have one item that was submitted into the board's additional backup before Tuesday's deadline, that being the applicant's uh, request for a revised condition 1C, which we will address at the end of the presentation. Uh, if we can move on to slide two, please. The subject property is in planning area 85A, Council District 9. Slide three, please. Outlined in red, the 9.8 acre site is located on the east side of US 301, that's Crane Highway, approximately 950 feet south of Shortcut Road. Uh, slide four, please. The site is zoned I-1, that's the light industrial zone, and is abutted by uh, properties in the same zone to the north, uh, which is developed with a commercial truck trailer operation. Uh, the properties to the south and to the east are in the residential medium development zone, that's the RM zone, and those two properties are actually associated with the uh, ongoing Timothy Branch development. Slide five, please. Uh, here the aerial, the aerial image does show us that the subject site is undeveloped. Slide six, please. The topographic map does show us the site has a gentle slope from uh, west to east, or excuse me, from east to west. Uh, slide seven, please. US 301, which abuts the west side of the site, it is shown in orange here, is a master planned freeway. Uh, slide eight, please. Here we see the detailed site plan and development proposed by this application. Uh, clearing and grading of the entire 9.8 acre site is proposed uh, and building is proposed to be limited to a 2.59 acre lot one, uh, which is where we see the building proposed in this image. Uh, the building that is proposed is generally rectangularly shaped with parking and loading spaces provided abutting its southern facade. Uh, development of the consolidated storage facility is proposed in two uh, phases, which I'll, I'll discuss uh, on an upcoming slide. And just looking at the larger site here, we do see that a single point of access is shown connecting to US 301 on the side's west side. Uh, the layout of a future access road and associated easement is shown bisecting essentially the middle of the property before it turns north, uh, where it's eventually shown connecting to master plan roadway I-503 at a cul-de-sac. And that's up in the northwest uh, or the top right corner of this image. Uh, this connection is important uh, or may be important in the future as SHA could remove access to 301 if they do choose to widen or improve that roadway. Uh, slide 10, please, uh, 9, please. Here on the landscape plan, uh, we do see that the applicant has provided appropriate tree and shrub plantings that do satisfactorily fulfill the requirements of the landscape manual. Slide 10, please. I hear this first set of building elevations shows the first phase of the proposed consolidated storage facility building. Uh, if we look at that second image from the top, I think that will, will help as we transition slides a little bit, show you what the addition will look like. So this phase one portion does include approximately 127,000 square feet of building space, uh, which will also include an office and 950 storage units. We move to slide 11, please. So as we can see here, again, if we kept our eye on that, that second image from the top, uh, we do see the addition on the far right of that being added. Uh, this is the phase two portion of the consolidated storage facility, and it does consist of about 25,000 square feet of additional building space and 190 additional storage units. Slide 12, please. Three building mounted signs are proposed, uh, and these were found to be in conformance with the zoning ordinance. There are no freestanding signs proposed as part of this development. Slide 13, please. Uh, these two illustrative images do provide a nice view of what the completed building is intended to look like. Uh, they do show the complete build out of the building. This includes uh, phase one and the phase two addition, which is toward the rear of the building. Uh, next slide, please. Included as part of this DSP are a bike repair station, bench, and some other pedestrian and bicycle features. Uh, and these are included uh, as a requirement, as a conditional requirement of the preliminary plan of subdivision. 
Uh, these features are intended to ensure that there are some pedestrian and bike features that would be incorporated into the overall subdivision of the 9.8 acre site. Uh, here the applicant is providing some of those with this, this first phase of development of the larger property. Slide 15, please. And finally, so the site did have a type two tree conservation plan that was included with the DSP. I do want to point out the site's approved natural resources inventory did show that there were no regulated environmental features, unsafe soils, or any specimen trees located on the site. Uh, as we did note in the staff report, there are a few minor technical corrections uh, that need to be made to the TCP2. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to briefly return to applicant's exhibit one uh, that is in your additional backup. Uh, which does ultimately request to modify the language of staff's recommended condition 1C. So staff has reviewed that and discussed it with the applicant, and we do find the modified language for condition 1C to be acceptable. Uh, in conclusion, Madam Chair, members of the planning board, staff has found that the project proposed by this detailed site plan conforms with the applicable requirements of the zoning ordinance. Uh, we're pleased to recommend that the planning board approve DSP 20028 and TCP2-034-2020, subject to the conditions as included in staff's report with the modified condition 1C as submitted by the applicant. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Bassi. Um, okay, let's turn to uh, Madam Vice, see if there are any questions. Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Commissioner Washington. No questions. Commissioner Dorner. No questions. Commissioner Geraldo. No questions. Okay, so uh, so no questions. Okay, Mr. Gibbs. Yes, uh, good morning, Chair Hewlett, members of the good planning morning. board, Edward Gibbs, uh, an attorney with offices in Largo, representing the applicant who is also the contract purchaser. Uh, we appreciate Mr. Bossi's uh, presentation and his report and uh, the staff's agreement to the modification to condition 1C. Uh, so relative to the merits of the case, that's all we have to say. Uh, and we support the staff's uh, other conditions. Um, I, I did have one uh, uh, quasi-legal issue that uh, presented itself to me this morning. Uh, and that is, you know, the I-1 zone does not require a detailed site plan. It is the consolidated storage use that requires a detailed site plan uh, in the I-1 zone. And, and so that is the reason why we filed the detailed site plan. There is an ordinance provision that says uh, a detailed site plan must encompass uh, all of a legal lot. Um, and so the four lots that are approved in the preliminary plan are not yet platted. We now have only the 9.8 acre parcel. Uh, and that is why we you know, included all the 9.8 acres in the detailed site plan. But I just wanted to clarify and make sure everybody understood that the detailed site plan only encompasses the consolidated storage use. Um, and so I just, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where we ultimately plat the other three lots and, uh, and then would be subjected to a detailed site plan for a use that doesn't require that. And I just wanted that clarification to be on the record. Um, and if anybody had any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's first see if there are any questions. And, and, and Mr. Goldsmith, if you need to address any, if you need to respond now, or do we um, address this at a later date? Um, first, uh, Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Um, Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Commissioner Geraldo? Okay, so. so no questions. Okay, Mr. Bossi or uh, Mr. Goldsmith, do you have anything to add at this point? Uh, no, ma'am, I do not. Mr. Goldsmith? No, ma'am, I do not. Okay, uh, with that, so everyone else that has signed up, Mr. Gibbs, is with you for questioning only, that, right? That, that is correct, Madam Chair. Uh, no one else needs to test. Okay, so with that, I need uh, requesting a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff's report and approve DSP-20028 
and TCP2-034-2020 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and as further modified by applicant exhibit number one. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington seconded by um, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Vote aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Vote aye. Uh, and Commissioner Geraldo. I vote aye. Thank you guys. Have it 5-0. Thank you very much. Um, everyone take care. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Have okay. a nice day. Thank you. Okay, next we on the agenda is item 9, which is preliminary plan of subdivision 4-19024, calm retreat. I'm going to do a check. Tom Seavers? Yes, ma'am. Present. Okay, Mr. Tedesco? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm present. Wonderful. Um, we have um, Paul Sun signed up. I'm not sure if that's just for questioning or not. Yes, present, ma'am. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Alex Viegas? Alex Viegas? I'm going to go on Nat Ballard. Can you Present, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, is it Mr. Viegas on or you just got to cover it, uh, Mr. Ballard? I believe he'll be joining us, but I, I do have us covered. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lenhart? Present. Mr. Burns? Griffin Burns? <laughs> They may be joining momentarily. They're not on at the moment. We oh. weren't sure what time we would be heard. We okay. just emailed them, so they may be joining okay. momentarily. Is that when you say that Kevin Kennedy? Okay, somebody's having a conversation, so we need to they need to not have that. Kevin Kennedy. And Jason Staley. But you gotta he's also with Rogers. President Madam Chair. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Mr. Severs, you're on. Hey, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am Thomas Severs, Senior Planner with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Item number nine on the agenda is a preliminary plan of subdivision for Calm Retreat 4-19024, including a variation request to Section 24-121A4. The application consists of 488 lots and 58 parcels for single-family attached dwellings and 20,000 square feet of commercial development. Four additional items were received this past Tuesday by the 10 a.m. deadline. The four exhibits were received from the applicant's representative, Matt Tedesco. All exhibits were added as additional backup and uploaded to the web. I will address them at the end of this presentation. Slide two, please. The site is located in the southern part of Prince George's County within planning area 85A and Council District 9. Slide three, please. More specifically, the site is located on the southbound side of US 301, approximately 2,100 feet north of the intersection of Chad's Ford Drive. Slide four, please. The site is located in the MXT mixed-use transit-oriented zone. The property is bound to the east by commercial miscellaneous CM zone property and the right-of-way of US 301 to the south by property in the residential medium development RM zone and the local activity center LAC zone to the west by land in the rural residential RR zone and to the north by property in the MXT zone. Slide five, please. The aerial photograph shows that the subject site contains a single family home with several outbuildings. To the east of the property is an existing automobile sales outlet. To the south is an existing residential development and vacant land where future, future commercial development is planned. To the west is vacant land subject to a special exception allowing surface mining and to the north by an automobile and trailer sales outlet. Slide six, please. The site map shows that the topography on the site is varied but becomes more level to the west. Slide seven, please. This slide shows a bird's eye view of the property. Slide eight, please. The master plan right-of-way map shows the master plan freeway US 301 Robert Crane Highway abuts the property to the east. Major collector MC 502 General Lafayette Boulevard 
joins the site from the south. Proposed master plan arterial roadway designation A55 runs through the site from east to west. The portions of MC 502 and A55 within the site boundary are proposed to be dedicated with this application in accordance with the subdivision regulations. Slide 9, please. The five critical intersections determined to be impacted by the development are shown by the yellow numbered boxes. Given the proposed development, it was found that the three intersections along US 301, intersections 1, 2, and 4, will operate inadequately. Consequently, the traffic to impact study recommended that the appl application be approved with a condition requiring payment to the Brandywine Road Club. Staff concurs with its findings and conclusions. The other two intersections will operate at an acceptable level of service as detailed in finding seven of the technical staff report. Slide 10, please. The preliminary plan of subdivision shows the subject property with 58 proposed parcels and 488 lots outlined in red and abutting roadways highlighted in blue. Water and sewerage and fire and rescue facilities are found to be adequate to serve the subject site. The site did fail 10 minute response time for residential police facilities. However, per CB 20 2020, enacted July 21st, 2020, the public safety facilities mitigation requirement may be waived by council resolution. On November 17th, 2020, the County Council of Prince George's County, Maryland adopted CR 126 2020 for the purpose of approving a waiver of the police response time mitigation fee in its entirety for all residential units of the Calm Retreat Project. Slide 11, please. This slide provides a color rendering of the site. Slide 12, please. Section 24-128B7A of the subdivision regulations requires that all lots served by an alley have frontage on and direct pedestrian access to a public right-of-way. Given the current configuration, the 36 lots in blue do not meet the requirements of section 24-128B7A. However, the red numbered labels show number one, where the lot lines can be extended to meet the public right-of-way for 11 lots along General Lafayette Boulevard and seven lots along A55. Number two, reorients 14 lots from front-loaded units along Road C. And number three, reorients four of the lots to have frontage on A55. The lot configuration will be revised prior to signature approval of the PPS, consistent with this exhibit and as detailed on page 21 of the technical staff report. Slide 13, please. The applicant is requesting a variation from section 24-121A4 with this application, which requires a 150-foot lot depth for lots adjacent to an arterial roadway or higher classification. The lots highlighted in blue along A55, 60 in total, are subject to this variation request. Staff finds that the requirements of section 24-113 of the subdivision regulations have been adequately addressed by the applicant and recommend approval of the variation to section 24-121A4 for lot depths less than 150 feet adjacent to an arterial roadway and is detailed on pages 18 to 21 of the technical staff report. Slide 14, please. This exhibit shows the proposed pedestrian circulation and connections to the site. The detail shows that intersection improvements will also be provided east of the center line of US 301. Slide 15, please. This application is subject to the Woodland and Wildlife Habitat Conservation Ordinance and a Type 1 Tree Conservation Plan has been filed with the application. This TCP-1 shows the subject site outlined in red and the primary management area is highlighted in green, which also contains 100-year floodplain, wetland streams, and their associated buffers. A Type 2 Tree Conservation Plan, TCP-2-009-2020, was approved for grading purposes on May 27, 2020. This TCP-2 approval included a planning director level review and approval of a variance from section 25-122B1G of the Woodland and Wildlife Habitat Conservation Ordinance to remove 12 of the 20 on-site specimen trees. The trees are shown in red and have been marked for removal on the TCP-1 for reference. Slide 16, please. This slide shows three impacts that are to occur in the PMA. 
Impact A is requested for the construction of a master plan roadway crossing. Impact B is requested for the construction of one stormwater management outfall structure. And Impact C is requested for the construction for a sanitary sewer connection and stormwater management structure. Staff supports the proposed PMA impacts for site access and necessary infrastructure. Based on staff's analysis, the regulated environmental features on the subject property have been preserved and or restored to the fullest extent possible as detailed on pages 13 to 33 of the technical staff report. Slide 17, please. This slide shows cross sections of the proposed public streets within the development. Slide 18, please. And lastly, this slide shows cross sections of the proposed private roads and alleys in the development. In conclusion, the subdivision and zoning staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve Calm Retreat 4-19024 and variation to section 24-121A4 subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. As I stated at the beginning, the applicant provided four additional exhibits. Applicants Exhibit 1 contains proposed revisions to the findings and three conditions contained in the staff report. Staff agrees with the revised language. Applicants Exhibit 2 contains the correspondence cited in Exhibit 1 from Mary Giles to Charlie Howe, dated September 3rd, 2020. Applicants Exhibit 3 contains correspondence with the SHA, Woodruff to Barnett Woods, in reference to the five-foot sidewalk cited on the first page of Exhibit 1. Lastly, Applicants Exhibit 4 provides notice of a virtual public meeting that was held on September 23rd, 2020, and the associated mailing list. This concludes staff's presentation. Um, thank you, Mr. Stevers. Well done. Uh, let's see if the board has any questions of you at this time. Madam Vice Chair. You're um, muted. I, I don't have any questions, but uh, you mentioned that there were 60 lots that did not meet the um, foot lot depth requirement. And, and what happens in, and what is happening in that case, in that situation? What does it mean? The, it's, let's see. You have sorry, a variation the request, slide. too. Okay. Uh, it's on slide 13, I believe. And on the staff report, too, there's a variation request, but you want to go ahead? Yes. Yes, so the variation is requested because uh, the 60 lots uh, labeled here in blue do not meet the 150-foot lot depth. Okay. So we have a variation right. request that's set forth on page 18, starts on page 18 of the staff report. Correct. Hi, this is Sherry Connor, supervisor with the subdivision and zoning section for the record. Um, just a little bit of background on that. The subdivision regulations do require uh, lots that are, are front on an arterial or higher classification roadway to have a minimum lot depth of 150 feet. Uh, the lots you see in blue are within that area. And the purpose of that is to ensure protection against uh, the impacts from vehicular noise and particulate matter. In this case, the applicant has filed a variation from that requirement and provided analysis on how the views um, and impacts from that roadway will be mitigated. Um, in, the, in the backup uh, or in the case file, there's a noise analysis um, that demonstrates that uh, these lots would not be impacted uh, as far as uh, their usable yard areas um, because it is, although it is an arterial, the traffic generated on this road is, is not anticipated to be at a level um, that would be uh, necessary, not, not as impactful as arterials in other areas. So it's not anticipated to generate a lot of traffic. Um, and uh, there will be also plant materials along this right of way that will be reviewed further at the detailed site plan stage. Um, so given uh, the impacts of, of this particular roadway, the variation justification submitted by the applicant, um, staff is recommending the approval of the variation request that these lots be allowed 
to be placed within that 150 foot lot depth area. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And every now and then, I think we need uh, teachable moments just for those individuals who don't uh, listen to us on a regular basis. And so I thank you for that. That question was asked of me and your explanation was much better than my response. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, and also they're designed in such a way so that, so that the dwelling unit will be reduced below, right? You said 45 DBAs, right? Okay, let's see if there are any other questions. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Okay, Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, I have two separate questions. Um, I think it's the slide before this um, that has the rotations and stuff of the, um, yeah. Do we have a, so this is the before image, right? Do we have a, like a final that would show the different, um, I, I know that they were gonna submit it later on, but. Do we have a final version that would show us how it's going to be completely reconfigured? No, not at this time. Okay. Is that, I mean, that's a little bit hard to like visualize because there's so many, there's rotations, there's roads. Like I, I have no idea how to actually guess what it would be like. And, and I realize that, that, the, that one of the requirements is to submit the, the next diagram of it, but that would have been helpful, I think, to have included this in here. If I may, Madam Chair, oh. Commissioner Dorner. Yeah. I think Ms. Connor was going to answer it the way I was going to answer it. If you look at that exhibit, again, Matthew Tedesco, on behalf of the applicant for the record, if you look at slide A, uh, the red lined version of that plan is actually depicting what the revisions would show. So it may not be showing okay. up, well, but the red lines are the revisions so that you can see the before and after. The blue are the, the identification of the lots, but the red lines, you can see the lot lines extended in where the item one bullet is. Um, the lines are the lot lines are extended out to the right of ways. The item two, you can see the lots are changed. Basically, the only change with two is that they're just rear loaded, um, make the lots front loaded from from the rear loaded. So um, those revisions are depicted on slide twelve, and that exhibit is in the record. Okay, how, how about rotating the lots? Is that is there a big rotation, or is that just like a, a small detail? Because it doesn't look like they've been rotated in here, but but maybe they have just slightly. Yeah, if, if, if I could have Michael or somebody direct your attention to item number three, to, to the bottom center. Oh, it's those ones. Those that four lots right there, um, kind of to the left, Michael, in the number three, up a little bit. Right there. Yeah. Those four, those are the rotated lots. It's, it's, it's okay, I was I was wondering how that whole stick at the top. I thought two was going to be also rotated. I had no idea how it was going to rotate it downward. Okay. So yeah, that makes, those were just sense. changed from front from rear to front. Okay. Okay. Cool. That that's good. Okay. So that um, w hold on a sec. Oh, okay. And and um, it's Mr. Flanagan who's working everything over here. Um, uh, can you, um, okay. So who else? So was that I'm it for sorry, your I question? Thought, no worries. I I. I have one other question, and this may be for Mr. Tedesco to answer later, but on, on all the private streets, it, it, would it be possible for the county to accept them and to have them public? I know that they prob the, answer, the short answer is probably no, because the, they're alleyways, really, and that's why we put them as private streets. Um, but we're constantly running into this problem when we have new developments with, with townhomes um, that are reloaded, and they have these private streets, and they're not accepted. By, by the local municipalities, in this case, probably just the county, not an actual city, um, with, with provisions of services. And, and it's just, it's a real pain for the HOAs to um, go out and find trash and recycling and get those taken care of. Um, and, and in reality, when the county says that, that we need, that they need wider alleyways for their, their trucks and stuff, it's the same darn trucks, exact same dimensions as the ones that the private firms are using um, in, in a lot of places. So I, I wanted to find out if there was any attempt to try and get the county to accept these as, as private roadways so that way the future residents would, would have county services instead of having to pay taxes and on county services and then pay taxes again, essentially, for the HOA to have these services. Okay, let me st let me stop there for a second so we can... Because Mr. Tedesco, that sounds like that may be more in your court. Um, and so while, while we're asking uh, if there's any questions of Mr. Sievers, if, if, um, if, because you haven't even given your presentation yet, Mr. Tedesco, so let's just, can you hold on to that 
and be prepared to address um, Commissioner Dorner's question, Mr. Tedesco. Okay. And, and, okay. and I, just for staff, um, Madam Chair, I, I would say that we need to figure out something for this because e each time we have private developments that come through and we keep creating these private streets that are essentially alleyways, it's because the code or, or the county requirements aren't, aren't updated. So it might be good for us at some point to connect with the county and figure out if there's there's a way to, to, to make this a little bit better. So are you saying we, so we, we like need a new we need to, a new zoning ordinance, a new code? Okay. Yes. That okay. That would be fantastic because it seems like these are just band-aids <laughs> okay. um, for making things work. But I'll, I'll let Mr. Tedesco answer at least for this particular case later. Okay. Now let's see. Um, okay. So Commissioner Giraldo. No questions. Okay. I'll wait for Mr. Tedesco. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Tedesco, you're on. Thank you. And my apologies to Mr. Flanagan. Um, uh, I missed the introduction, so I wasn't aware that Mr. Flanagan was working the slides. So I, uh, I apologize. Um, but thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Mr. Severs, thank you for that presentation and for uh, a very job well done with respect to not only the presentation this morning, but the staff report. Um, Thank you to the planning board. Uh, you all may recall that this case was continued previously to today's date. The extra time I think was um, worthwhile and resulted in what I hope will be a fairly short hearing this morning with respect to where we are with, with your staff Apparently. and with some of the agencies that were involved in this application. Um, with me this morning, just by way of introduction, not everyone um, may or may not be signed up and not the folks that I'm introducing need to speak, but the ones that are signed up are here to answer any questions. But with us from the NA Michael team, uh, which are the development consultant consultants on the on the projects, David Michael, Kevin Kennedy, and Julian Curry, okay. from Rogers Consulting, Alex Vajegas and Nat Ballard, and um, Mike Lenhart from Lenhart Traffic and Consulting, and of course myself, on behalf of the applicant. Very okay. pleased to be with you. This property and not um, all of them can, and not all of them can speak because not all of them are signed up. So not some of them we can't even ask questions of. So okay. So they, hopefully they're uh, watching via streaming, Mr. Tedesco. I know you hear me. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, no comment on that one, Madam Chair. But um, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, this property has a little bit of a history. As you all may recall, back in 2018, it was rezoned from the RR zone to the MXT zone as part of a minor amendment to the Subregion 5 plan, specifically to implement uh, and better align the property with Plan 2035 and the master plan uh, for the Brainwine Community Center to provide a mixed use um, residential community uh, with, with um, a little bit higher density allowed. Last year, November 2019, you all heard and approved the conceptual site plan. That conceptual site plan had a maximum dwelling units of 850. We are now before you at the time of preliminary plan and that number has come down as sometimes occurs when we get into the finer detailing of the engineering and the designing of these projects post conceptual site plan, we are now down to 488 single family attached or townhouse units. We will be back before you hopefully in a relatively short period of time on the detailed site plan uh, for those single single family attached units. As um, uh, Commissioner Bailey had indicated or questioned uh, staff on with respect to the lot depth variation, I would align myself with Ms. Connor's response as well as formally submit and adopt uh, further testimony, the written justification that we put into the record, which is in your backup at pages one through nine. But staff did a very good job of articulating the, the basis for that variation in your staff report at pages 18 through 21. Verbally, I would just offer one other item with respect to that variation that was not said in, in comments from Ms. Connor and from the chair, which is that the Department of Permitting Enforcement and Inspections, DPI, who are the regulatory authority over this master plan alignment, which is the triggering of the lot depth requirement because this road is an arterial in the master plan, has indicated its support uh, for this section to be a half section. So although we're dedicating the full 120 foot width, uh, we're only building a half section, which has increased pavement width slightly over the iteration of the plan to provide for a five foot bike lane. But generally, it, so that goes along with some of the justification that Ms. Connor and the, and the chair mentioned with respect to these particular lots. Uh, the, the impacts are minimal. Uh, there's also, and again, not to get too ahead of ourselves, but there's also been some discussion 
in future master plans of transportation that this road may be downgraded uh, to a collector. But um, it obviously isn't. It's a master. It's an arterial, so we have to comply with the regulation, uh, which triggered the need for the variation. But I think that variation has been sufficiently justified and supported by your staff. Um, finally, just some high points, and then I'll conclude. Uh, we we did work closely with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, this project does provide for actually mandatory dedication of some of the property to be owned by the commission, uh, specifically 3.26 acres. Uh, and that is in addition to uh, private facilities that will be proposed and depicted at the time of detailed site plan, uh, commitment of the continuation of the trail construction uh, within the park and planning dedicated property. Um, that will be an extension of the trail system to the south of the Rose Creek Connector Trail. Uh, we do have some stormwater facilities within that area to be dedicated. We understand we will work with DPR at the time of DSP and or Platt when that property is dedicated to the commission to make sure that there is um, uh, easements over those areas as I, we understand the commission doesn't want to be responsible for maintaining those facilities, which, which is fine, but they will be in that uh, area of dedication. Um, finally, as it's provided in our uh, backup or exhibits, exhibit four, we did on September 8th send out a uh, notification for a uh, volunteered public outreach virtual meeting with the community. Um, we sent that to the adjoining property owners, uh, the parties of record, and this, this, the associations in the area. Um, that list is provided. That was held on September 23rd. Um, we also reached out to the Chadsburg Community Association, a management company, and as well as the other community associations within the Chadsburg community, because there are a number of them. Um, with that, Madam Chair, um, we would we would submit on the record, uh, on the exhibits that have been provided in the record, um, the justification statements in support of the variations, and um, certainly uh, would request staff, uh, excuse me, strike that, request the planning board support and approval of this preliminary plan with the adoption of the revised changes in applicants exhibit one which i'm happy to go through as needed um, finally just in response to commissioner dorner's uh, comment um, we have not seen a willingness from the department of uh, from DPI to accept private roads uh, as public uh, that nevertheless though th these facilities still will be able to have public services uh, the one exception primarily is with, with respect to maintenance of the roadways, snow removal, things of that sort, for which the homeowners association will contract uh, through its management company to have those services provided. So um, we've seen we've seen that work pretty well in these larger uh, subdivisions for which there is no financial issues, I would say, with respect to make, making sure those services are provided for the community. Uh, I would acknowledge you know, maybe in some of the smaller ones where the, the dues or the fees are run into issues or problems, that that could be a situation. But we have not seen um, DPI really wanting to take owner, responsibility and ownership of some of these private roads, and certainly not the alleys. Uh, but they will be obviously responsible for the maintenance and everything associated with the 855 alignment uh, and the public rights of ways throughout the community. Um. Okay, um, let me before we before I see if there's any questions of you uh, at this time, um, we do have your applicant's exhibit number one, which is your revised findings and conditions, um, um, starting with um, trails. Do you want to succinctly go through that? Absolutely. Well, you know what? So, uh, okay, you know I'm yes, going to skip over step. Um, 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 I think I think the first one on page one is self-explanatory. Can you go to page two? Um, yes, ma'am. Um, just to reduce the size of the 12-foot wide side path to an 8-foot wide side path. I mean, and 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 let me find out, Mr. Sievers, you are you, you're in agreement with all of these? Yes, ma'am. Staff is in agreement. Okay, I thought that's okay. Okay. Um, can, can so, so what what? Yeah, Madam Chair, very briefly. So what the what time has availed all of us of is the ability to have further communications with other agencies related to 
um, the transportation and trail sections request or, or recommendations pursuant to uh, its application of uh, the BPIS as well as master plan transportation and what we have and what's in your backup and cited in these revisions are email correspondences between those agencies whether it be DPI uh, or State Highway Administration indicating its position on the widths of some of these uh, okay. transportation improvements, pedestrian okay. improvements. Okay, that's good. Okay. And so the other thing, one of them was just, um, and, and, and then on page five, we're, we're going also with the um, east side of General Lafayette Boulevard, right? Yeah, Boulevard. that was just, a, I believe, um, just a typo um, that, that just okay. was being clarified with respect to the, what side of A55 that's on. That, okay. I just think it was a, a Scribner error, nothing okay. more. Okay. Let's see if the board has any questions, any questions of you now. Um, Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Okay. Commissioner Dorner. Uh, so I just want to thank Mr. Desca for the, the clarifications. Um, so will, will trash and recycling be provided by the county and then they just have to figure out snow removal and, and kind of upkeep of the private streets? <laughs> yes and possibly no. Um, so some of, like I said, some of the communities do contract privately uh, for those types of services. I don't know with how this one will, uh, with this one will or not. Primarily, that's up to the management company for the HOA to, to determine that. But we're happy to work with um, the county, uh, with with DPWT on those types of services going forward. I don't know the specific answer at this time at the preliminary plan stage, which services will be. I've I've seen it both ways, to be honest with you, Commissioner Dorner, um, in these types of situations. So it's possible, but um, I would say that uh, if, if that's something that is a concern, we're happy to continue that dialogue with, with whomever we need to, whether it be DPWT or, or Park and Planning staff. But again, to the point of the question with the private streets, we, we just have not seen uh, a willingness of the county to take on any, any more than it really needs to with respect to those maintenance and services of, yeah, like, public, of private streets or public streets. Yeah, my guess is that they're not going to go out and fix potholes and, do, and add speech uh, homes or anything like that on those kinds of streets, and, and that's fine. I don't think we're going to push them that way. Um, but at, at least trying to figure out if um, they can continue to provide the services that that typically are provided, like trash recycling. If you can get them to do the snow removal, that would be fantastic, but that's actually fairly easy to contract out. It, it's the recycling and the trash that I think are the hardest things to contract for these for the for the HOAs, and it's it's a it's really a, a total pain. Um, so to the extent that we can try and get this project or, or even future projects that you have clients with on onto the county or local municipal services for those, um, it would be really good because it's I realize the management companies are supposed to do this and 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 that's one of their their jobs, but. It, it also falls upon the homeowners who are on HOAs to, to actually go through bids and stuff, and, and it's not it's not easy. And it, it's very annoying for residents who are paying taxes twice, basically, or fees of some kind twice with expensive services. Um, so to the extent that we can get at least that, that hooked up, that would be great. Um, and, and I realize it's, it, it, it's not going to be the street maintenance, and, and I'm not asking for, for anything like that. So I know they won't do that. Yeah, yeah, and I will I will say it's probably not something your staff uh, falls within the jurisdiction of your staff per se. It's, it's probably solely within DPWT, um, and we will continue those you know those conversations to figure out what will make the most sense. But um, yeah, I think that that's the best way to answer that. It's, it's kind of beyond the scope of this preliminary plan, I would say. Nevertheless, we want to be responsive to the to the concerns and the issues you're raising and. We will take that up with, with DPWC as we move the project forward and, and when the builder comes online and make sure we bring that to their attention so that when these lots start selling, the homeowners associations created, the covenants and so forth, there's a clear path of understanding of who's responsible for what, which is which is not abnormal and, and typically always the case, but in particular going forward, maybe having additional discussions with DPWC. Okay, thanks. No, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I realize it goes kind of beyond our jurisdiction, but. This is one of those things that makes development nice in the county when we can do Absolutely. that and coordinate. Um, so yeah. to the extent that we can like work out these things and just make it a lot more seamless, that, that would be fantastic. I would, we would agree with you. Absolutely. 
All right, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, uh, and Commissioner Geraldo. No questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, and I think uh, um, the rest of your folks were here just to answer questions. Mr. Sun, was there anything you needed to say? Um, Madam Chair, Paul Sun, for the record, um, I appreciate the applicant's willingness to work with the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation on the dedication and the new park area. So I think it will make it a very nice project for the future development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sun. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions of anyone, is there a motion? Or does anyone else have anything to add first? Okay, motion. Commissioner Washington, you were on. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff uh, in addition to the uh, findings as amended by applicant exhibit number one and approve preliminary plan, plan 4-19024 TCP 1-007-2019-01 and variation from section 24-121A4 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and, er, and as further amended by applicant exhibit number one. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Madam Vice Chair, is there any discussion? Madam Vice Chair? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. The ayes have it 5 0. Thank you. Um, okay. The next item is um, item 7, preliminary plan of subdivision 4 20018, Two Town Center. Um, I'm going to go through the uh, sign up list for this matter. Uh, we have a number of people signed up on there. Let's start. Mr. Heath, are you on? Yes, present. Okay. Mr. Horn, we see you. You're... I'm, pre I'm present, uh, Madam uh, Chairman. I, I do want to say as you go through your list, Al Arnold and Kathleen DeHill uh, from Stantec, neither one of them are, are on today. Okay. So I'm going to remove Kathleen and uh, Ms. DeHill and Al Arnold. Um, Jeffrey Harris? Yes, Madam Chairman, I'm here. Peter Schwartz? Peter will not be joining us today. Okay. All right. Um, Nancy Randall? Are you unmuting everything? Oh, okay. Nancy Randall? We, I see your name. Okay. Ms. Randall, are you unmuting yourself? She's waving. Okay, I can't. Oh, I'm going through the list. I can't see her waving. Okay. All right. Um, okay, let's go. Pakila Jones. Pak Present. Did I, I probably didn't pronounce it correctly, right? Did it's Pakula. Pakula Jones. Thank you. Um, Francis Silverholtz. Present, Madam Chair. Okay, wonderful. Carl Seward. Present, Madam Chair. Trina Dublin. Trina Dublin. And then she signed up to speak. Trina Dublin. Okay. And then, um, I, oh, you're present. Okay. Okay. Good. No, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I can call her and I can inform her that we're on now. She probably was um, unaware when we were coming on, so I can do that. Okay. Um, and and Aaron Dublin as well, I guess. Um, Courtney St. John. That is I. Okay. So oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's start with Mr. Heath. Oh no, there's four exhibits as well. We have um, applicants um, exhibit number one proposed edits. We have applicants exhibit number two possible offsite improvements. Um, we have a statement of concerns from um, Ms. St. John's and um, and and Saint uh, and one from St. John's Academy. Okay, um, Mr. Heath, you're on. Yes, 
Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I'm Antoine Heath with the subdivision and zoning section. Item number seven is a preliminary plan of subdivision for two town center, 4-20018. The subject property is the site of a vacant parcel to be developed with the 260,360 square foot office building and an 89,030 square foot parking garage on 9.05 acres. Next slide, please. The site is located within planning area 76A and council district eight. Next slide, please. More specifically, the site is located on the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Capitol Gateway Drive and Britannia Way. Next slide, please. The subject site is located in the MXT mixed use transportation oriented zone and is bounded to the north and east by properties in the I-3 planned industrial employment park zone and the I-1 light industrial zone. The adjacent zones are the CM, OS, ROS, OS, CSC, and CO zones. Next slide, please. Subject site is also located within the Southern Green Line sector plan and sectional map amendment overlay, as well as the military industrial overlay for height. Next slide, please. The aerial photograph shows the site in its current condition, the adjacent properties, which are a mix of residential, commercial, and industrial, as well as the Wamata Green Line train tracks abutting the property to the east. Next slide, please. The site map shows the topography, which slopes toward the east. Next slide, please. The master plan right-of-way map shows master plan collectors, all the way slash capital gateway drive and all place. Next slide, please. The critical intersections are identified in this slide and is further detailed in the staff report on page 10 were analyzed and will operate at adequate levels. Next slide, please. The subject site is shown here highlighted in red. Abutting right of ways are highlighted in blue. The site will be accessed from Britannia Way at the bottom of the screen. The location of the WMATA train tracks is highlighted in green. Adequate public facilities, including police, water, and sewer facilities, are available to serve the subject site. However, the site did not pass fire response time and will require mitigation, which is detailed on page 15 of the staff report. Next slide, please. Off-site bicycle and pedestrian improvements proposed by the applicant are shown on the slide. These improvements have since been altered to meet cost cap requirements and can be found in the additional backup as applicants exhibit number two. Next slide, please. The applicant has requested a variance from section 25-122B1G for the removal of one specimen tree X'd out in red. This variance has been evaluated in accordance with the associated provisions of approval detailed on page 18 of the staff report and staff recommends approval. Staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve preliminary plan of subdivision 4-20018 and variance from section 25-122B1G subject to the 11 conditions in the staff report. The applicant has proposed revisions to the conditions as shown in the additional backup and staff is in agreement with these revisions. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Heath. Um, good job. Um, let's see if there's any questions of you. Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Okay, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Um, Commissioner Dorner. Yeah, can we go back to slide 11? Sir. Mr. Oh, okay. Mr. Planning? Sir, okay. Sir. Okay, got it. Yeah, this slide is, and, and maybe we can wait for the applicant's presentation, but this slide is slightly different than what um, applicant exhibit two is having. Applicant Exhibit 2 only has in that like top right section the the proposed bike um, shared um, on, on, on the road access. And then it looks like it has a couple more like signs and, and bus and other, other improvements in there. But are we killing all the rest of the purple that's basically on the entirety of the screen for Applicant Exhibit 1 or 2? Or, or is it going to be an enhancement? Uh, so uh, yes, initially this uh, this was presented by the applicant as uh, possible um, possible improvements, but when accounting for the actual cost cap, these 
these weren't necessarily meant to be uh, proffered, but more so proposed ideas for offsite improvements. And with the cost cap requirements, that additional uh, uh, exhibit you see in your backup is is the cost cap requirement. And I'm sure Mr. Okay. Horn can go into more detail. Yeah, I, I'll definitely lean on Mr. Horn to do that because um, they basically killed all the bike paths. Um, and um, and there's, there's essentially none now. Um, it's just a small little U that's at the top of the screen. So I'll wait for him to, to tell us about that um, and whether or not we want to maybe um, shift some of that that, uh, that if we can on the cost. So thank you. OK. Um, Commissioner Geraldo. I have no questions at this time, uh, Madam Chair. OK. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Horn, you're on. Thank you so very much, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Board. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Arthur Horn, the law offices of Shipley Horn in Largo, Maryland. Very pleased to be here today uh, representing Two Town Senate LLC and uh, representing the applicant in this case, Mr. Jeffrey Harris, who you mentioned. We have with us uh, from Wells and Associates, uh, Nancy Randall and Aquila Jones. Uh, we have from uh, Shipping Horn also our land planner, uh, Francis Silverholtz. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Stantec is the civil engineer. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Arnold was not able to be here, and Ms., as well as Mr. Hill, who unfortunately had a death in the family, uh, so she wasn't able to be here. Um, we uh, wanted to uh, first say that uh, but we agree with the staff's uh, recommendations, the findings, uh, facts, and conclusions of law uh, as set forth as amended slightly by the applicants exhibit one and two. Uh, this application uh, today, along with the, an application next week for the detailed site plan, is a response to the GSA for an RFP that was sent out for uh, the second part of the uh, citizen immigration naturalization service. Many of you all know, and we'll show you in detail next week at the detailed site plan. If you haven't been back to the Branch Avenue Metro station lately, you really should go uh, because this applicant has done a tremendous job of building. First of all, he has uh, bought, uh, to brought to this area uh, the uh, initial CIS uh, building that's there up and ready to go. There's a brand new restaurant row uh, that will have uh, a lot of restaurants open and operating directly across the street from that site beginning uh, in January or February of next year. And uh, this is the second part of the application of process. One of the reasons, and we certainly want to thank Mr. Hunt and, and uh, uh, park and planning staff is that one of the requirements of the uh, RFP is that the approval is demonstrated that you can have this building uh, in 2020, which is why there was an exigency in the circumstances of, of moving forward with the preliminary plan and with the detailed site plan. Um, so to talk to uh, real quickly what, what Mr. Daughter was indicating, uh, <laughs> Well, I wouldn't use the word to say that we killed the project as far as bike paths, and we do have a, a BPIS recommendation. What happened was, Mr. Dornick, when we put in the application, we showed the entire area uh, back here and said, hey, here are all the various locations where you could have uh, a bike share, bike lanes, improvements, et cetera. And then when the staff report came out, they said, oh, great. You all are proper to do all this, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we said, oh, no, 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 no. We aren't able to do that. We were just showing you where it could be. And then from that list, we will come up with uh, the areas that makes the most sense as far as uh, being able to put in bus shelters, uh, being able to put in uh, shared bike lanes and signage and stuff. And the applicants exhibit one. Uh, is the result of that, which is the cost cap in this particular case of a little over $100,000, uh, which is the requirement to be able to be done. So it's not like we uh, have uh, you know, asked for a reduction in anything. To the contrary, we 
uh, done everything that was required. Uh, there's a lot of uh, additional work that can be in, you know, done in that area in the future as others may come. But right now, uh, you know, what you see in the applicant's exhibit one is the requirements that uh, set forth in that area. And I'm sorry, applicant's exhibit two. Uh, applicant's exhibit one is the amendment to the uh, staff report because, again, when it first came out, it was based on the fact that uh, that they thought that our applicants were proper and to do all this work that's back there and and that's just simply not the case not that uh, you know the applicants uh, doesn't believe that you know uh, it would be great if all this were in existence uh, but uh, you know with reference to the ability to afford to develop this site uh, this is the amount that's required is the amount that was done and it's set forth and, and, and done in the most logical means. So I, I, I don't want to, uh, I mean, the, the visual does make it seem like a lot was removed, but it, it was uh, actually what needs to be done for that particular site and on this application. And, you know, for the most part, again, we've agreed with staff all the way. We appreciate them working with us. You know, there are, there are uh, you know, statements within the application that, talks about the size of the uh, of the sidewalks, the eight foot sidewalks and, and all that. And the part, this area back here is pretty much developed with the seven foot sidewalks. So the condition does make it subject to uh, DPI uh, or DPW and T for what the sidewalks would be and the size of it. Or, you know, our, our, our statements to staff early on is saying, hey, all you need to do is go out to the site and see that so you are asking for us to build eight foot sidewalks. That's what you did previously for the first EIS building. And uh, because of the fact that these sidewalks are existing out there and the layout, uh, you know, they were able to do seven foot sidewalks, uh, you know, that would probably be better. But we went ahead and agreed with the condition because again, it has to go to deep high. We don't want to have to uh, do anything else because the roadway is already dedicated out there. Uh, you know, it's built to its final uh, destination. So, uh, you know, we just, we didn't want to have a disagreement with staff on that issue, but we understand why they were saying these would be the optimal uh, use, but uh, basically we believe that the uh, sidewalks that are there now, with seven feet, will probably be the ones that will, will do. If d by any chance comes and agrees with the staff recommendation for eight feet, then it will be eight feet. So. Um, but having said that, uh, Madam Chair, um, you know, we have, again, uh, individuals here who may be able to answer some additional questions as you have, but uh, we are uh, attempting to, once again, uh, bring to Prince George's County a federal government tenant, if at all possible. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, if, this, if, if uh, we're unsuccessful with the RFP in receiving the bid, then the development won't go forward. Uh, so this development is pretty much tailored to this one uh, user and hopefully it will occur but uh, if by chance uh, it doesn't then you know we'll we'll go back to the drawing board and try something else uh, in the future okay um thank you mr horn let's see if the board has any questions of you at this time and then you'll have the we have a number of other people signed up and you'll have the opportunity for closing um, um or to respond rather um, so, Madam Vice Chair? No questions, thank you. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, so, Mr. Horner, thank you for the response. Um, I, I would say you almost killed the, the BVI stuff. I mean, I realize, like, it's expensive, right, to do these things. Um, but it, it it's such a fraction of the, of the proposal, which I know that that was a proposal and, and and we would love to get everything, and, and, and there's legal restrictions of what we can have and just, like, economic um, restrictions that you guys can actually make it work. Um, what I was I was wondering, I, I was just kind of counting the number of, of, sh of um, markings and trying to figure out how much would it cost to, to do the rest of the um, of just the bike markings and, and a couple, of maybe some extra signs and stuff. My guess is it's probably... Fifty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars to do all of the, the bike markings and and signs kind of along those ways. 
Um, I, I could be off, but but I, I think that's probably pretty close because they seem to be fairly cheap um, based on on your your amount there. Um, so I was kind of wondering, like, why are we doing the bus shelter at, at the bottom end that, that you've got there? If we kill the bus shelter and we kill the additional fee that you got um, for the, the, the consultant on, on the construction cost, um, that would give you enough money to actually have a complete kind of bike network in there. Whereas, like, right now we're, we're doing, like, almost nothing, really. I mean, to be completely honest, as a, as a biker and a, as somebody who takes his kids around to do transportation, like, that's basically nothing um, in there compared to what it could be. And if we if we remove the, the bus shelter, we could actually get a more fulsome network of, of bike markings. Maybe it doesn't go all the way up at the top, but it could act, actually at least be kind of almost that circle area within there. Um, did you guys look at that as, as a potential option or, or why? Or, or, or could we do that where we would just drop the bus shelter and that, that additional fee and then replace it with all the bikes? And, and the pedestrian signage. Let, let me defer uh, to either Mr. Harris or uh, Ms. Randall uh, with reference to the cost and the and the decisions along that. I don't know, Nancy, if you. But, what, 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 uh, wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm understanding the question. Um, are you saying remove the bus shelter altogether, Commissioner Dorner? Yes, I would say replace the bus shelter. Um, improvements there and have it all kind of biking and pedestrian access within there because that would, but, it would but still where, come under I think the cost gap and be complete. But where would you put a, I mean in something like this where we you know in terms of the a location and, and um, a metro where would you where, you know having served on the WMATA board and, and and being involved in planning I'm just trying to figure out I, I think the bus shelter is important I just want to I would wonder where we would put it. So I would say we don't do it with this particular application. And I'm not saying that the bus shelter is not important per se, but you could get, with this one application, you could get a complete bike network. Instead, if, if we were not to do the bus shelter, instead, if we do bike and the bus shelter, you basically get nothing. You get, you get a, a little curve, a, a little U on the bike, and then you get a bus shelter, which is almost just like, it's worthless for okay. bikers. Um, it, it, it's just not even worth almost doing that, in my opinion, because it's 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 a bike path that leads to nowhere and and doesn't really do anything. Um, whereas you could get one application to do almost the entirety of this, and then we could have other applications potentially later that could bring in the bus shelter or deal with that. All right. Let me. Um, uh, so, who did you want to answer the question, Mr. Horn? Let me start off with Ms. Randall. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Randall. Okay, let's make sure we can, let me make sure we can hear her. Yeah. She she but, I, hear you, oh, I need to she, I think she has to she's unmuted on our end. I think she has to unmute from her end. Okay. Nancy, you have to you're talking Nancy. they can't hear you. You have to unmute your screen. She's still talking huh? Oh. She's saying she has unmuted. Not working on her end. It doesn't seem to be working on her end, but she's she's um she's unmuted the little she's pressed the little mic yes. on her end. Yes, you, you, you. Okay, well, you got somebody else who can help with the question then. Uh, well, I guess it's the, it's the, her volume. Make sure her volume. volume. Yeah. She can hear us. Her volume is. Oh, there's no point in talking. We can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. Um, uh, how about uh, you know? Why, why, you why don't know, you figure that out? And and we can. She can actually phone in. She can call in, and uh, so if you call in and let's and and let me see if there's other questions of anyone else, and then we can go to the um, um, opponents at this point, and then we can come back to Ms. Randall, and that gives her time to call in. Ms. Randall, do you need the number to call in, or did you see it from the screen? Okay, we can't even. I don't know what she. Okay, so it's in the same email that you got, Ms. Randall. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, with that, um, Commissioner Dorner, while she's trying to get back on, is are, do you have any other questions of Mr. Horn? Uh, no, that, that was it. And, okay. and that's, I'm totally fine with waiting on my question. Okay. Um, okay, Commissioner um, Geraldo. 
I have no questions, Madam Chair. I, I do want to hear the response questions that were raised by uh, Commissioner Dorner. Okay, thank you. Um, so while she's doing that, let's and and Ms. Randall, you can't be on. Well, maybe you can. She can. Usually, you can only have one um, item on um, at a time. When okay, so let me let me go through the list. Um, and I know, and I, and our staff can answer some of that too, because I know the county is, is really big on, on, I mean, I know we want bike trails too, but we are trying to encourage more um, public transportation. So I know the bus um, shelter is important too. So it may be, you know, maybe some of our staff can answer, but before that, I'm going to call on Mr. Seward. I, I know I saw you on a second ago. There you are. Okay. Yes, good morning. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? We're great. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Madam Chair and members of this board. Good afternoon again. My name is Carl Seward, and I have the great fortune of living in Prince George's County and living in District 8, where this is being built. Uh, I've had an opportunity to review the documents. I've had an opportunity to hear uh, representation from the developer. And you know, I'm a mathematician by training and by vocation, and I think about 260,000 360 square feet for the building, 89,030 square feet for the parking deck. And I find it to be um, interesting, almost disingenuous to suggest that we can't have the, the bus loop and uh, the bike trail and review of the documents. The developer has suggested that there will be bike racks near the building. So, if there are bike racks, but there are not provisions for people to bike to the back bike racks, I I just feel that that is that does not invest in our community. Uh, one of the comments that I had heard from a speaker previously is the, the the our county thought that the builder was proffering some ideas, and actually because of the cost cap, they were just recommendations. I would ask that this committee consider off road or uh, off way from Capitol Beltway Drive to Allentown Road. On that stretch of property, you will find the beginning parts at the Capitol Beltway and off road is sidewalked. Uh, the area there from Dublin Drive up until the uh, near Princeton Elementary School uh, entryway is not sidewalked. Uh, from that area to the 7 Eleven, that's partially sidewalked, partially not. And so I would just uh, appeal to this board that our answer for current development cannot be promises uh, that the likelihood of them being built is, is, is not is not probable. I'll use a statistics term. Uh, one of the things that has troubled me about development in District 8 is the uh, there is a uh, uh, auto mechanic store off Allentown Road and that was not in the original plan so while I appreciate and I can understand as a matter of my vocation forecasting the reality is a plan you know hope is not a strategy and so to hope for a bike trail in the future or to hope for a, a, a bus terminal a bus stop for residents in the future that 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 can't be a strategy and I think about the money to build 260,000 square feet of office space, the money to build eight, almost 90,000 square feet of just parking space, and money cannot be provided for bikes or uh, for, I mean, granted, I appreciate the eight foot south folks, or for the bus terminal, I find that to be troubling. And, all, and I'm all for uh, development in that area and good paying jobs in that area. I'm not, uh, I'm just not comfortable um, Put, putting the community in a situation where we we feel so desperate for a government building that we have to give on the quality of life in that community. Those are my words, Madam Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Seward. Let's see if there's any questions. We appreciate your um, testimony today, uh, Madam Vice Chair. No questions, but thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Thank you, Commissioner Dorner. No questions. I, I just mentioned to Mr. Sir that um, I, so I, I agree with you on a lot of that, and, and I'm a researcher, quantitative kind of based as well, so I, I appreciate the forecasting um, reference. 
one of the things that we, we have trouble with with some of the developments is that there, there are cost caps or legal restrictions on, on what we can require um, up to a certain dollar amount and I think that's what we're, we're looking at right now so whereas it might be a, a penny in the pocket for for like a percentage base on how much this development might cost um, there's just legal restrictions that, that we're we're kind of stuck with so we have to kind of figure out like how do you actually allocate the resources given um, the, the constrained budget that's fair thank you sir um, okay Commissioner Geraldo Uh, I have no uh, no no questions. I just dovetail on Commissioner Dorners, Mr. Seward. So the, the the issue really is is as you said, is what's best for that area? What's the highest and best use of those funds? Okay, um, so let me see, let me see, check first of all to see if Ms. Randall is. Are you good now? Uh oh, that's not working either. What are you doing? Oh, yeah. There'll be a caller number now. And okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry for this no uh, confusion here. I was unmuted on your system, but apparently it wasn't coming through. Um, I'd like to provide um, an answer to the earlier question. In um, when I worked with uh, years ago, Mr. Schaefer um, in uh, the Parks Department, he wanted to know all the different opportunities there were for um, the pedestrian and transit, uh, be it bike, um, be it bus shelters, uh, and pedestrian walkways. Um, and have a complete inventory and then based on the amount of money that was required of a project uh, it would be a process of negotiation to figure out um, exactly how best to spend the money um, staff in reading um, the legislation um, feels and and i'm certainly not going to question that what we needed to do was to present exactly what was required, which was why we submitted that second exhibit that went to the actual dollar amount. Um, the question of whether or not we could do um, the full bike system um, is possible, um, but there are two bus shelters uh, that we're proposing in this, and then that small area of bike. Um, as I understand it from talking to staff, um, this will be um, further worked out uh, in terms of construction schedule. It's something that we have to do, we have to provide, and they wanted more details um, again later on, but being very specific in the preliminary plan, showing exactly um, where the monies would be spent. Um, if we have that flexibility um, such that we can then take a look at removing the two uh, uh, bus shelters and putting in uh, the bicycle system uh, certainly you will get more of that um, but we'd have to go through one of the items while well, the signs and the pavement markings themselves are not terribly expensive it's the maintenance of traffic that is expensive well, in order to get those pavement markings down and the signs in, we have to close the travel lane to do that. So there is an expense. It's not just a matter of purchasing the signs um, or putting the pavement markings down on the pavement. It's also the maintenance of traffic, which can get costly. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, okay, we may... Um, Commissioner Dorna may have something to add to that. Um, I'd like to, um, can we get to, um, let me find out about, uh, well, let's go to Ms. St. John. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Is that Ms. Hello? Okay, who's speaking? Hi, this is uh, Brian Burnett with the okay. Transition Planning Section. Okay, but I'm, I'm I'll come back to you, um, Mr. Burnett Woods, okay? I just want to go to Ms. Uh, St. John for a second, okay? Just, just hold tight, okay? Okay, sure. Okay. Ms. St. John, thank you. 
Hello, Madam Chair and members of the board. Thank you so much for taking the time out um, today to hear my um, concerns about the project um, of 4-20018. My name is Courtney St. John. I'm writing this. I'm, I'm speaking today on behalf of this application. Other residents and I of Camp Springs are greatly concerned about the upcoming project and how it may affect the community at large. I'm a born and I'm a born and raised Prince George's County resident, and I have seen a lot of change in this area thus far since the construction of the town center project, including the immigration building that was also built. First, I would like to bring you to your attention the concern of pedestrian safety in the area. I am a runner, and I can say that it's been times where I almost was struck on off road because of, because of the lack of sidewalks. The lack of sidewalks on off road makes it completely unsafe to walk to and from Branch Avenue Station. We have also had concerns that this new project will bring more traffic in the area, which would make this concern even more of a problem. Second, what are the plans that the county has in this area for preserving wildlife? As we all know, this is a huge topic that is of great concern worldwide. Thirdly, you may be aware that there are residents in Camp Springs that may be in need of career advancement. What are the plans for the government agencies coming to the area to provide a certain percentage of jobs for the Camp Springs County residents? I'm sure that there are many people that would benefit from the from the upcoming project and the jobs that could be uh, could be a benefit as well, especially not living far from the building. Fourth, fourthly, I'm sure you know that there are low performing schools in this area. Will the incoming agencies be offering career advancement slash internship opportunities for students in middle school and or high schools in this area? I believe that this would be a great way to have students engaged and okay. give them career advancement motivation while working on their academic careers as well. Ms. Ms. St. John, Ms. St. Make... John, I need, I appreciate your, your suggestions. You have some very good suggestions, but some of them are beyond the scope of what this planning board not only can approve and even consider. So we can, so that is beyond the scope of anything that we can that we can address. Now you can have a, a private conversation to your heart's content with the applicant, but we can't. Um, we don't address um, the 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 type of education or, or those kinds of offerings that are addressed. Uh, this is a, a land use matter that that we can address, and there's certain parameters. Um, while your ideas are very very good. Um, they are beyond what we can. I appreciate consider. you. I appreciate okay. you bringing um, you um, expressing how my ideas are great, and I appreciate that, Madam um, Chair. But in in all, I would like to say that this project is of a concern for um, a lot of residents in this area because of the upcoming because of the um, uptick in traffic that it will bring to off road, um, and there are a lot of citizens, um, senior citizens in this area as well. So, um, in addition to the immigration building and the restaurant row that is that is here, and the metro station, there are concerns that residents have, and so I'm speaking on concern of the residents. I'm sorry that I brought up other concerns as well, but those are things that me as a county resident, I do have concern of. So, thank you so much for taking the time out to consider my concerns. I also have a daycare in this area that's in home daycare. And so I would like to speak on behalf of my daycare, St. John's Early Learning Academy. But thank you so much okay. to you and the board. Okay. So are you saying that your comments just now pertain to both? Is that what you're saying? Or are you saying you needed to speak again? No. No, they're separate. Okay. I'm speaking on All behalf right. of me go. being a county Let's go. resident. Let's go. Let's go. So go ahead and speak. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, am I going next for yes. St. John's Early Learning yes. Academy? Yes. Or yes. 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 <laughs> You said you needed to speak. Can you just okay. add your comments for the Learning Academy now? I can. I and mean, we, and like, we have. And we have. I'm doing this, Madam Chair, and so no I worries. Mean, I'm just kind of going with stuff. No, no worries. Everybody, Thank you. everybody has the first time. You're doing great. Yeah. And, and we also have your. Okay. Uh, and we also have your the letter, um, your your exhibit, your personal exhibit, and the exhibit on behalf of the academy too. So we have that too. So if you have something to add to that, that would okay. be great. Okay. 
No, I don't have anything to add. I just have the written statement. I don't know if you want me to um, speak since we're on record now. So did you I mean, want you me can to speak in behalf I don't want now you to just read the letter? No, no, don't read the letter because we have the letter. We've had the letter. We have to pour over all this stuff. That's why we have everyone register and submit exhibits in advance so that we have the opportunity to go through everything. I'm in advance. So we had that. We've gone through that. But if you want to just highlight a couple of um, things from the letter, that's fine. If, if it's just, high, well, just a was, high um, level. Speaking on behalf of, okay. Right. And speaking on behalf of my daycare, um, it's an in-home daycare. It's off of off-road. Um, I do have, I have some complaints from some of my parents about the lack of sidewalks on off-road. A lot of my parents walk to and from um, the station. Sometimes they walk from um, the 7-Eleven on the other side of off-road. Um, so they complain about the lack of, the lack, uh, the uptick in traffic and the lack of, um, and the lack of um, sidewalks as well. Um, and so, I mean, that's just basically what they bring to my attention and also the, um, just taking consideration of wildlife in the area as well. Um, I did have um, one of my um, neighbors did hit a deer um, and a lot of the neighbors in the area complain about the uptick in deers in their yards as well. So, uh, well, we've actually working on that, and we brought that to the attention of the county, and the county is aware of that too. That's separate and apart of, from this application. So, um, okay. okay. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and the members of the board. Um, and this is a concern that about this development coming to the area because that would be um, additional three buildings um, that will be coming to this area. So we just have great concern about that and how that would help with how that will contribute to the lack of pedestrian safety that we're already experiencing. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll get some answers to the things that we can address, okay? Um, next, mm -hmm. um, okay, so next, um, did w was Trina Dublin able to get on? Can you unmute the callers if you don't see her name? Yes, I'm here. Okay, okay, you have some things to add? Can you please identify Thank yourself? Thank you, everybody, Madam and, and if everyone else can, uh, can mute themselves because, because we hear it like a television or something. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and everybody at the board. Uh, my name is Trina Dublin. And, um, yeah, I, I, I've been living in this area for about 25 years and when when the metro first was proposed I was opposed to that because of traffic and now um, I can see the parking lot um, right where my because I'm doing Devon Street on Durham Street I can see the parking lot of the home in security it's right there in my backyard along with the metro and yes neighborhood has changed because it used to be where Nobody knew where this location was at. Nice, quiet. And my concerns is too about, you know, building uh, the traffic, part of speed bumps, having speed bumps put along that area where the Homeland Security, other the other places um, that you guys are planning to build on. But that, that's that's my concerns too. So yes, it has changed more traffic. Like I said. In the early 2000s, when you know people were talking about the metro, I didn't want the metro because it brings, you know, not so good. Stuff. I mean, it helps when people. Yeah, you can, you know, take the subway and you, you know, to your job or whatever. But it, it brings other type of traffic too. And you know, I'm really considering about moving because it has changed. There's so much traffic. I love my neighborhood. I know my neighbors. We will. This, this is a close net neighborhood that I stay in, and um. So that, that's my concern with what's that going on and building and building. You know, are you gonna have speed bumps? Because around that way, there's a lot of traffic. They speed up and down that and it's over road. You know that that's my concern. Even around this circle, that circle is, is, is dangerous. I don't know. When that plan came up, if that circle is dangerous. But some people don't stop, you have to stop, you know, there's several times wrong to get in the accident. So that's my concern, and I thank you for listening to my concerns. 
Okay, thank you, Miss Dublin. We appreciate it. So, um, no problem. Okay, um, but is Aaron Dublin signed on as well? No, he's he's at work. He has okay. to work. I'm okay. sorry, that's my husband. He okay. has to work. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's every uh, that was everybody. Let, let me see if the board has any questions of of you or Miss um, St. John, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> No questions, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Commissioner Dorner? No questions, thanks. Okay, and, and Commissioner Geraldo? No, no questions, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, now. I just want to thank the witnesses. Yes, we thank them as well. Okay, now, um, Brian Barnett Woods? Hi, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Um, if, if the board had any other questions regarding the, the shared lane markings and the bus shelters, I might be able to provide a little bit of additional information if it's, if it's, um, if it's necessary. Well, okay. So I, I don't, I, let's see if anyone uh, needs any needs any more information. I, I think that we've, um, um, you know, we'll, we'll leave it up to the applicant to explain. I, I, I know one thing. I know, I know the one thing I know is that the bus shelter is important, I, I, and and I'm not saying the trail is not important either. But I know we're, this is you know we're talking about development right near the metro station, and having served on the planning commission for a number of years, they've talked. I mean, we've always talked about that, and having served on the um, WMATA board, metro board of directors for a number of years too. Um, I, you're facilitating. Yeah, no, no, yeah. But, and, and I think something to keep in mind, um, in 24, uh, 1, the legislation for adequate uh, pedestrian bikeway facilities, they include kind of examples of, um, of, of types of facilities that, that applicants can proffer. Um, and it's in an order of preference, and, and bus shelters is on this list. Um, and shared lane markings are not on the list, but there is, it, is, it does allow uh, to not be um, limited to just these, these items that are in the list. So something to keep in mind is that um, shared lane markings are important, and in this area, um, you know, they're, they're part of the approved Southern Green Line Area Sector Plan, which is why it was considered. Um, but if we're looking at the two types of facilities, that's another thing to keep in mind, that, you know, bus shelters um, is, on, is on this prioritized list of facilities by shared lane markings aren't. Um, and that's not to discount the value of sharrows and, and being able to build a, a bicycle network, um, but in terms of how we think about um, improvements in facility to contribute toward adequacy. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Horn, do you have anything else to s say and wrap up? Because I know we have a huge matter that's going to take place. It's going to take hours. So we need, it, we need to get to our um, very quick little break. Mr. Horn? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I won't uh, belabor the point other than to say that uh, uh, again, we will stand by for our uh, what the staff have recommended. I do want to say generically for the citizens, I had uh, the opportunity to, to speak with Ms. St. John, the president of the Camp Spring Civic Association, and, I, and we absolutely understand the concerns that they are, uh, you know, expressing about the community as a whole, not the town center per se. And we want to make sure we differentiate, but where they are. Uh, they, there is off road has uh, very limited right of way, and they don't have any sidewalks. And uh, right now, and I'll stand to be corrected if Ms. Randall can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there has been in the county a CIP for approval of that for 20 some odd years. It's just never gone forward. And and as Mr. Barnett Woods would tell you, when it comes to uh, making recommendations of what to do here. If, even if we wanted to say, hey, let's put this money towards helping the uh, the uh, existing established community build sidewalks in the neighborhood instead of doing some of this, we couldn't do it. That's not, uh, you know, something that we could do in here. So we definitely understand their issues uh, that's out there, and we, uh, you know, uh, concur that hopefully something could be done. But again, it's beyond this application itself. And uh, with reference to Mr. Dorner's concern, again, we'll look at that, uh, as Ms. Randall indicated, if there's any way that we can you know, look at it, uh, we'll do it. I mean, again, bus shelters has generally been the priority, but you know, if, if in fact 
uh, you, you want to have uh, an alternative, then you know, we'll look at that at that time. But we do uh, think that, again, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, for this area. Um, you know, it, it, uh, we're hopeful and prayerful that we can get this uh, this government entity out here. One of the things that uh, I do want to say is unlike the other locations where the federal government, and these are secure buildings as well, uh, will come in and they will be completely internally controlled. Uh, one of the requirements of the application is that you have a retail road facility right in walking distance for them so they can come out of the building. That was the impetus for being able to get CIS to come down the first time. We hope it will work for them again this time. Uh, so this is uh, integrate you into the community, jobs, tax base, uh, opportunities for people to work in the area. So there's a lot of good things about this. Uh, and, um, you know, again, we, we will, from the applicant standpoint, do all we can to continue to make this town center great. If there, we can expand it out to the community and do what we can, we'll do that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are some limitations that we aren't able to do beyond this uh, application. So with that, I'll just say thank you again to Mr. Hunt, to Mr. Heath, uh, Ms. Connor, and Mr. Barnett Wood to you know, work with us on this application here and uh, for uh, coming up next week. Um, Mr. Horn, let me do. Th let me say this before I ask for a motion. So I know that you you were able to talk um, with Ms. St. John, but there are other folks who signed up, Mr. Seward, um, and Ms. Dublin. I mean, if 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 someone on your team can have co future conversations with them as well, that would be helpful. Um, we can. We won't do it over the air, but um, uh, if if we can, um, that they can provide send you an email, or we can provide you their contact information. Okay. Okay. Please, uh, thank you. Thank uh, you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so does the um does the board have any questions of anyone at this time? Madam yeah, Vice Chair. Chair um, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, got Commissioner Dorner? Uh, sir, yeah, I, I just wanted to find out could could we write it flexibly in um like applicant exhibit one with the modifications for the BPIS? Um, as as reviewed and approved by by staff, so that way when we get to the um, the the DSP, then then we would be able to potentially look at other options. Because right now the the way that it's written, I I, I appreciate Ms. Randall's comments, and actually I like how Mr. Schaefer had asked, hey, just show us everything and let's see what we can build out. I, I think that's a good way to go. But we don't have any options right here. I, I missed actually in that looking exhibit two one of the the other push offers. I, I thought it was just one, um, and and I realize that they're important, but it, this is also just the applicant exhibit two. It, it's it's very it's shallow on the bikes bike sense. Um, and if we could see about the cost of if we were to eliminate one of the bus shelters and substitute that to complete an entire bike show, uh, bike network, then we would have an entire bike network and one bus shelter potentially from there. And I don't know what the costs are because we haven't been given any of that um, based upon what we're looking at for slide eleven out of twelve. Um, so if we could have some flexibility in, in the recommendations, um, I think that maybe that would get us to the DSP where we could actually look and see what's possible. You know, Mr. Uh, Donna, I'll, uh, I'll just say we actually made that recommendation, but it was our understanding from Mr. Barnett Woods, and he could speak for himself, that that determination had to be made at the time of the preliminary plan. But if, this ability, if the flexibility can be built in, we don't have any objection to that. Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, Mr. Barnett Woods should be around. Okay, Mr. Barnett Woods. Uh, yeah, but Mr. Horn said Mr. Barnett Woods said that was not possible. So, okay. So, Mr. Mr. Barnett Woods? Hi. Uh, good and, and I'll Sorry, also follow up with Mr. Goldsmith. Okay. Okay. Um, the finding of adequacy is made at the time of the criminal plan of subdivision. Um, and in this case, because the two, or the two applications are very close together, maybe an outlier, but in other instances where we've had instances where we pushed the, the um, off-site uh, pedestrian and bikeway improvements until the DSP, um, that may be years later. And when that happens, it ends up being really problematic in terms of what can actually mm -hmm. be implemented. Um, and so we prefer giving the opportunity to make sure that the adequacy is found at the time of preliminary plan and the improvements that are that are tied to that are also done 
um, at the approval of the preliminary plan. Okay. But if the so is is the adequacy just that they they've put in sufficient amounts because I think that's what we're talking about is that it might be there might be a substitution of what happens or what's in there but they would be right around the same amount or or degree of of improvements and and that would then meet, meet the public adequacy finding I would assume right. Well, I we need, we need also need Mr. Goldsmith on this as well, our legal counsel. So, yeah, I mean. I think we can make the, we might, I think if the board concurs, I, I think we could, we might be able to make one of the conditions flexible so that way they could go back and check to see if, um, you know, maybe they can go through the, cal the calculation to see if removing one, um, one bus shelter completing the bike loop is still within the cost cap. Okay, that, that's definitely what I would like to see in, in the motion. So which condition are you referencing, Mr. Goldsmith? Um, well, I'm, I am sure. Uh, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at applicants exhibit. Uh, it doesn't well, say which condition. Well. Okay. So this condition, uh, the condition A, 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 B, and C are, uh, is how we, as amended, how we outline where the bus shelters will be located, how many bikeway signages and all. It's all in condition A, A, B, and C. Right, but you but the cost information and the other information well, cost are in yeah, and changes in the findings in the staff report. I mean is this something we can add as a finding or does it um, well, you know, Madam Chair, if I can only thing I report ha for the DSP is posted because it has to be posted two weeks in advance. Um, it is posted, but well, we, we can make the recommendation of, of edits if possible. Okay. Um, and the other thing is about dollar amounts, we, we would not be we would not be putting that in the resolution or anything like that in the, in the condition um, that, that we would be precluded from doing. Okay. The dollar amount is set forth in the findings in the, okay. app, in the staff report okay. under the adequacy of off-site facilities. Okay. Right. And, and also adequacy isn't, isn't typically determined just based on cost, yes. based on the facilities that are proposed. Um, but I think it's my understanding that staff would agree that if, if it's under the cost cap, um, removal of one bus shelter and completing the likely the best, one, the best possible I think that would uh, okay. Well, you're going out, Mr. Goldsmith. Can I ask a question? I mean, as I, as I understand it, what we are, what, what's in front of us today is really kind of the base, right? In terms of what's required, is is there anything that precludes us at the DSP level from increasing that? Yeah. Well, this is. I mean, well, adequacy is typically determined at the time of. Um, yeah. I understand, but what we have in front of us is adequate. But I think Commissioner Dorner is getting at is, you know, whether we can build on the adequacy. I mean, yeah. and, and help me if I'm misunderstanding. Yeah. We might be able to include a consideration. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, we can't build, I mean, we, we can uh, be able to, to include a consideration in, the, in this resolution and say, you know, if possible, um, could they consider? Uh, could they consider completing the bike okay. loop? But I don't think, you know, what the determination the determination of adequacy is done here. You know, this is yes. not, not. And we're getting ready to get to the point where we're going to have to continue this until after the next case because we have to. We were supposed to break, and and the next case is going to take hours. That but it has to start at one thirty. Um, so, so, Mr. Goldsmith, what if they were to insert at the very end of, before it gets to A, B, and C, they were to insert like a clause of some sort that would say like subject of staff approval based on a reasonable degree of similar adequacy mm -hmm. um, of proposed improvements. And and that would be the spirit of the nature of, of may, may substitute more bike, 
in, in signs in lieu of like taking out one bus shelter. And, and I think we have enough evidence today of what we're trying to go at that, that we're not trying to like increase the cost by doubling it or anything like that. We're just looking to see within around the same budget if we can get a little bit more more in terms of the services and just substituting between the two. So if I if, if, if I understand it, what you're trying to do is to try to lock in some of the some of the priorities to see if that's viable. In other words, and I understand what you're saying is that it's so broad, it doesn't say anything other than they'll have to spend up to 100, be able to narrow it down. No, I think Commissioner Dorner is the same flexibility cost. within the same cost. Right. So yeah. I'm right. Yeah, to, to hit before, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Geraldo, before we put something else on the table, can you respond to Commissioner Dorner's question? Yes, yes, they can. I think we could put an alternative for meeting adequacy in, in it's under that, um, under um, uh, condition eight. So we can have, we can add that extra clause. I think that Commissioner Dorner just, uh, that, that language that Commissioner Dorner just said, we can include that. And I think that will give them the flexibility that they need. So if they determine that um, this, this uh, Commissioner Dorner's alternative is adequate, um, and is under the cost cap, then I think that will give them some flexibility and staff can refine the language of that condition and we can take a look at it. Okay, great. Uh, Madam Chair. Okay, we have, um, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is uh, Andre Chakri, the planning director. We have to make, the, the board has to make the finding of adequacy today. Now the, now the adequacy right. can be in terms of do this improvement, do that improvement, do X improvement or the adequacy determination could be this dollar amount. And then at some point in the mm -hmm. future, a detailed site plan, uh, what that dollar amount will provide could be uh, determined. But there has to be an adequacy finding, just like all of the other adequacy findings at the time of preliminary plan that cannot be changed at a later date. A dollar amount that's proposed that that's an applicant exhibit two one hundred thousand nine hundred thirty two that is the cost cap right or it's really close so let's just do that let's just say if that's the cost cap we can't go above that let's just say that that's adequate because it, it, it to me it seems like that and we may substitute some stuff later we, we already say that that's kind of my point I think what you read into the record Commissioner Dorner is the flexibility you're seeking in yeah. terms of whether it's you know a bus shelter, one or two, whatever, and I think what you read into the record accomplishes that. Okay, I think is we're ready for the motion. We better be ready, yeah. as we're, otherwise this is going to like four o'clock. I think we're now, ready. Mr. Goldsmith, you you have already affirmed that what Mr. what Commissioner Dorner read into the record gives us the flexibility. I mean, the dollar cap is already in there as a finding. That's right. Uh, Madam Chair. All I'm saying is you know, they, they can provide an alternative for meeting adequacy. Um, and that's, I think, Commissioner Gunner added that. To take a determination of adequacy at the state, just like the planning director said. Right. And that would come, uh, that would be kind of a new condition 8D. 8D? Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at applicant exhibit number one. Yeah. Uh, yes, we could write it that way. Right. Okay. I think we're ready, Madam Chair. Okay. Let's have a motion, and then we'll see you all back in 20 minutes. Okay. Let's have a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of uh, staff uh, uh, to include the uh, revisions and corrections um, as outlined in applicant exhibit number one and approve preliminary plan 4-20018. TCP one dash two, excuse me, TCP one dash zero two one dash two zero two zero and variance to section two five dash one two two B one G along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and as further revised uh, by applicant exhibit number one. And then we will want to uh, add a new condition eight D uh, and it shall be uh, as read into the record by Commissioner Dorner. 
Okay. Is that a second? We have a motion by Commissioner Washington, seconded by Commissioner Dorner. Madam Vice Chair. Aye. Commissioner of Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. The ayes have it 5 0. We next have the uh, item 8, which is the resolution which would need to be amended in accordance with the vote that we just took on item 7. Move approval, Madam Chair. Second. We have a motion and a second. A motion by Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey, to approve the um, resolution as amended, um, consistent with the action we just took on item 7. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? Good aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Good aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Okay, the ayes have it 5-0. We'll see you all back. And, um, thank you, everyone else. We'll see the board back um, in, in 25 minutes. Okay, promptly. Okay, thank you. Bye. I'm going to have to get that. ...and opportunity to deal with Mother Nature as well. Um, so our next item on the agenda is item um, 10. And let me, let me confirm for everybody. We have the planning board. You see the planning board present. And I do want to take a moment to say um, that we have a, a sign language interpreter. And I don't know your name. I, I no one gave me your name. Uh, Ma'am, can you? Yes, I'm on uh, Margaret Hayes Cloth. Hayes Cloth? So close enough. Hayes Cloth. Yes. Okay. And we also have Ellie Cole, who's another interpreter, who will be on as well. Okay, thank you. So, um, so I wanted to make sure that everyone knows we, we do have a, um, a wonderful uh, sign interpreter, and they will be switching out. And I tend to talk quickly, um, and I know others may as well. So I'm going to ask every person who's speaking to speak clearly, perhaps not as quickly as we might normally speak, and to not look down. You, know, you might be looking down at a document or something, but try to face the camera so that our interpreter can see and interpret for those who need it, okay? So this item is a, a mandatory referral, nine, excuse me, one nine, 15A. It is for Prince George's County Men's Shelter. I'm going to first check and make sure that we have the parties that we need who've signed up. Um, Bobby Ray? Uh, present. Okay, wonderful. And um, which brings me to a new matter. Um, to the extent that you can um, be seen, to the extent that you can use your camera, please do. If you can't, some people phone in, um, our sign interpreter will do the best that they can. Um, okay, uh, Ronald Klein, I'm just checking, and I'm going to unmute everybody for the moment just to ensure that we have everyone. <laughs> Ronald Klein? Did you see his name? Okay, Steve Setzer. And we're going to take just a couple of seconds while we try to figure the um, feedback, try to address the feedback. Keep going or not? Call, caller number nine. Whose name? Ronald Klein. But I want us to address the feedback first. Yes. He might be a caller, is what we're saying. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, but you have to unmute everybody. Yeah, that's what we did, mm -hmm. and that's where the feedback's coming from. One, okay. of, one of the callers have, uh, they have two speakers on. Okay, so let me make sure, let me reiterate a couple of things. Number one, um, please have 
only one device in the room at the at the same time. So if you're on if you're using your video, please do not use your phone because that creates feedback. So we have a number of people who are visible on our screen. Um, I'm on YouTube now. Let me see. Okay, Dr. Klein here. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm having problems with the system. I'm having problems with your system. I've been on since 25 after, but I am present. Dr. Okay, Klein. wonderful. That's what we need to know. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve Setzer. He's, you're unmuted on our side. Even though. There we go. Hi. Hi. Yes, Steve Setzer here. Wonderful. Peg, Peggy Boozer. <laughs> Peggy Boozer, I, we see you. Why does it say off? Okay. Um, we'll come back to Peggy Boozer. Mark uh, Falzone. I'm right here. Wonderful. Sharon Turner. Sharon Turner. There are a number of people who just called in, and all we see are just caller number like 35, 38. So it's hard for us to tell. Um, okay. Ta um, Tamara Mahmood. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, Willania Denard. Willania Denard. It's Willania and I'm here. Okay. And what, uh, please tell me how to pronounce it again. Willania. Willania. Okay. Okay, Denard. Okay, Crystal Delby. Mm -hmm. I'm Crystal Delby. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Kelly Collins. Mm -hmm. Here. T um, Tatiana Mallory. Uh -huh. I am right in the middle of a community um, meeting. Yes, and, and, and you need to mute. <laughs> okay. Tatiana Mallory. Okay. Okay. Kayaka Mallory. Hi. Okay. You can hear, and Tatiana is also having issues unmuting. Okay. And 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 how do you pronounce your name? Tiaka. Tiaka. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Donna okay. Turner. Okay. Donna Turner. Donna Turner. Here. A oh, wonderful. Regina Bryan. Here. Thank you. Scott Wheeler. Present. Thank you. Daisy Maggot. Daisy Maggot. That's the jet. Oh, it's Majette, Daisy Majette. She's not going to be here. She's sick. Okay. Okay. L, is it L Langevin? Yep, I'm here. Wonderful. Did I pronounce it correctly? Close for now. No problem. Okay, thank you. Angel Anderson. Angel Anderson. Okay. Um, Michael Springer. Michael Springer. I'll come back. Michaela Mays. Michaela Mays. Ruth, Ruth Grover. Present. Thank you. Jeremy Speaks. Jeremy.
Jeremy speaks. Cortez Scott. Cortez Scott. Um, Wanda Collins does not wish to speak. Kevin Francis. Kevin Francis. Adele Peters. Joanne Harrison. Okay, that was Ms. Harrison. Okay. Yes, it was. Thank you very much. Arian Cannon. Present. Wonderful. Lonnie Monroe. Lonnie Monroe. Was that a present? Vincent Monroe. Present. Wonderful. Preston Smith. I'm here, present. Wonderful. Denise Alfaro. Denise Alfaro. Zalisa Cantave or Cantavi. I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Um, Reynolds Cantavi. Also here. Thank you. When, did I pronounce it correctly? It's Reynolds Cantavi. Cantavi. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask everyone else to please keep your mic and, and, and camera off and muted until you're called upon. Um, um, Mike, Michelle Esterlin. Thank you. Jade Sims. Present. Wonderful. Deborah Cameron. Present. Nicole uh, or Nicole Ford. Nicole Ford. William Lane. William Lane. Macy Nelson. Present. Thank you. Muriel Cooper. Present. Thank you. Desiree Smith. Desiree Smith. Lamont Brown. Lamont Brown. Nevada Fasteo. Nevada Basteo. Okay, someone's having a conversation. We can all hear it. Michelle Brown. I'm present. Thank you. Vaughn Edmead. Vaughn Edmead. Nicholas Delby. Delbe. Uh, Nicholas won't be joining. I'm here though, Crystal Delbe. I okay. can speak. Okay. Ahead. Okay. Wait a minute now. Okay, you signed up. Okay. Um. Um. Robin Hamilton. Present. Alex Talleyrand. Present. Wonderful. Thank Present. you. Thank you, Sean Ferguson. Sean Ferguson, Regina Bryan, present, Jessica Groton, please, you've got to help me out here. Groton Heist, and I'm present. Groton Heist, okay, thank you. Okay, Bradley Hurd.
Bradley Hurd. Jean Paul Petit. Uh, Mr. Hurd, are you? Is that you? Uh, Madam Chair, Macy Nelson. Uh, Mr. Hurd informed me that he had a conference call that was going to end about 1:30. I expect he's running late. Will join as soon as he breaks free. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jean Paul Petit. <laughs> Mr. Petit is here. Okay. Petit. Petit. I am okay. Here. Okay. Thank you. Just. Oh boy. We have you. Oh, we have you twice. Okay. Um, Roland Sharp. Roland Sharp. Belinda Queen. Belinda Queen. Dahlia Shaywitz. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Okay, Dahlia Shaywitz. I'm present, thank you. Did I pronounce it correctly? Very well. Okay, thank you. Every <laughs> once in a while I get it right. Okay. Um, and then we have a list of exhibits. Um, um, we have the, um, an exhibit from um, Alex Talleyrand, um, which we've all poured over. We have the list of residents who are proposed. I will address that um, and have legal address that as well. And that was um, from Mr. Nelson. We have uh, an, a statement from J. Crandall Esquire, um, um, Est an Esterlin opposition email, Merrill opposition email, and Bradley Heard um, opinion statement. Okay, those are the exhibits that we have. Everything, of, of course, as you all know and have complied with, you've all submitted everything and signed up prior to our Tuesday 12 noon deadline, and we thank you for that. Um, Madam Chair, yeah. Madam Chair should we, this is Peter Golds from the Senior Council. Should we make sure everybody has their cameras off so that way the person who needs the ASL interpretation can see the interpreter? Okay, that would be very, very helpful. That would, um, okay, so for now, um, uh, so that was, I think, everybody. Now, um, Mr. Nelson, when we get to you, we ha I have a request from you to for a certain order, and I will try to abide by that order um, as, as, a, as a courtesy. Okay. Um, so we're, I'm going to turn to Mr. Heath. Now, what, the one thing I'm going to ask everyone is that we have a lot of people signed up. We do not impose um, time limits per se, but we have the right to impose time limits. And I can do that at any point. I am, my goal is not to do that because we want to give people the opportunity to say what they need to say, but to not be unduly repetitive. If you want to say, you know, you're against it, or if you want to say, and I'll repeat this later, if you wish to say you're a proponent or an opponent, you have the right to do that. When I call your name, if you wish to speak, you have the right to do that. As we get further down the line, if you wish to associate yourself with the previous speakers or a particular previous speaker, you have the right to do that. Because we do want to give everyone the opportunity to be heard, so that is why I'm asking each one of you to not be unduly repetitive so that we can get to everyone. It is a hearing, um, and, and we want to make sure we, we hear everyone. This is a manager. This want, uh, Madam Chair, it's Peter Goldsmith, uh, Senior Counsel. Again. I just want to make sure I clarify my statement. When somebody's testifying, you know, I, I think it would be appropriate for them to turn on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely clear. Um, but thank you for that, Mr. Goldsmith. We have been joined by our Senior Counsel, Peter Goldsmith, who, who is with us today. Um, I'm not sure if we have um, Ms. Borden on as well, our De Deputy General Counsel. Um, that, um, I am. Okay, here. wonderful. Um, so, again, I'm going to ask everyone to not be unduly repetitive. This is a mandatory referral. This is a process that is, emanates from state law, the Annotated Code of Maryland, specifically the Land Use Article. It is um, a, an action by, uh, it is an applicant or an application from the Prince George's County Government and pursuant to the Land Use Article, specifically that pertaining to um, mandatory referral processes um, um, they have it has to be referred to us for comment for recommendations um, and this is pursuant to section 20-301 and 20-303 of the land use article of the annotated code of Maryland so 
we will provide our comments they are I just want to make sure that everyone fully understands they are not binding our comments are not binding the Prince George's County this is with any um, um, government that comes before us um, in Prince George's County if it's the city if it's uh, the University of Maryland if it's the uh, community college um, they can take all or some of our recommendations to heart they can consider but ignore um, but this provides an opportunity for everyone to hear what the concerns are and that is why we, we um, are offering this opportunity for everyone to uh, speak their uh, part we wish to hear from you but again ask that you not be unduly redundant so with that I'm going to turn for our um, a presentation. We've gone through the list of people who are signed up to speak and met the deadline, so we're going to turn for um, our staff presentation. I don't know if, if um, Mr. Goldsmith, I don't think you have anything to add at this time, but I'm going to start with Bobby Ray. All right, thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the planning board. Oh, uh, for the record, my name is Bobby Ray. I'm with the special projects section. Uh, as mentioned, this item is a mandatory referral review for the proposed replacement of an existing transitional housing facility located at 603 South Addison Road. Uh, uh, Mr. Ray, Mr. Ray, Mr. Ray, yeah. let me stop you for a second. Can I, can I, can you put her, our, our interpreter on the camera? Is that a little too fast for you? That's my question. Can the sign interpreter keep up or was he speaking a little too fast for you? It's perfect. Oh, no, we're perfect. The only time we really need to slow down is if it's specific numbers or uh, great names but that's the only time otherwise we are good thank wonderful. you wonderful thank you okay i'm sorry mr ray you may continue oh that's fine the uh, applicant as mentioned is the uh, prince george's county office of central services uh this project was previously reviewed administratively uh with a transmittal letter issued in july of 2019 so at that time the the letter was transmitted with um uh, recommendations uh from the staff's review uh it is now before the board as a full review and so following this meeting the board's recommendations will be transmitted uh to the applicant in the same manner that the administrative letter uh, was transmitted previously uh next slide please the uh, property is located in council district 7. it's in planning area 75a uh, next slide uh, the site is 2.63 acres in size. It's located on the west side of South Addison Road, uh, north of Ernie Bank Street. The park at Addison Metro Development is located on the south and west side of the site, uh, with townhomes to the south and detached single family to the west. Uh, the 10-acre site to the north is vacant, uh, and there is a church and a detached single family across Addison Road to the east. Uh, next slide. Uh, the property is currently zoned R55. Next slide. Uh, just a little background. The uh, property was purchased by the county in 1969. Uh, the facility itself was established in 1987. And in 2008, uh, the replacement of this facility was approved uh, in the county's capital improvement budget. Uh, so the actual uh, uh, placement of the facility you know, it was approved back in 2008 under the uh, CIP. So the aerial photo that you see here shows the location of the existing facility. It is 5,700 square feet in size. Uh, vehicular access to the facility is taken from Ernie Bank Street. Uh, there is surface parking on the west side of the building. And I did want to make a note that uh, you can see on the aerial that access to Ernie Bank Street from Addison Road is limited to a right in and write out movement only. Um, the current facility provides temporary housing for 36 men. Uh, however, given its size, it provides um, a little in the way of, of actual amenities. Next slide. And here are a couple of uh, photos of the existing facility. Uh, the photo to the left is taken from the rear of the structure uh, adjacent to the parking lot. And then you can see the, the you know, open space to the east of the lot on the uh, photo to the right and the tree cover that currently uh, uh, shades that um, that elevation. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows a, a site rendering of the proposed landscaping and placement of the facility on the site. 
the proposed facility totals 25,000 square feet, uh, increases the number of beds to 56, representing a, a 20 bed increase from the existing facility. Uh, the proposed building is sited closer to Addison Road. However, it does provide adequate dedication to allow for the best, to allow for the master plan right of way of 120 feet for Addison Road. Uh, the vehicular access remains from Ernie Banks Street, leading to surface parking with a total of 56 spaces provided. Uh, next slide. Uh, these two uh, uh, slides show uh, the exterior elevation, uh, I believe from the south and from the, uh, the north side. And next slide. Uh, same here, we have the east and west elevations and a rendering of the, uh, of the, of the whole facility. Uh, next slide. So the project was reviewed consistent with the, the uniform standards for mandatory referral uh, with notification provided to registered associations uh, as well as abutting and confronting uh, property owners. Uh, the, the recommendations prepared by staff uh, are shown on this slide and just to, this is from the 2019 uh, administrative review. And just to quickly summarize, they were adherence to noise standards, uh, soil erosion, sediment control measures during construction, uh, the use of full cutoff lighting fixtures for exterior lighting. And there was a recommendation, recommendation that additional windows be provided along the east elevation, uh, which we could go back to that elevation if you wanted to see that, but there was no, um, uh, no no windows shown, so there was a recommendation from our urban design section that uh, uh, that be considered in a redesign. So that uh, ends my presentation, uh, and I'll certainly attempt to answer any questions that the board might have at this time. Okay. Um, I'm going to call on the board individually, and, that, and then you can turn your camera on. Um, so not the, even the board members should have their cameras off so that uh, um, the focus can be on our sign interpreter. And everybody else should please turn your mics off as well. Madam Vice Chair, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Washington, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner, do you have any questions? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Giraldo, do you have any questions? No questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, so I was remiss in not mentioning this earlier, but we do have all five planning board members on board. And I, and I do have a question of Mr. Ray myself. You said this, but I want to be clear because I think there was some confusion as to how many new beds were being proposed here. But you did say it's an addition of tw 20 beds, right? That's correct. The, I, the report itself that was prepared in 2019 uh, identified the number as 46. Uh, that was in error. Uh, the existing facility has 36, and the new facility has 56, so it's an increase of 20 beds. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. And, it, and this pr pr proposal allows room for, for amenities? Yes. Um, yeah, there's significantly more amenities uh, with this proposal than uh, with the existing facility. Um, I can, if you would like, I can kind of run through some of the, um, the things that are being added. Uh, okay. They're going to add a, a health clinic. Uh, there will be meeting space. Uh, a production kitchen, a library, uh, expanded security, uh, improved infrastructure, and uh, a computer lab. So there's a there's a number of things that they're that they are adding with this that simply there wasn't room for in the existing uh, uh, facility. And when you say added security, what, um, can you describe that? You know, I I I I don't have the details on that. Uh, I can check with the. Um, Okay. Uh, the central services okay. staff and certainly okay. find out. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, now I'm going to turn, I'm going to, um, let me see this list. I'm going to, um, you, um, Mr. Nelson, you have a number of people signed up too. 
Um, so, but you don't represent everybody on this list. Okay. That's a correct statement. I represent just a few. Okay. Um, I have to find you now. Here's your list. Okay. Um, I will go, I'm going to, um, okay, so I see your list. Okay, so you, and you've taken, okay. So I'm going to call on some of them who I've, I've um, checked off here first. And I'm, and I'm also going to call on some of the people who did not respond when I first called names just to see if any of them have signed on. So maybe I should start with, um, um, she's not going to speak. Uh, Angel Anderson and okay, Angel Anderson to see if she's on. Okay. Um, Michael Springer. Michaela Mays. Jeremy Spakes, Cortez Scott, Kevin Francis, Adele Peters, Joanne Harrison, and I think you said, I'm here. All right, you said that. Okay, okay, so you're here. Um, do you wish to speak? Yes. Okay. It's your turn. And then we're going to turn, the board is going to turn our cameras off so that you can have the opportunity to speak, okay? And that, and so our okay. interpreter can, can hear you, hear and see you. Okay. Okay. We might want to pause. Be, we might want to pause. Okay. All right. We're good. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about my opposition to the expansion of the men's home shelter on Addison Road. My name is Joanne Harrison, and I did not receive any written notice of this project. Although I live within the boundaries of the city of Seat Pleasant, my home is approximately 0 0.9 miles of this site, and I feel this proposed development touches me as well because I believe what affects one community affects us all. And even though Central Avenue separates us, we're still one voice expressing the same concerns. First, let me stress to the planning board members, we are not into housing for the homeless. I strongly support housing for the homeless, and I believe my fellow members of the One Addison United share that same support. Throughout the year, I participate in a number of charitable programs at my church, work, and community, and I believe every person should have a spirit of giving to help others. In fact, I have, I have had friends and some family members who were housed in homeless or transitional facilities. And recently, I housed two families with kids who were also without a place to call their own home. I thank God every day that I'm not in a situation where living in a shelter is needed. So if you think this group, One Year Addison United, is against housing for the homeless population, then you're wrong and have completely missed our message. However, the message conveyed is, I do not support increasing the size of a facility and capacity of its residents, especially when the details of the project have not been shared with those who will be. I do not support groundbreaking on the site when the county has done its due diligence in engaging the neighborhood, neighboring communities and residents about its proposed plans. I'm not aware of one sign posted or mail sent to us, the people who have concerns about what is happening in our own neighborhoods. Whether this is a homeless shelter or a hotel, and the development plans were discussed back in 2008 or 18, 
I believe this issue still needs to have community input in 2020. This area already lacks many other critical services, such as grocery stores with fresh, healthy food choices. This area is suffering from a lack of viable economic growth and development, while we're steadily watching an increase in crime and safety concerns. This area has been neglected for many years, and it's time for the county government to do the right thing for its residents and communities. Why do we allow the county government to make development or redevelopment plans for property, especially when you haven't given proper notice to us? Were the proposed plans shared with the local leaders of neighboring communities where the shelter will be expanded or development? Have we had healthy discussions about the potential traffic impacts, safety concerns, daily operations of this facility? The answer, no. Although we are residents of differing communities, we can achieve more together if the county works with us. My home is one of my most valuable assets. I worked hard at being able to secure and afford such a property, and I'm thankful and proud in owning a piece of America in Sea Pleasant, a small community where I lived for many years. But I believe not engaging us on your plans is irresponsible, reckless, and shows a blatant lack of transparency and disregard for the residents of our communities and the county. This process has been seriously flawed and therefore I ask that we start this project over from the first step and get public input at the beginning. I would also ask County Executive Angela Osterbrooks to use her authority and influence to help us. We need you, County Executive Osterbrooks. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ms. Harrison. Um, it's, um, I, was there any kind of virtual meeting with the community? Let me, let me see if someone can answer that. Um, um, Mr. I I I can answer that. Okay, I'm wait sorry. a minute. I need to know who's answering. Only one person can answer that. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Bob, Bobby Ray. Okay. Um, there was a meeting held on December 1st uh, with the Office of uh, Central Services and uh, Social Services. They made a presentation to uh, to the neighborhood on the, on the project. Okay. Um, all right. I just had that question. Okay. December 1st of what year? This year. Of this year. Okay. 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 So, Madam Chair, Mr. Nelson, there, there are uh, two, there's more than one interpretation of what happened in that meeting. Okay. I'll just make that point. Okay. And you'll, uh, get, and you'll get to make that as well when, when, we, when we call on you as well. I just wanted to know if there was any, any kind of communication whatsoever. And then I may, ha and, and here's the thing. This application, as I said, you know, we, this board hears um, detail, there, there's a whole gamut of applications. There's detailed site plans, there's conceptual site plans, there's preliminary plans of subdivision, there's specific design plans. Um, uh, there's a whole gamut. There's alternative compliance. There's so many different types of applications and they have different requirements, different notice requirements, different approval requirements, and what have you. And most of that is set forth in the county code. Um, either typically subtitle 24 or subtitle 25, but um, but a mandatory referral is a product of state law, the annotated code of Maryland, and it's a little bit different because we make no decisions on this. We do not make any kind of final decision. What we do is we pass on our recommendations, or um, and and um, then as I said earlier, the count the county may abide by them or not abide by them, may abide by some of them, may disregard them. But I think what's happening is, I think they are, I think that's one of the reasons they may have had that um, virtual meeting. And I know Mr. Nelson's gonna talk about what happened. I wasn't there, we don't get involved in that ex parte stuff. So, um, but I think this is the county's opportunity to hear from the citizens as was that December 1st meeting. And so, so those of you who are talking today, um, the county is observing and hearing, and, and I think they will take um, many of your concerns to heart. Um, that maybe not everything, 
but I think this is relevant. So we appreciate the fact that you're speaking and that you have signed up to speak. Um, again, I just ask that we not be overly redundant, but you do due process does afford you the right to be heard. So um, I think this is a good opportunity for the for the county to hear again some of the concerns that are being raised, and it may they may be hearing from some of you for the very first time. So I think this is good um, that you're speaking, that, that you all signed up to speak in time. Okay. Um, I'm going to go down. I have to separate my lists here. Um, now, Denise Alfaro or um, um, Reynolds Cantab, do you wish to speak? Uh, yes, this is Reynolds Kantab. Um, I'd like to just echo the um, uh, the statement from the previous speaker and uh, go on the record as opposing um, the expansion um, of the homeless shelter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kantab. I am, for the record, I am keeping you uh, marked for the record as an opponent and that you have echoed the sentiments of Ms. Harrison, who just spoke. Okay. And um, so what about Delicia Kantab? I think she's on here too. Hi, yes. Um, I did want to uh, add a couple of comments. Um, hi, my name is Delisa Kantav. I am located on Halstead Avenue, um, half a mile away from the shelter. I did not receive any written notice of this expansion of the shelter, which is fivefold. Um, there had not been any community meetings with the affected neighborhoods, um, you know, prior to December 1st. Uh, other developers have presented at our HOA meetings to keep us abreast of future plans and to get our input. The fact that those responsible for this project uh, do not want to consider any input from the neighborhood is quite frankly disappointing. Um, I do not oppose county measures to combat homelessness. Um, however, I oppose the way the expansion has been handled thus far. Um, from the lack of notice to the indifference of the neighborhood suggestions such as moving the entrance to Addison Road, uh, potential site alternatives, and the look of the facility. Um, as a re resident and voter of the county, I'm asking that the planning board recommend neighborhood input in all steps of the process. Um, and we also, I would also like to appeal to County Executive Austin Brooks. Um, we are constituents and would like your assistance uh, to ensure that our voices are heard. It is important that our voices are heard, our opinions be valued, and our suggestions implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kentav, and we appreciate the fact that you're expressing your concerns and, and you've um, highlighted something else in terms of the entrance. Um, so that's something that um, everybody can take a look at, the county can take a look at. I can't guarantee what's going to happen, but I, they're hearing you. They're hearing each of you. And um, I think that, that your concerns are, um, um, will be at least be considered during this time. And I, uh, I'm going to turn to our attorneys at some point in terms of the notice, but it, it's a different kind of case that operates under state law, so the, the notice requirements are different. But I think the county made an effort um, to try to engage the, the citizens in terms of their December 1st meeting. I know Mr. Nelson has indicated there's something a little bit different. He has a different perspective, perhaps, on what happened at that meeting. So, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from him as well. Um, but we're all taking copious notes. The, all five planning board members who are present today and accounted for, as, as well as the county government. So I think um, the concerns that you raise are definitely being heard. Okay. Um, Nicole Ford. Okay, not here. Can you, can you hold on Nicole Ford? She asked me to text her when you called her name. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Desiree Smith. Lamont Brown. Nevada Bastel. Michelle Brown. Um, Robin Hamilton, 
Yes. This is Michelle Brown. Okay, Michelle Brown. You, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, well, we look forward to your comments. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is. Thank you. My name is Michelle Brown. I'm a resident of Rolling Ridge, um, about a half a mile uh, from the facility, maybe a little less. And I didn't receive any notice of this project. Um, homelessness is an, uh, an unfortunate situation that can find its way into anybody's life. Um, and a viable program or facility is, is, is great to have, you know, to get one on track. You know, it's very, you know, it's needed. However, I do not feel that the large expansion of the Addison Road Men's um, Transition Slash Homeless Shelter will benefit the surrounding neighborhood, especially with six schools within a radius of 1.6 miles of the facility. Um, the expansion of this facility will greatly hinder the meager growth of this already neglected and struggling area. We will face a significant decrease in our property value and an increase in vehicle and foot traffic on an already dimly lit pedestrian unfriendly road that the county still has yet to address so here we go again you know we're, we're going to do something in this county and we're not even gonna let anyone know you know we're we're underprivileged we're underrepresented we're economic economically challenged neighborhoods we're in 20743 that zip code is almost a death sentence for us. It's like you're in 20743. <laughs> let's put it there. You know, let's do, you know, let's do what we want. So now the county does not have to notify me of what's going on in my neighborhood. You know, I don't know who thought that was a good idea. I don't know what process you go through that you don't include the people that you're impacting right there in their front door can't understand that and I don't see how this got that far to do that. You know, you purposely excluded tax paying citizens from a process set up to facilitate a greater good and to force trust between government and community. You know, this process, whatever this went through, it, it, it doesn't even seem legal. It just, it's just not right. I don't know what you're trying to hide or why did you do it purposely. I don't know, but we should look back and say, okay, let's give this neighborhood a chance. Let's give this neighborhood our say, you know, and we don't know how much, you know, what is the cost of this anyway, besides the trust of the community? That's a hefty price, especially during election time. That's a hefty price to pay. Trust, trust in your county. It's a shameful act. This was a purposeful, it's irresponsible, it was inconsiderate, and it was disrespectful toward the community. It fosters feelings of betrayal and suspicion. We don't need that now. Too much of that. It's too much of it. I propose that you reassess this, this project, reopen it, and let's get the public input from those who will be greatly impacted by this project. And while they sneak it, let's sneak a grocery store on this end of the street. Thank you. Okay. Um, this th is Cole. I heard you call I, my name. Yes, I but I'll, I, yeah, I'll come back to you. I, I just received a note okay. that, you, that, no you're, that you've signed on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, um, so, I, um, Ms. Brown, um, and. Let, let me just say this for you. Um, so we're hearing some of the concerns that are raised, um, and one of the things you mentioned is, first of all, let me just say this. No one is trying to just stick things in a certain zip code. I, I can tell you that this I've been, here 50, okay. I've been here 50 years. Okay. I've seen stuff. Okay. I've been I understand. I'm, I'm speaking now. Okay. You've spoken. Now I'm speaking. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, but I guarantee you that this county, everyone in this county, cares about the 900,000 plus residents of this county. This county executive cares, the, this planning board cares, the council, we all care, we all live here, we must live here. But there, and there's no concerted effort to stick things there. I think what happened in this particular case, the facility is already there with 36 beds. They're trying to get an increase of, of 20 additional beds to, um, 
to to increase um, the services that, that can be provided. Now, you are being heard, and as I said before, and I think your concerns are, are, are good to raise. And one of the things you raised was um, the increase in potential increase in vehicles, but you did mention something that perhaps the county can look into, one of which is the dim you said the roads are dimly lit and and and, and, and okay and so what we do have the county they're listening that is something they can explore in that area um with um the um dpi and dpw and t they can look at the, the those things because if there's a safety issue you know we can the county can possibly do something about the lighting there um, for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. So that is why it's good that you all signed up to speak so that we can hear your concerns and so that the county can hear your concerns as well. So um, thank. I just want to take that opportunity to say thank you very much. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Ms. Ford, is it Nicole Ford? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's your opportunity to speak. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nicole Ford and I did not receive any written notice of this project. Um, the concerns I kind of have for you all is just, it, even less than me living here, it doesn't seem like you considered the people you're supposed, you're supposed to serve in this building. So if you're supposed to serve the homeless people um, and anybody that's disenfranchised, whether they be out of a job or whatever, whatever has happened if they're, you know, um, have spent some time in jail or whatever, and they're coming out looking for new opportunities um, to grow and, and to rehab, you don't have like the things they need to do so. So there's there aren't any good food options close. There's no grocery store they could even walk to. I'm assuming that these people aren't going to have cars, so there's like nothing that they would be able to access. Um, currently, they're in a place where the sidewalks don't go all the way to the metro. Like there are big missing pieces of the sidewalk. Some parts you have to walk into the street. Even for us that want to walk to the metro, which is close, um, we can't do that. Um, also, um, you haven't addressed some of the issues with the safety. We talked about the lighting just now, but we haven't talked about the fact that um, I have, I'm a person who runs and walks in the neighborhood. And when I'm running and walking, I'm getting catcalled and followed, and that's uncomfortable for us. Um, it and you're saying like the thing I keep hearing you say over and over is it's just like 20 new beds, but it's not just the 20 new beds because during the day you could potentially have 300 people that are coming in and out of the building, which is like, in my opinion, more than the people that are going to be home in the day in our neighborhood. So there's not like anybody watching our neighborhood or nobody watching the facility and you say there are people there that are doing so but they aren't currently doing so so I'm not sure you know how that's going to be any different than now because they're not watching them now and I'm not saying they have to be watched 24 7 but there has to be some type of security so that everyone feels safe there's a church nearby there there's there's a school across the street you have an address that there could be sex offenders here that would be, you would kind of be putting um something that would be so such a temptation to some of them who may have that type of issue and it's right across the street that wouldn't be helpful to them so these are just some of the concerns that i'm having um this plan i keep hearing is i think 12 years old you said you started this in 2008 and there's just nothing that anyone would have started in 2008 that you would think would still be on track in 2020 because everything has changed the neighborhood has changed um for them all the things that would be in their purview change so it, it seems like you would think about how the world has shifted and then make decisions that are for now and not something that was 12 years old those are my concerns um lastly before i end um i think this process has been seriously all flawed and i asked that you guys start the project over from step one to get everybody's input the public and i would also ask that um County Executive Angela also broke use her authority to help us. We really need her to weigh in on this. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Ford. We, we appreciate your comments as well. Um, okay. Huge, huge list. 
Um, so, Robin Hamilton. Um, I can't Sean, dumb it down if you need me to. Sorry. <laughs> excuse me, Sean Ferguson. I I heard you say Robin Hamilton. Are you still? Um, no, I said that because, but I realize I'm um, I'm coming back to you, Sean Ferguson. I I think I was talking to myself at that time. It happens. You caught me, Sean Ferguson. Um, Ms. Hamilton, I'm going to call you in the order in which Mr. Nelson submitted. So that's why I did that. I'm, trying okay, to, no I'm operating from two different lists. So, and it's a lot of people, so I'm trying to stay organized here. Um, okay, so Michelle Esterlin. Oh no, I'm sorry. That's Hello? she's on the list. She's on his list too. And Jade Sims. Okay. Jade Sims. Jade Sims. Hi, uh, this is uh this is Jade's husband. I think she's on a call up there. So Okay. Um Vincent I'm separately on the no, list though. Okay. So you're you're also on the list? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm looking for you on the list. Smith. My, my name is Pre my name is Preston Smith, ma'am. Oh, I see. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, well, that helps. Let me just double check because you had I can't call on anyone who's not signed up didn't sign up in advance. Oh yes, you are there. Okay, Preston Smith, you're on. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I'll be brief. Um, again, just thank you for the opportunity. I guess I should turn my camera on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak uh, regarding the expansion of the men's shelter. Um, I, as indicated, oppose this expansion. Uh, briefly, I just want to echo everybody else's sentiments. There's no notice uh, given whatsoever. Uh, that word notice does have a meaning, and I, I I don't appreciate uh, during the meetings we or the meeting we had with the county uh, any suggestions that we didn't get notice. If there's hundreds and dozens of people telling you that they did not get notice, they didn't get notice or notice within the meaning of the word. Um, I don't think that's something that should just be brushed over. Um, just to echo another sentiment about what happened in 2008, it, 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 it boggles the mind that if there was an assessment made somewhere 12 years ago, there wouldn't be a new assessment done within those 12 years to see whether the thing decided on 12 years ago, probably during the George W. Bush administration, is still the right fit uh, currently in 2020. Um, I, I, there's, there's just been no good faith evaluation of this whatsoever, no community involvement. And I'm, I'm truly, I'm, I'm very disappointed more than anything else that that's how the county has think, uh, deemed it fit to proceed. Um, and I, just again, I, it's, it's, a, it's a big sleight of hand to focus on the number of beds. I, I just want to expand upon that. Saying that there's only going to be 20 more people there at night where there will likely be hundreds more there during the day. And then if there's only a right turn access to the facility off of Addison Road, that means that all those hundreds of cars are going to have to make their cars or whatever other vehicles that individuals are transported to the shelter on are going to have to make their way through our neighborhood. So that sleight of hand by the county trying to say it's not that big of a deal um, is not flying with me and doesn't fly with others. Um, with that, I'll rest and I thank you for the time to speak. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. I greatly appreciate your comments. Um, okay. And you two have mentioned the right turn access, um, so that's something that they can look into as well. Um, How about Muriel Cooper? Yes, I'm here. Can you do you care to speak? Yes, I do. Okay, you're on. Hello, um, I'm Muriel Cooper. I'm with the Rotary Ridge community, and I vehemently oppose the um, building a bigger um, facility 
Also, as others have stated, I did not receive any notification in reference uh, to this facility. Um, my question generally was more of an ending kind of question that I wanted to ask after basically everybody else had spoken. So maybe you can address it afterwards, but I will ask the question now. I mean, considering all of the opposition which has um, emerged because of this facility being built, are there any plans or in the process to halt this and begin again by providing flawless notification for, uh, to the residents of our community? I cannot answer that question. Um, but I, I doubt that there's, I, d I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think the county already owns the site, so I think that's probably why they're looking at that site. Um, but in terms of having more community engagement, you know, perhaps the county is considering that. I don't know the answer to that. But I don't know that it would, I don't know that they would go all the way back and start from scratch. I can't answer that. Um, Okay, well, thank you for your, your time. Um, thank you for it. Thank you as well. Um, Arian Cannon? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you're on. I'm trying to activate my camera. Thank you. Okay. All right, good afternoon. Um, my name is Arian Cannon, and I want to thank the planning committee for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, as the, the speakers before me, uh, excuse I me, Excuse me one second. Did you, I know you said you were turning on your camera, but we don't see you. I don't know if you did that or not. Um, can you see me now? N no. Uh, I know the interpreter can hear you. She can hear you, so if you can't, it's okay. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's That's going fine. on. That's fine, that's um, fine. Like the speaker before me, I too did not receive any notice uh, regarding this structure, and I've been here uh, for over six years, going on seven years, and I, I think any indication that there was notice is disingenuous. Um, even if they're relying on the December 1st meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago, I mean, that's still insufficient notice uh, regarding this structure. And, and here we are today. Um, it's, I believe that the priorities of the county are misplaced um, with this structure, uh, just given the economic impact that it's going to have on the surrounding areas. Um, it, I want to make clear that we're not opposing anything that benefits the homeless population. In fact, I believe many members of the community have made contributions to this very facility. But our issue is the expansion of this without the input of the community and the impact that it's going to have. And I think any time that you have two things working together, uh, whether that's the neighborhood or this facility that's being proposed, that it would benefit both entities and listening to one another um, so that it works for everybody. Um, the entrance is a problem. The current interest is a problem. And I believe that problem will be exacerbated uh, with the expansion of the facility. And I think that needs to be reconsidered. I think the more appropriate location for an entrance would be on Addison Road for those people to come in and out in the, the neighborhood and make sure that is distinguished between the neighborhood and this facility that's being built, not just for those who will be residing there, but for the other services that have been um, indicated that will be used in the facility as well. Um, I think one of the, the county's sticking points seems to be that, or, or main strong point seems to be that, well, we were here first, which we, we don't contend that. I mean, that's not disputed. Yes, they were here. It's, the current structure has been there since 1987. But as I mentioned, the expansion of that facility is what's causing concern between individuals of the community. And 
the, the expansion of it and considering the economic develop or impact that this would have. As many people said, I think it's well known that this area is a food desert, um, and I think that's just something that needs to be considered as well. Uh, I think an uh, individual early in this meeting mentioned that there's added security, uh, but I, I think it's also disingenuous for them to say there's added security when the current security problems have not been addressed as well. Um, and regarding, again, regarding notice, not only was there not a flyer or any posting made uh, regarding the expansion of this facility, but even the current signage for the structure is quite obscured. Um, you have to be intentionally looking for that sign, which indicates what the structure is. And even the current sign is quite faded. And I believe it's important for people who are in the community, who drive by here every day, who walk in the neighborhood every day to have their input um, in being heard regarding um, any expansion. Um, and again, I just want to express my opposition. Thank the planning board for listening to members of the community. And we think that um, a resolution can be met and we think that it will be beneficial for both parties or all parties involved. Thank you. Thank you. Um Okay. Um, okay. Dahlia um, Shaywitz? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. We're on. Okay. I'll try not to repeat what others have said. In fact, Nicole Ford, I'd, I'd like to first of all second everything um, that she said. Um, I'm in full agreement. Um, I just want to thank the planning board for allowing all of us this opportunity to speak. You keep saying you're hearing us, and I believe that you're, you are hearing us, and I, I appreciate that. It's a very different tenor than the call we had on December 1st. Um, hold on, hold on to, one second. Hold on one second. Uh, hold on one second, Ms. Shaywitz. I just want you to know, as you can see, we I'm taking notes on every single speaker, and I'm sure everyone is. So we, you are definitely being heard. Okay. Okay. So. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I actually did not state. Um, we had the option to state whether we're for, against, or other. Yes. I chose other. Okay. Um, and the reason I chose other is because I'm not against having homeless shelter. What. I, I am asking is for three specific things to guarantee the safety and security of our neighbors, uh, to consider a redesign, including a reorientation, which Nicole mentioned would uh, include uh, putting the entryway elsewhere, not inside our communities, and making sure that you gather community input, not just through this forum, but actually into the design. A few things I want to add. Um, I, I have witnessed uh, women being harassed in the neighborhood. I have uh, experienced finding an ID card of a shelter resident in on my street. I am a quarter mile in the opposite direction of the metro. I live on a cul-de-sac. Uh, there's no reason for this gentleman to be on our street. Uh, I found his health ID card, tried to find him, and, and, and uh, in searching for him, I found that he had been incarcerated previously uh, for raping his neighbor. So this was very disturbing uh, to me. Uh, my husband heard a, an earful from me about that. I live next door to, to a family with two young girls and, and it's very concerning to me. I, I heard on December 1st that the uh, that county planners are interested in the safety and security of their residents. They should be. I also want them to be concerned about the safety and security of, of the folks in this neighborhood. Uh, in fact, when I moved here, there was a children's school bus stop directly in front of the shelter and uh, this uh, when the parents found out that it was a homeless shelter they immediately called the school to change those plans but there's this disconnect between what's going on around the shelter and 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 what's happening inside the shelter um i, I want to make this point we have such an amazing neighborhood. I moved here five years ago, and I don't just have neighbors, I have friends. Um, and we're so lucky to have each other. I appreciate living here. I encourage you to look at our neighborhoods um, that are part of Addison when united. Um, 
Brighton Place, Park at Addison. I walk through Rolling Ridge and Wilburn almost every day. I, I'm so impressed with the level of community and sense of community participation. And it's really important for the county to figure out how to incentivize communities like ours. Uh, what we need is not uh, uh, additional beds for a homeless shelter. What we need are um, greater access to grocery stores, sit-down restaurants, small business opportunity, not liquor stores, not dollar stores. And if the homeless shelter stays, then what, what can the county do to make sure that we're taking care of all the residents, um, not just the shelter residents? So thank you for your time today. Okay. Um, thank you, Mrs. Shay, Ms. Shaywitz. Um, you know, I've taken notes of, of the concerns and one of the things that I, one of the things that I um, have heard from a couple of people thus far, and it um, is not just concerns, but the opportunities for other things like um, restaurants, um, like you know, th things of better grocery stores and things like that. And, and believe me, the, this is something that the county has embarked on to try to eradicate these food deserts and improve the situation throughout Prince George's County, not just where you live. And um, uh, part of the problem that you know that's a problem that is not solely within our control. We have to lure. Um, developers here and grocery store chains here. It has taken a long time to get some of the bigger ones here and we have them in a couple of places throughout the county but only a couple. But but the county continues to try um, um, offering incentives and things of that nature to try to get um, some of these stores here. But uh, it's on our list and I know they're listening. It's on our list to see if, what we can do about the food deserts there as well. So I, I just want to touch upon that. We talked about the other things. Um, you know, the, the entryway and the, the dim streets and the current security issues and the future security issues and the right turn access and, um, <laughs> you know, so, so many of these other things. But um, that's another thing that we can look at and, and I know that they're trying to address as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Okay, did I get William Lane? Okay, and and what, what about Jade Sims? Is she back? Mr. Smith? Okay, then I'm going to keep going down the list and then um, I, I'm, I've tried to do it to the extent that I could in, some, in the order in which some of the people have signed up. Um, but it's getting a little bit confusing here. Um, okay. Um, okay, so Ms. Um, Melina Denard. Melina Denard. Hello. Okay. No, so, okay. so but one, one thing on the point and there. Okay. So, other folks need to be muted, but Ms. Denard, is that you? Yes, this is me. Um, hi, I'm Melina Denard, and um, I'm a resident of the Park for Addison Metro, and I am opposed to the expansion of the uh, current um, men's shelter, and this is based on a lot of reasons um, already stated by my fellow neighbors and community members, so I won't um, belabor the point. But I feel like the process needs to be started, restarted with community input, and we would really like support from uh, Executive Oslo Brooks to help us push um, our interest into the into the decision making process for this uh, expansion. So that's all. Okay. Thank you so very much. And. Um, so let me just make sure I'm, I'm, I'm um, some of you are um, echoing the sentiments of previous speakers, which we're noting too, and then you may be adding your own additional concerns, so I appreciate that as well. So we're noting all of the above, just so you know, okay? Um, okay, 
um, um, Tiaka, Mallory. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tiaka Mallory. Um, and as everyone prior to me has stated, I did not receive notice um, of this project. I am a homeowner less than half a mile from um, the current shelter structure. And I find it disheartening that the county that I chose to purchase my home in um, and reside and whom I've been a loyal resident to does not provide its residents that same loyalty. Um, and it's just from being able to voice our opinion and um, give feedback into any projects that are going on in the county. Because at this point, I kind of feel like if we're left out of this project, that we're being left out of other projects that could benefit me as a county resident. Um, another factor that concerns me with the expansion of this shelter is my safety as a woman within my own neighborhood. Um, this is because, as I stated prior, I haven't been allowed to be a part of the process. and. With not being allowed to be a process, it's denied me the opportunity to ask questions that bring concern to me, such as my safety. Like if background checks are completed on these individuals who reside in the shelter, or even the process of how they're accepting these individuals into the shelter. Um, so because of the way this process has gone, um, I'm opposed to the expansion of the shelter, and I ask that we return to the beginning of this process and allow for the public to have input and to also express concerns or um, give more ideas about how it can better suit everyone, um, taxpaying residents in this county. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Okay, Ms. Mallory. Um, okay. Um, now, it said Cortez Scott. Okay. Um, did, uh, did Ms. Boozer answer? Oh, no, she's, I'm she's here. here. Okay, I'm she's here. with you. Okay, good. She's with um, uh, Macy Nelson. Okay, so I'll be call Mr. Nelson. I'll be calling on you in, in just a few minutes. Okay, because um, you have a whole list of people, and it's very hard for me to keep track of who's who here. Um, Thank you. Okay, and um, what about Lonnie Monroe? Miss Lonnie Monroe. Okay, so you know what? I, it's hard for me to keep track of the folks. So, Mr. Nelson, I'm going to start with you then and, and the folks that you represent. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me adequately? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Macy Nelson, I'm a, a lawyer uh, in this case representing Regina Bryan, Mark Falzon, the Homeowners Association known as the Park at Addison Metro and one Addison United uh, umbrella group. Okay. Uh, the, the county staff described this facility uh, as merely adding 20 beds from 36 uh, to 56 beds. Uh, what I see is a facility that is now 5,700 square feet and the proposed facility is 25,000 square feet. This is not a minor addition. This is not a minor renovation. This is a tear down and the reconstruction of a new facility. I make that point because representatives of the county have described the process as a quote minor re a renovation and we uh, take issue uh, with that characterization. But if staff could bring up slides, uh, slide three please. I just want to show the neighborhood where my clients reside, please. Uh, Regina Bryan lives right across the street at 600 Chance Place, just right across Bernie Bank Street. 
Uh, Mark Falzone lives on Wallbridge, which is a little bit to the southwest, but in the uh, community of uh, single uh, family homes. Um, uh, the residents of uh, the members of Addison Metro HOA are in this uh, community. Now, uh, at the outset of this hearing, uh, I'm sure you mentioned uh, uh, the, the exhibit of the list of names that I submitted uh, of citizens who opposed the project. Uh, and uh, the, the chair indicated uh, that you wanted to address that point. But let me say why I submitted that. When I was first engaged in this case, I said to my clients, uh, we need to sign up as persons of record. The citizens need to sign up as a person of record because that's the tool we have uh, for the planning board for a citizen to make a record of his interest in the case. Well, there is no mechanism in a mandatory referral case to sign up as a person of record. So that's, that is the reason I submitted that list. These are the people who if permitted to sign up as a person of record would have signed up as a person of record. And I'll note that even after we submitted that list on uh, uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m. or whatever time it was, uh, we have even more people uh, have signed on the list. Uh, I haven't submitted that to you just because we're past uh, the deadline. But that's why I uh, submitted that list of uh, individuals. Um, Mr. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, I'm going to, when you finish your presentation, I'm going to um, turn to one other speaker before you go down your list. And, the re and I'm turning to the speaker, w w I was remiss, but it's the speaker who requested um, the interpreter. Um, and, and, well, we can just have a logical break in place. Okay, okay. So let's do that. Yeah, I, mean, that's, it's, well, I have no objection if you do that as a matter of convenience. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, Tamer as a Mahood. Hello. Uh, good Hi, afternoon. Everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Tamir, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I live at 603 Waller Avenue, right across from the shelter, and I am in opposition um, to the expansion on the men's shelter, and I'm going to share my reasoning with you right now. Um, what surprised me the most was the zone that the homeless shelter is in. You recently saw the zoning map and it's in this, the middle of a residential area. And there are houses right there. So it's strange that it's in that zone. Secondly, when we all bought our homes, I bought Ryan's home and it wasn't explained to me much. And I feel like the county, um, didn't address that clearly. Ryan's home had to ask permission to buy that property from Prince George's County. That was right near my home, but I didn't know anything about it. And PG County went ahead and approved that purchase without me knowing. Um, even though it was next to a residential area, I feel that the residents of the surrounding community were not informed that they were going to be building this. And um, I bought my home in 2014, and this has been going on since 2008, yet there was no communication with me when I bought my house in 2014. And um, the, nobody in the previous community informed me of this. So I, I'm lacking communication in that particular area and then they set zoning up and then they went and built a community in that zoning that seemed to contradict what was on the planning map and again with this project it contradicts it um ruled street um it's a very com um busy and there's our an intersection of Aiden Street where people walk and there could be more advertising or put it on the PG County internet there could have been more notice in that 
And then this is really a huge pro project. There's so much going on involved, and the local people didn't even find out what was going on. And it's hard to find information about what's going into the project. And there's nothing on the internet for PG County at all about this project. So there are several factors in question here. And like the chairperson mentioned, that people are always trying to, we're always trying to recruit developers for the community to have different kind of venues and apartments. But there's a corner right across from the metro at Addison, and I forget the name of that cross street right there, um, Central Ave. And there's um, not a lot of free land there. So when I moved here in 2014, um, they were hoping to build condo, perhaps, and then the developer dropped that project. And then there was a plan for a Safeway across the street, but um, that Safeway shut down since. So I'm curious about what's happening. And then with the expansion of the men's shelter there, it means um, the perspective to recruit new developers, maybe they won't want to be there because there's this men's shelter right in the middle of a community development. So it doesn't make sense to future developers and maybe they'll be concerned about investing in the property. And they're, PG County is saying they are there first, but um, now with the expansion, there's going to be a lot more interaction between um, commercial and residential land zoning. And the area is not a city itself, you know, and it be, but yet it's being treated as one, having a business next to a neighbor, next to a, a facility. So I feel like it, the zones should be separated out a little more clearly to allow people to live in a residential area. And so those are my concerns that I wanted to share with you in my opposition to the project today. Um, I will take this opportunity to say thank you to Mr. Mah is it Mahood. And um, we're deeply appreciative of your comments. We are taking copious notes again. Um, and um, we see, hear, and appreciate the frustration that everyone has um, expressed thus far. Um, but we are endeavoring to do, to see what it is that we can do to either uh, make this um, more palatable for the community or to at least address some of the concerns um, as best we can. As I said in the beginning, our comments are advisory but we do have a role to play here, and that is why we're listening intently, um, as is the county, um, so that um, some of your so that your concerns will be heard and addressed to the extent possible. So we thank you for that. Okay, so I'm now going to go back to Mr. Nelson, and, and Mr. Nelson, thank you for that. Thank you. Can the, can the chair hear me adequately? Yes. I think we can Thank all you. hear you. Thank you. Uh, I wish to address some legal issues which I think uh, inform the planning boards or should inform the planning board, board's analysis of this case. The uh, chair has described this process of the mandatory referral as a issue of state law. The chair has conveyed the theme that the way the law is set up, the county, because this is the county building, can essentially do what it wants, and the planning board is limited to providing input. And the, uh, the planning board's comments are merely advisory, and that the county can do whatever it wishes to do after receiving whatever input the planning board uh, offers. I respectfully disagree uh, with that assessment of the law. And, and not exactly uh, my I, words, I, not exactly a direct quote either, but that's okay. That's your interpretation of what I said, but that's okay. Go ahead. And my view of the law is informed by the planning department's uniform standards for a mandatory referral review. And of course, the planning board has that document, access to the document. Your council has access to it. And I'd like to direct you to page 11 of it. And it says this, 
the Prince George's County Zoning Ordinance, Division 11, Sections 27-292 through 295, addresses the approval of public buildings and uses and buildings and uses on county-owned land. According to the Zoning Ordinance, the District Council shall approve all public buildings, structures, and uses except those of municipal, state, or federal agencies. Section 27-294B recognizes the mandatory referral process. So the Planning Board itself has adopted uniform standards which summarize uh, uh, se uh, uh, and refer to Sections 27-293 through 295. So if we go to those sections, we see in Section 27-292, uh, all public buildings, structures, and uses, uh, except those of municipal, state, or federal, shall be specifically approved by the District Council. That section doesn't say that the county can do what it wishes to do after it receives the recommendations uh, from uh, the Planning Board. 27-292 uh, says all public buildings, structures, and uses, except as provided in Section 27-122, shall conform the requirements of the zoning ordinance applicable to the building, structure, or use in the zone in which it's located. That means this, this facility must conform with the requirements of the zoning ordinance. That means planning staff was obligated to analyze in a staff report whether it does. Uh, section 27294 uh, talks about the mandatory referral to the uh, uh, planning board, which we've talked about. 27295 uh, talks about the district council's criteria for approval. So these are really the required findings. So and approving Mr. Macy, request. Mr. Macy, are you saying this should goes this goes to the district council? I am saying that. Okay. I'm just reading the ordinance. Okay, I just I just want to make sure I'm following you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, tw I'm now at twenty. I started at twenty-seven two ninety-two. Yep. And then two ninety-four. The and two ninety-five. Shall approve buildings. Two ninety-four is the the referral process to the planning board which speaks of the advisory role of the planning board. And then 27.295 talks about the criteria that the district council must apply. This is 27.295B, criteria for approval. In approving a request, other than one for the erection of off-site signs, the council shall consider, A, I'm paraphrasing, master plan compliance b i'm paraphrasing the impact on the project on the neighborhood c uh i'm paraphrasing the availability of other more appropriate sites and d the relative need for the facility so these are the criteria that this council is required to consider when approving uh uh this building and i respectfully suggest that since you are, are reviewing the case in an advisory um role, the planning board must also uh, consider uh, those issues. Now, the uh, uniform standards, uh, of course, this is a document I didn't write. The planning board wrote this uh, and adopted it. And it talks about what staff should do and what the applicant should do in a situation like this. I'm at page eight of the uniform standards. Must provide a statement of community outreach indicating what the applicant has done to inform the public including the neighboring property owners about the proposed project include the dates of meetings or events at which the applicant shared information and what if any feedback was received positive or negative that's in the uniform standards the uniform standards also uh, at pages 10 and 11 describe the types of review you know, and the first is the administrative review. And uh, administrative review, that's what happened in the summer of 2019 when planning staff in-house performed administrative review and made a recommendation. Uh, the other type of review is a full planning board review, which we're doing uh, now. And I also note that in the planning board's uniform standards, they say that some projects may need to be reviewed 
at more than one stage, depending on the nature and type of development proposed. For example, a property may be initially reviewed by the planning board uh, regarding site selection, and then later the, uh, the design of the building and so on. Now, if we go to pages 14 and 15 of the planning board's uh, uniform standards, it talks about the planning board's review criteria. On page 14 of the uniform standards, planning board consideration full review. The planning board will consider all relevant land use and planning aspects of the proposal, including, but not limited to the following. And give me a pair of these. Consistency with the master plan. This body is obligated to find consistency with the master plan. I respect this gift. This planning body is obligated to make a finding that the proposal is consistent with the purposes of the zone. That's on page 14. This body is obligated to find that this proposal is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. That's at page 14. So uh, I, I cite these provisions to convey this theme. This case must go at this, this body, the planning board, is going to make a recommendation. We know from the uniform standards and from the zoning ordinance the criteria that the planning board must consider, and we respectfully suggest that those recommendations then go to the district council for the final decision uh, in accordance with uh, the applicable law. Now, I, I recognize that um, uh, technical staff it might be different. My view is technical staff did not review the law, did not review the uniform standards uh, before making a judgment that the planning, that the district council has no role uh, in this case. So then, then, then uh, so that's the framework of the law. Then I ask myself, well, uh, what happened? Well, we knew that in the summer of 2019, there was an administrative uh, review, and the recommendations in that administrative review are the same recommendations that Mr. Ray presented uh, today, and there are comments associated with that June, July 2019 staff report, and the Community Planning Division's report dated June 18, 2019 states, this application does not conform with the land use recommendations for the 2010 approved subregion 4 master plan. It goes on to state, the 2010 approved subregion four master plan recommends a mix of land uses on the subject property. What does that say? Now that's a required finding for uh, this body to find that the proposed project conforms to the subregion master plan. We have an express finding here by the community planning division uh, that it doesn't. Nevertheless, staff recommended approval administratively. Uh, seven days later, uh, two weeks later in 2019. We, we're trying to understand how in the world did this happen? How in the world can there be a proposal uh, to expand a facility from uh, 5,700 square feet to 25,000 square feet with no, effectively, no notice uh, to the community? Well, they, they said uh, the staff said, well, we're going to treat this as an administrative review. Well, if we go to page 11 of the uniform standards, these are the words of the planning department as to what constitutes a, uh, uh, a, a site, a project that's eligible for administrative review. This type of review will normally be conducted for small additions, alterations, or renovations to existing facilities that do not create any significant impact on the surrounding community. Examples of projects that may qualify for administrative review are minor modifications conducted as part of routine maintenance, placement of a small equipment uh, shed on a site, interior improvements that do not alter in, in, or increase the program, programming capacity of the facility. There is no way in the world that staff should have reviewed this project administratively. 
And then we said, well, why, why was there not notice, even with an administrative review, why was there not notice uh, to the community? Mm -hmm. So we know in the planning staff's file, we have the narrative. And this is in your record. And this narrative was prepared by the county and addressing what they're supposed to do. And uh, paragraph 27, this is where they're supposed to describe the statement of community outreach. These are their words in bold type. No outreach. This is an existing shelter. No outreach. This is an existing shelter. I respect, uh, I, 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 I say respectfully, there's no way this was a minor modification. There's no way staff should have treated it as such. And it should have had a uh, full review back then, and that's why we need one now. So then we, we, we investigated, how did this happen? How was this case put on a fast track for this uh, minor review without notice to the computer, uh, community? And my client, uh, Mr. Falzone, did a public information act request, and the county produced to him an email from Crystal Hancock to Deborah Borden that says this. Of course, these are employees of the uh, planning department. We have been coordinating with this applicant since April 11th. They didn't provide us the information that was requested, so the project sat. Now this project is political and an emergency. In print, she writes, their words, not mine. And they prefer not to wait until September for a full planning board meeting. We have consented to, con we have consented to conduct this review as administrative, but we would like to conduct the mail into the community that abuts this shelter to inform them about this project, and so on. All right, so this was put on a fast track in the minor administrative review for political reasons, as described by the email of Crystal Hancock to Deborah Borden. Now, we know on July 9, 2019, a notice went out to some, a few number of adjacent property owners, including my client, Regina Bryan. And this notice said, when you gave a name for more information, Abdul Sadu, that's S-A-A-D-U, project manager, manager, telephone 301-817-4381, and it provided uh, an email. He's a county employee. Uh, Regina Bryan received this letter. She's across the street. She called, no response. Regina Bryan is a member of the Homeowners Association. He gave a copy uh, to the president of the Homeowners Association, Mark Falzone, who wrote an email to the address on the letter, Mr. Abdul Sadu, and we can provide the email, it should be in your file, and it says this. This is an email dated August 11, 2019. Mr. Abdul Sadu, we are the board of the park at Addison Metro Homeless Association and are adjacent to 603 South Addison Road. Please send us a copy of any reports, including any draft reports on the project. We'd like to provide input to this process. Thank you. Mark Falzone, President, Park at Addison Metro Homeless Association. That was an email dated August 11, 2019 saying, we want to provide input. No response. Nothing. No response. My clients assumed this project was not going forward. There were inquiries for information directed to the county. No one from the county uh, responded. And then in September 2020, Ms. Bryan will tell you, she lives right across the street. She saw activity at the site. She went over there, spoke to a, a worker on the site, said, what's going on? Uh, and the worker said, in fact, we're going to start work in two weeks. Well, uh, Mr. That came Mr. Nelson, when was that? Tell me again the date of that. How recently? Uh, uh, Approximately. Ms. Brown will give you the exact date. Approximately. Uh, my notes date that was September 2020. Okay, thank you. 
Now, my people care about their, my clients care about their community. Uh, 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 Regina Bryan reported this to the uh, president, Mr. Falzone. Uh, he uh, 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 reached out to the county executive for help. Uh, and then on October 28th, uh, Tara Jackson wrote Mr. Falzone uh, and and said uh, that you know it would work to have a uh, community input meeting and a full planning board here. Well, the uh, meeting input the community impact meeting uh, was scheduled for December one, two thousand and ten. My clients asked for some time to evaluate to prepare for the planning board hearing. That was that request was uh, not responded to either. But my folks went to this community meeting on December 1, 2010, and I would urge, there's a video of this meeting, I would urge every member of this planning board to watch that video. It was a sham. It was no community input meeting. It was a declaration that this deal was, quote, a done deal. Okay, stop, stop, Mr. Nelson. Are you saying that that was, that was a quote, in the meeting from the county? Was Done that? deal, yes. Okay. All right, and number two, my second question of you is that you said on August the 11th, 2019, um, uh, Mr. Falzone emailed um, Abdul um, and, and there was no response from August the 19th until October the 28th from Ms. Jackson, of 20, uh, October 28th of 2020? Well, I would say his email was October 11, 2019. Right. Oh, October? I thought you said August. No, 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 no. I misspoke. Forgive me, please. Let me start again. His email was August 11, 2019. Okay. August 11. Got it. No response. Un Nothing happened until Regina Bryan went across the street it's in off. September of 2020, and she'll give you the precise okay. date, where she saw activity, asked a workman on the site what's going on, he said, in effect, uh, the work's going to construction will start in two weeks. Then uh, she and Mr. Falzone, the president, uh, 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 left into high gear and started trying to find out what was going on. Mr. Falzone reached out to the county executive, uh, and then we got this meeting on December one, which I will reiterate was a sham. And I'm speaking as an advocate, but I urge you to watch the video. The quote was made, it was a quote, done deal. There was no input, nothing. So that's what happened. On behalf of my clients, uh, I urge this body to recommend disapproval and instruct the county to start again at the very beginning. We want and are entitled to proper notice. My clients are entitled to participate in the process. When we say start at the very beginning, we say do what the uniform standard says, start at the beginning, which is site selection. And then have a discussion about whether this proposal can satisfy the criteria that govern the planning board's uh, review. Have a discussion as to whether it's consistent with the sector plan. We know it's not. Staff has already said it doesn't. Have a discussion as to whether it's consistent with the purposes of the zone. I haven't touched on this, but it's not. Uh, and have a discussion as to whether this proposed use is compatible with the a residential neighborhood. Now, if the planning board doesn't wish to uh, dispose of this case on, on those reasons and wishes to address the merits of the case, I urge you on behalf of my clients to disapprove, recommend disapproval. First, we know that the applicant must prove compliance with the Subregion 4 Master Plan. Uh, the Community Plan Division has already told us unequivocally this application does not. The, 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 product, the uh, second plan calls for uh, mixed use. This is not mixed use. Staff has said unequivocally this project conflicts with the Subregion 4 Plan. That's a reason by itself to disapprove it. Now, Ruth Grover, our land planner, will discuss, discuss that issue from a land planning uh, issue, a perspective. Another criteria is that the 
planning board must find that this proposal is consistent with the purposes of the R55 zone. Well, let me read those to you. The purposes of the R55 zone, this is 27-430, 27-430. The purposes of the R55 zone are to provide for and encourage variation in the size, shape, and width of one family detached residential subdivision lots in order to better utilize the natural terrain. B, to facilitate the planning of higher density, one family residential developments with small lots and dwellings of various sizes and styles. C, to encourage the preservation of trees and open spaces. D, prevent soil erosion, erosion and stream valley uh, uh, flooding. There is nothing in the purposes that contemplates a facility such as the one uh, that's being proposed. Then, uh, what's so interesting about the criteria for uh, the mandatory referral is it, it, it invokes this notion of compatibility with the neighborhood, which we all know is something we look at in special, special exception cases. We don't usually look at that directly uh, in a subdivision case, for example, but here we do. The applicant must, this body must find that this project is compatible with the uh, uh, residential neighborhood. You've heard testimony from the citizens. I assert it's self-evident that this proposal is incompatible with the res residential neighborhood. The citizens and our land planner will address that compatibility uh, issue further. So for all of those reasons, I respectfully request that this board uh, instruct the, the county to start all over again, start at the process, do a fair analysis of the site selection, do a fair analysis of the applicable law, engage the community, have a meaningful uh, community input meeting, uh, and do it responsibly in accordance with the law. We urge that if you want to reach the merits of the case, we recommend that you I urge you to recommend disapproval for uh, conflicts with the master plan, conflicts with the purposes of the R55 zone, and uh, for incompatibility uh, for the uh, residential uh, neighborhood. Now, uh, that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions, but okay. if there are no questions, next okay, up is hold Luke up, hold up. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Nelson, because I was going to, I was looking to take the 10 minute Mother Nature break at about uh, 3.30, so it's 3.27 um, it looks like, or thereabouts. So um, we're going to, we may have to do this periodically, so I'm going to stop <laughs> now and take, and it's probably good for everybody actually, so to take that and we'll resume at um, 3.40. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, if we can put that on the screen for everyone to see. Three. Okay. We have everyone. Okay. Good. All right. We have the entire board. Um. Okay. So, Mr. Nelson, um, you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, yes, so we, yes, Madam Chief. Okay, so we have the entire planning board back, all five members. Um, we have Mr. Nelson back, who was representing a number of the opponents, not all of them. We have our sign interpreter. We have Ms. Grover. Um, Mr. Nelson had finished his presentation. Um, we were going, you know, he has some witnesses to put on. Um, I know we have... Um, we have someone who can address the notice on our, on our side, and we have, um, um, and our legal counsel can address some things as well. I would just like to say at this point, um, the, the, we find ourselves in a very tough situation. Um, it is a mandatory referral. While I may take exception to, I don't agree with everything. Um, um, that Mr. Nelson said attorneys tend to disagree. That happens sometimes, so that's my view as an attorney, and Mr. Nelson has a different view, and then we have our own legal counsel here. But I happen to agree with him on um, the one thing I thought of even earlier um, was that having looked at the rules myself and having looked at the um, uniform standards myself and having looked at the land use article, um, I do know that we could have a second hearing on this. 
And I'm inclined, I, as of now, I'm going to wait to see what everyone else has to say, but I'm thinking based on the questions that were, were raised today, the um, concerns that were raised by a number of citizens, the information provided by Mr. Nelson, that I'm inclined to go for at least a second hearing to get some of these concerns and whatnot addressed. Um, uh, and so that's just me thinking aloud, which, um, you know, I was pretty much already there um, before. But I think it's becoming, to, from my personal perspective, it's becoming um, um, more, nece you know, more and more necessary. You, we have a number of people who care about their community, understandably so. We all care about our respective communities where we, li where we live. These citizens, right or wrong, they do not feel like they were heard or ever had their opportunity to be heard. They um, did, don't feel like they had the notice, even though there are different notice requirements for a mandatory referral. Um, so at a minimum, it's not fair, from my view. So I think that uh, that's where I'm leaning. And even though we haven't gotten to the end of this yet, um, I'm going to hear what other folks have to say, but that's where I'm leaning. Um, and so that we could have more you know, participation. And those of you, I don't make motions, so I can't make the motion here. Um, but when the time comes, if in fact that's um, a motion that passes, um, those of you who want to speak now can speak now um, in the event that you don't come to a later date, if, if you're unable to participate at a later date. And I don't even know that that's going to happen, but that is just my mindset now. So, um, um, I, I heard it, I just heard enough concerns, and I think, um, whether it, whether it changes anything or not, I don't know, but I do think, I, the one thing I do know is that however this transpired, I know from my own very seasoned now experience with a number of people in this county that this is a county of people and of electeds who care. And however we got to this point where it, it where folks in the community have the appearance that they have been um, that they haven't and their viewpoints haven't been considered, that's not good. They may or may not prevail, but everyone's voice has to be heard and their and their opinions at, have to be considered and um, some weight attached to it so that is why I'm I'm leaning towards that I'm going to go ahead now um, with mr. Um, Nelson if you would like to um, I think mr. Nel well let me see if there's any questions of mr. Nelson at this point first and then mr. Nelson if you would like to call on miss Grover next that's fine but I'm going to first see if there are any questions of you Madam Vice Chair, are there any questions of Mr. Nelson? No questions at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, um, Commissioner Washington, are there any questions? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Dorner, are there any questions? No questions. Thank you, though. Okay. Commissioner. And I, I agree with your, your statement earlier. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Geraldo. I have no questions, but I share your sentiments as well as the sentiments of the residents. Okay, so we, we um, I can count. That's three. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then, um, Ms. Borden, did you have anything to add, Mr. Borden or, Ms. or Mr. Goldsmith, at this point? Uh, I would leave that up to Madam Chair. I, I did want to, this is Deborah Borden for the record, I did want to give just a short sort of mandatory referral primer okay. because I heard some things from Mr. Nelson that are just, that really need to be corrected for the record. Okay. But I can do that now or I could do that later. I will be with you through the end, so. Um, doesn't matter. Okay, well let me, let me, since we have a number of people signed up, let's let them go. So Mr. Um, Mr. Nelson, um, do you want to call Ms. Grover first? Let me call uh, Ruth Grover now. Thank you. I'll meet, meet myself and she'll jump on. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And and um, Commissioner Geraldo, you and I will will log off so that the interpreter can focus on Ms. Grover. 
Okay. Again, we still have a number of people. Again, I at, you all have been outstanding this far, honestly. And it, and it's very hard, and it's um, and it's literally hitting close to home. I understand that, but you've done a superb job in not being overly redundant, um, expressing your concerns, echoing the concerns of other uh, speakers, um, but providing your own twist, which is fine, um, because that's your right. That's your due process right but we do want to be considerate enough to allow everyone to speak. Also, if we go for one more hour, which remains to be seen, we will all have to log off and log back on because um, our time limit for this platform will come to an end and, and you have a finite time period. And if, um, if, we, hit, if we approach five o'clock, we will all have to log off and get a new number and log back in. Okay, Ms. Grover. Hi, I'm Ruth Grover. I've worked as a land planner for many years in a variety of public and private positions, including currently working as a consultant for Macy Nelson, which brings me to this hearing. I've been asked to testify as to my knowledge of process and substance as it relates to the subject application, mandatory referral MR1915A. I've reviewed the case materials and would suggest that the project does not meet the uni uniform standards for mandatory review, the requirements of the zoning ordinance, and the master plan, and therefore should be sent back to the planning department for a new review or recommended for disapproval. My argument on these various points are more particularly as follows. With respect to the Uniform Standards for Mandatory Review, Section 18, pages 14 to 15, um, it states that the Planning Board must consider, among other things, whether the proposal is consistent with the applicable Master Plan and the Zoning Ordinance, whether the nature of the proposed development is consistent with its surrounds, whether it will have negative impacts on the surrounding neighborhood, and whether alternatives have been considered. The project is not in conformance with these standards as further detailed below. Master plan conformance. In this case, the applicable master plan, the subregion four approved master plan and sectional map amendments dated June 2010 calls for mixed use on the site. In a map included on page 49 of the plan, the location of the men's shelter is shown within what is called the mixed use center. On page 100 of the plan, it calls for mixed use to be developed and specifically mentioned at the Addison Road area as mixed use. This was confirmed by the Community Planning Division of MNCPPC in a memorandum dated June 18, 2019, which is included in your backup where staff stated that the application does not conform with the land use recommendations for the master plan. It's understandable that the subject site was designated for mixed use as the burgeoning residential areas are underserved by standard retail goods and services, and mixed use development creates a synergy, creating livelier and more vital neighborhoods with obvious resulting economic benefits. In this case, the proposed use is a single use and not one that complements the other existing uses or would give rise to a more vital land use fabric. The proposed project is also inconsistent with several portions of the zoning ordinance. First, it is not consistent with the purposes of the R55 zone because it doesn't provide and encourage variation in the one family detached residential subdivision lots or facilitate the planning of higher density one family residential developments with small lots and dwellings of various sizes and styles. These are the main land use purposes of the R55 zone ex expressed in zoning ordinance section 27-430 which are aimed primarily at encouraging quality single-family detached development. The proposed project would not further and may work at counter purposes because the project may generate off-site impacts that would negatively impact the surrounding area. 
We note that the zoning ordinance does permit public buildings and uses in the R55 zone. However, an exhaustive review of the institutional permitted uses in the R55 zone reveals that the other institutional uses permitted in the zone support the existing residential community in the area. We would argue that in order for a public building or use to be permitted in the R55 zone, it must meet all other requirements, which here include conformance to all other applicable requirements of the zoning ordinance and master plan. The project does not meet these requirements. Additionally, we find that the project is inconsistent with the requirements of 27-292, which specifies that the approval of public buildings and uses on public land requires district council approval, and the subject project, when reviewed and approved in 2019 and under review at the current time, is not slated for any such review. Further, the project does not and will not <clears throat> at time of district council review meet the required findings of 27-295B criteria for approval. These include, among other things, the relationship of the project to the general plan, master plan, functional master plan, or other plan or policy document approved by the council, the impact of the project on the area affected and the availability of other more appropriate sites in the regional district. Additionally, the proposed project, a great increase in scale over the current, built this temporary men's shelter, increases the numbers of beds in the facility from 36 to 56, while increasing the size of this facility from 5,700 square feet to 25 out from 5,700 square feet to 25,000 square feet. A site visit revealed unkempt grounds, which create an eyesore, and various residents and visitors sitting outside or traveling to or from the shelter. Operationally, it is unclear how many additional people may visit the site per day to utilize the other services to be offered at the shelter which will include computer training and job placement. The added traffic and people to the area may have unanticipated negative offsite impacts on the surrounding area because the submission materials are unclear or vague in these respects. Lastly, we also question the limited scope of and the amount of care spent on the review, whereas most cases are referred up to approximately 10 different sections of park and planning and up to approximately seven outside agencies for review. It appears that this mandatory re referral was sent only to community planning, environmental planning, urban design, special projects, and transportation planning. At least those are the only referral comments included in your backup. Additionally, the staff report for the project produced for the case was markedly more abbreviated than the exhaustive staff reports normally produced by the development review section for various other types of planned projects where staff reports sometimes exceed 50 pages in length. Ms. Single Ms. Ms. Grover, are those typically... I would question Ms. why Ms. this Grover, abbreviated review... Ms. Grover, are those typically... Yes. Are those 50-page... Staff reports that I've seen are they typically for mandatory referrals? Um, Ms. Grover, I don't I don't recall how long a typical mandatory referral staff report is, okay. but I do know that the others that are completed for site plan applications can exceed to yeah. these pages in the line. Yeah. In line, that's true. Where we make a decision, that's true. But here's but here's the question. You know, why is an abbreviated review done when the same sort of analysis is required, including analysis of conformance with important guiding documents such as the zoning ordinance and the applicable master plan? For the foregoing reasons I suggest the planning board continue the application and require the applicant to go back to the entire planning board full consideration mandatory referral process, completing it properly this time and following it up by review and approval by the district council. 
In the alternative, should the planning board decide to act on the project today, we would suggest that the planning board recommend disapproval of the project to the district council. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Grover. So um, you reiterated uh, uh, much of what Mr. Nelson had to say, so we appreciate that. Um, okay, Mr. Nelson, who do you have? Um, Mr. Nelson. Uh oh, did I lose him? No, I'm here. Thank you. I just I can't see you, but um, okay. So, uh, Ms. Grover, um, okay. So we need Ms. Grover. You can sign off now, mm -hmm. okay? Because I don't want the, our interpreter to have too many people to look at at this. So I don't want it to get too confusing. So, um, Mr. Nelson, I think you know you you mentioned um, one of the things you mentioned. You had alternatives um, was were, were another hearing, um, and um, I, I mentioned earlier I agree with you. Um, I don't know what the board's going to do, um, but if in fact we lean that way, do you are you, there are people you want to continue to speak now? Or would you want them to speak at a subsequent date? If, uh, if in fact, we go that way. Right. So let's assume hypothetically there's a, a, a motion that passes uh, to have a second hearing. Uh, 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 my view is that that hearing would include every aspect of the process, including uh, site selection. Uh, and in that event, I would even though a lot of a lot of the citizens have taken time off from their lives today to be present, I think that uh, we're going to have more information before the next hearing. Their testimony will be more informed. So I, I, I would think the better course, this is me speaking, I'm not the one who took half day off as they did, is to have them testify the next time. But if I could uh, have 30 seconds to make a private phone call to one of the leaders of the group, uh, I could give you a firm answer. Is that acceptable? Um, yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, but um, I have no problem with that. But okay, um, I have no problem with the thirty second with the, well, however, a minute or two call to to your um, client. Um, but there are others on here who are not your clients too, and I want to see. And that doesn't preclude them from talking next time. Um, but if we have more information, we may have some more information. Uh, but I can't guarantee how much additional information we will have. But I do, I do at least want us, everyone, to have the opportunity to address some of the concerns that were already raised. So we're, how about we take a like two-minute break, Mr. Nelson? Will that help you right now? You're muted. Hold on, you're muted. Well, I guess that answer is yes. He walked away. <laughs> okay. okay. So we'll let's we'll resume in two minutes. Okay, I think it's important, and if you want me to say it, I'm... Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to make that phone call. I, I spoke with um, Mark Falzone, who is one of my clients, but he's been instrumental in, in sort of uh, shepherding the community to this hearing. And I asked him, uh, what about the folks I don't represent? And uh, uh, he suggested that either he or I could simply uh, say online whether there's someone who must testify today, in which case we would ask permission for him to do so. Uh, but 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 if they don't have to testify today, uh, our recommendation is uh, that they do it the next time. But we give them the opportunity to do it today if it's the only time they can do it. So I can make that statement to them, or you can, or Mr. Falzone can, or however you want to do it. Well, I was actually going to ask ask on the record to see if there's anyone who who's pressed for time and I'm and I'm talking January actually not December um, um, and so and, and the other thing um, I will tell you this um, um, Mr. Nelson you said um, you discussed site selection I I am here to tell you I I cannot guarantee um, site selection the county has selected the site I don't know but I um, I'm I'm not going to make that commitment to you right now because I don't want to say express something that perhaps we can't live up to. <clears throat> but I, do I heard those words. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So now, 
let me do it this way um, because I can't go through all of these names. Uh, there, um, let me see. I'm, I guess I could call the names of the people who haven't spoken, um, uh, and some didn't answer. So you have your clients. You're okay with your clients, um, Mr. Nelson. Your clients are okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. So I won't. Okay. So then, um, and and I may because I have so many lists. There's so many people signed up. I might inadvertently call one of yours, and you can correct me if I if I mistakenly do that. So Steve Setzer, are you on? Okay. Hold on, Miss Queen. You're talking. So hold, I didn't get to you, Miss Queen. So yes. Okay. Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. I'll pass. I just want to say thank you for the support. You guys are seeing things pretty clearly and I hope we can work something out. That's okay. all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Setzer. Okay. Um, Sharon Turner. Hi. Um, I'd like to pass until January. Okay. But thank you so much. Okay. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, now I know I called Crystal Delby before, Delbay before, right? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Do you wish to speak now, or do you wish to speak at a later date in January when we try to, if, if there's a motion? Yes, I can't hold off wait until January, and thank you for hearing um, our position. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Kelly Collins? Yes, I'm here. Okay, do you wish to speak now, or do you wish to hold off until a later date? I'll just go ahead and speak now. Okay, you can go forward. You can speak now. Okay, so <clears throat> my name is Kelly Collins. I live on Flemington Court in Brighton Place, um, and I'll be brief. I did not receive written notice of this project, and my main concern is the location and accessibility of the building, which was also mentioned before, but I want to reiterate the entrance to the shelter should not be on Ernie Banks, which feeds into our development. The facility should have its own driveway from Addison Road, not Ernie Banks. The parking lot should okay. not be should not be from Ernie Banks. Ms. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, I'm gonna stop yes. you for a second. Just for to hold your thought. Mr. Flanagan, can you pull up the site so that we can see the Ernie back the, the, the orientation maybe um no, maybe another one so we can see it better. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so you you're saying the entrance should not be on Ernie Banks. But it should be where? Mm -hmm. It should just be straight off of Addison Road. Okay. Like another entrance okay. with the top. Yes. Okay. Um, so the facility has a structure where the residents hang out. It's kind of like a porch. And so that's right, right near the um, sidewalk. Um, and I have been followed before by a resident of the facility. He didn't follow me all the way home, but he did follow me. Um, and if we didn't share a street, sidewalk, entrance, so forth, that kind of thing would be thwarted. Like, not that it would never happen, but it would be, we could safely walk in our, our area and not be, not have worry of being followed. Um, and that's pretty much all I want to say. I agree with Nicole Ford's statements, the man who spoke after her, and Arian. Um, is it Arian Cannon? Yes. Um, they really spoke directly to what I was, what I'm saying, what I agree with. And also, Dahlia Shea, which is my direct neighbor, and she was talking about my household. Mm -hmm. And I've, on many occasions, told my daughters not to walk, like if they're alone, not to walk you know, down or anything, just to avoid it, you know, just to avoid any situations that could happen. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you for letting me speak. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Okay, now, I, um, Tatiana Mallory, was she not on? I think we, we called her earlier. I'm here. Okay. Do you wish to speak now or do you wish to speak at a later date? I'm happy to wait until a later date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, did I do... Um, Donna Turner. Did I do Donna Turner? Okay, Donna Turner. Okay. Um, okay. L. I'm sorry. This, uh, I'm sorry, I'm but sorry. I wish not to speak. I okay. think all of my concerns were. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. 
Um, okay, L. Langevin. I, I know I'm. I would like that. to speak. Excuse me. I would like to speak if possible. Okay. Von yeah. Klein. Okay. Uh, and then please pronounce your name correctly for me. Please pronounce your name correctly for me, so I'll get it right maybe next time. Yes, uh, uh, Ronald Klein. Oh wait a minute! That's not who I called. I didn't call you. I'm saying L. Langvin. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep going down the list. Um, okay, so I did, there's no response here. Um, and then um, Wanda Collins. Okay, no, no response. Okay. Okay. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Um, the, the, let's see. Lonnie Monroe. Hello, I was trying to speak on behalf of L. Langvin. Are you an attorney? Is a statement that, Are you an attorney? No, well, is No, she wanted to wait, though. Okay, I can't have you speak for her, but if you have a statement that she, if we get, if it's continued, if you have a statement that she would like to put into the record, she can do that. Um, so long as Okay, it, I'll tell her she can, she can do that at the next meeting. Thank yes, you. Yes, but she's got to do it within, within the deadline for the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, did I say Lonnie Monroe? The, and Vincent Monroe. Okay, um, Deborah Cameron. Okay, um, Vaughn Ed Edmead. Okay, Nicholas um, Delbay. Alex Talleyrand. Yes, ma'am. Okay, do you, do you wish to speak now? We we also have your exhibit in the record, yes, too, just so you know. I can't hear you? I said we Can also you have your exhibit. I'm letting you know we have a copy of your exhibit, just so you know. Okay. I didn't present an exhibit, so I don't know. I heard that earlier, and I was curious. But so what exhibit? I, I thought you had, I, I, well, I could be wrong. I thought I had an email from you. Oh, you will then. Yeah, okay. If you if you consider that an exhibit. Yes, okay. and it, when you submit something into the record, yes, it becomes an exhibit. Yes, it's it's one of our opponents' exhibits. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Um. So. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to say um, that I'm opposed to the project. Um. And we yes we I mean no we did not get any um, notice. Um. And the reason why I'm opposed to the project is um, no one spoke about kids in the community. There are children in this community. And um, I've got to know the kids in the community because I was blessed enough um, to be able to work from home as a result of the virus. And the kids in the community are also out as well. And um, as a former New Yorker, uh, it's interesting to watch how safe this community is, where kids can leave their bikes on your lawn, on their lawn, and then two or three days later, come back and pick it up. I find that amazing, and um, I consider that I consider that also to be a blessing to live in a community that is that safe. I live maybe my address is sixty six one five Chance Place. I live uh, maybe fifty feet away from the current entrance and the proposed entrance, and I think that the traffic that the foot traffic that this uh, uh, this uh, building is going to generate will impact the quality of life of the kids in the community. Because as, a, as a, uh, 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 a member of the community with no kids, I look at the kids as mine as well, and I am just as responsible for them as their parents. So um, I keep an eye out on them, especially the fact that I'm home now. And so... Please, please reconsider um, at least, at the very least, the entrance, so that these individ the individuals who use the shelter will have no reason to come into our community 
um, especially for the kids. And that's really all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Mr. Talleyrand. And we, as I said, we have your exhibit. And as a native New Yorker myself, I find that um, leaving, I find it very amazing. And I wouldn't leave Prince George's County for anything in the world. Thank you. Um, Sean, Fer <laughs> Sean Ferguson. Okay. Um, Roland Sharp. Okay, now I have another um, person. There's someone who was trying to speak whose name I do, do not have on my list. You said a Clyde? Ronald Klein. Oh, Ronald Klein. I'm sorry. Is he, he's on yes, my list? Um, I'm going to decline till January, uh, but I am opposed to the uh, project, okay. and then I can state my uh, conditions on January. Thank you. Okay, so let me. Um, oh, yeah, you were for my first. Okay, got it. Okay, and then we have you. We I post. I have you um, because um, because you're represented by Mr. Nelson, correct? That's correct. Okay, so he said his folks do wish, do not wish to speak now. Okay, um, so I think. Um, so that concludes um, the list of people that I had signed up. Um, that's everyone. Uh, my name was there. What's your, who's, who's and, the, and who is it? The chief. Oh, I called you, I thought I called you earlier. Okay. Um, my name was also there, Peggy Boozer. Well, Peggy, I, Mr. Mr. May, um, Peggy Boozer, um, Mr. Nelson said he his the people that he represents had re wanted to wait until the next hearing, and I have you down as one of his clients. Is that not correct? That's not correct. And Belinda Queen, I see you shaking your head, so you're not his client. Okay. Yes, I am. I will be unable to attend a January meeting. Okay. Is that Miss Queen? Miss Queen speaking. Uh -huh. That's Boozer. A Peggy Boozer. Boozer. Okay, Miss Boozer. Hi, madam. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, Miss Boozer, then. So, do you wish to speak now? Very briefly. Okay. Please identify yourself for the record then. Okay. My name is Peggy Boozer. Mm -hmm. I'm a homeowner in the community of Rolling Ridge, located less than a mile from the slated uh, shelter. Okay. Um, Rolling Ridge is not just a development, it is a neighborhood of 144 all brick homes that are situated on large lots. Mm -hmm. built in the early and mid-1950s. Uh, I'm going to attempt not to echo the sentiments that have preceded me, but I need to say that I would like to be like, let it be absolutely clear that in principle, I support government social programs that seek to address the needs of its citizenry. We are not in opposition with that. Uh, the second point that I would like to make is that the erection of a men's shelter cannot be viewed, as earlier speakers have said, in a vacuum with a systemic disregard for the needs of the surrounding area. I appeal to you to make the recommendations that reflect the input that you have received today and that we were unable to communicate in a December 1st meeting. Let's do the right thing for the whole area. Uh, it is not right to provide for the needs of the less fortunate without total disregard for the needs of homeowners. All development is interrelated and impacts a larger area. The remedy, as I see it, and which has been communicated today is that we must do the right thing otherwise we are complicit in furthering uh, furthering the disparity that exists with an underserved area the remedy as I see it is to halt the process and let's start over let's begin again if we miss the mark earlier, we don't have to miss the mark in the future. I appreciate the opportunity to share those sentiments, and I wanted to go on the record uh, as a representative 
of the Rolling Ridge Civic Association, the small community is bordered by Central Avenue, Addison Road, uh, Wilburn Drive, and Cabin Branch Road. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Boozer. We appreciate it. Okay, Ms. Queen. Okay, put my camera on. Thank you so very much, you guys. I got a board meeting, so it's been a long day. But anyway, so let me speak on behalf of the Wilburn community and as um extra well as elected official representing the school board. So let me start with saying um, greetings, Madam Chair, and to the board. My name is Belinda Queen, and I live in the Wilburn community, and I've actually lived here for over 40 years. Um, as stated by the previous speaker, the Wilburn and the Roller Ridge community has been here since 1965, and we have heard this area through our tax dollars, okay? And I just want to say that I am the Vice President of the Coalition of Central Civic Association. I'm also Officer Wilburn, and I'm an elected school board member in this community. And I would never, I was never noticed, received a written, written notice of any type of notice about this hearing. And you all know that I'm very involved in the community and I know what's going on. But I was shocked when I got the call from Mark and I reached out to other community leaders and none of us knew about the development of this project. The lack of communication for this project you know, alone is a reason to actually stop this project because it does seem like some underhand stuff was going on. And I have to say, we have came to you guys several times in our community, me and my president, the stage that we have asked for a recreation center for the community, which is so needed. Recreation centers have been up in areas that are new. In our area, we've actually been overlooked. And how dare you guys do a shelter five times as bigger, and we can't even get a community center, and we've been in this community paying tax dollars for years, and we can't get a community center. Not only that, I look at the schools. We've been working so hard through the county trying to get a new central high school or trying to get Walker Mill Middle Schools. Our schools have a bestest. They have mold. They have mildew. They have a bad HVAC system. But yet we can still get a shelter five times bigger and not invest in our students in this community. It is something wrong because we are not putting kids first in our change. No one wants to see our public space double as a living quarter that is not going to do anything to engage the next generation. Actually, when it comes to our school system, we have to prepare our kids for a better, not to prepare them to say shelter is the way because the shelter is not the way. If we would make changes in this county to make housing more affordable, then maybe that would be a different. From experience growing up and living in a community in Wilburn since over 19, since 1980, I've walked this community. I actually went to college in this area. My sister then went to school in this area. So I know what's going on. I've seen, and it's, I've seen where the guys are kicked out the shelters during the daytime and they walk up in the community. I've seen where some of them are hanging out, or drinking some of them in wheelchairs, sell them some of them, selling them drugs. And I fear not only for just my life back in the day, but now for my children and for the next generation. Okay. The shelter, what, what really makes me feel upset is that no one came out to reach out to us to talk about the issues that may be brought from the shelter so we can work and make sure that whatever is going to be put there, however they're going to do it, that it benefits and is better for the community. So what I'm asking you guys to do is to really to look at this, think about what you're actually bringing to the community, reach out and talk to the community members because we know what's been going on in our community. We actually see we actually know what benefits are needed to actually make the even to make the shelter that's already there better. I know there's a lot of churches, a lot of ministers, a lot of community members, and not only donate, they come out, they do things for the guys in the shelter. Because one of my churches are one of the ones that do oh, that, and minute, we have wait, no problem doing that. Hold on a second, Miss Queen. I think I I suspect the interpreter her her hands are so her fingers are probably aching. That's the first thing. I I meant to say that you will never be able to keep up with me because I'm a fast talker and I do apologize for that. I, that was the first thing I really meant to say when you guys said you was going to have an interpreter. <laughs> so let me just say I, I am a fast talker by nature and that's just me. Um, so try. as I close, as I was saying, um, okay, as I close, as I was saying, there's a lot of changes that do be made, but most of all and first of all, we need to reach out to community. You need to talk to us. Okay. Um, we need to talk about the issues that, that's already there and how we can make it a better place, not just put something in the community and you have talk. In fact, these these facilities seem to be overwhelming, and I know someone has said it, and I know, Chair, you disagree, but they are. They're overwhelming in the Capitol Heights area. I can tell you a couple of shelters and homes and stuff like that are just in Capitol Heights alone. Okay. The lack of advanced warming was particularly 
It's a soil side to our community. So this process has serious flaws and we're requesting that you just step back and get okay. them public input from the beginning. So I do thank you guys for your time. Okay, let me stop you for a second, Ms. Queen. Even I couldn't keep up with you. And and I talk fast. I've had to try to slow down here. <laughs> probably, probably not successfully. But you've said a number of things. Some were related to this case, some not. I see you very strategically slipped in that community, the recreation center in there, because you've come to our budget forums for that. The recreation center, you, that's this whole separate issue that's not germane to this. And that comes under Park and Planning Commission as determined by the Prince George's County Council. So they, they you know, we, we can't provide everything everywhere. So the council looks at our budget and they deal with where we have recreational facilities. Um, and, we're, and we are playing catch up in some areas. I will concede that. Um, you're talking about the new high school out of, out of my, out of our hands. That's not something that the planning board does. I, I think you're, you're talking about a whole boatload of different entities in one presentation. So, um, so you, you know, to say how dare we do this and not provide a recreation center is, um, I, I would say that's an unfair characterization, but I know you mean well. We know you. We know. I, I what, we know. We know. The thing you, is, if we can find, we know yeah, how passionate you are. Let's build. I got it. We know how passionate you are. We know that you fight for your community. The other thing you said was that you were um, on, obviously on the school board, and we do know that. And I think I heard you say that you were speaking on behalf of the school board. So that, and I wanted to make sure that that, that my, that's accurate. Are you speaking for yourself, or yeah, the I'm, school board took a vote? I am speaking on behalf of the community of District Six. I represent District Six. I represent the students and community members that walk in this area. So I am speaking on behalf of District Six. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Exactly let me I just want to make sure I'm clear for my notes. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Because um, because I'm writing this stuff down. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, all right, Miss Queen. We, we got you. We heard you, and we appreciate the fact that you um, spoke Thank on behalf you. of your community with so much passion okay um okay so Thanks. thank you so that i think at this point concluded the list that we had um Madam Chair. mr hurd okay yes good, good afternoon Madam Chair. i just uh bradley here for the record um i'm fine with hanging uh back until january as well i just wanted uh, the planning board to note that I did submit a uh, written correspondence. Yes, you did. Uh, yesterday, um, and I just wanted to echo Mr. Nelson's uh, point that site selection needs to be the beginning point uh, of any reconsideration of this by the county. Um, the process needs to start with site selection, uh, and then we can talk about building design. But beyond that, I'll wait until a new hearing date. But I would um, come into the to the uh, planning board. Uh, my written correspondence. Okay, Thank so you. here's your written correspondence. I don't know if the camera can see it. And yes, it did. And you didn't submit it yesterday. You submitted it before yesterday because that's why it made the deadline. Okay, it made the two. You're correct. It You're did, correct. It did meet the 12 noon to, um, Tuesday deadline. So, and and I have poured over this, and I got my tabs and everything. So I've gone over every legal argument that you have in it. I agree with Thank some. You, I don't, not necessarily all of them. But I, I am, I, as I said to Mr. Nelson before, I cannot commit to the site selection. So I, I want to be clear. I do not want to be misleading to anybody. But I, what I do want to do is, is, and we can go forward. I don't even know what the motion is going to be. I cannot make motions. I just believe in my heart that um, you, everyone deserves another opportunity. Um, with more information and and to address at least some of the concerns that have been raised. I know the county is watching and they care and they're listening and to the extent that we can remedy the fact that you all didn't have the notice and, and, and don't feel that you've been heard, um, I think that's a good opportunity for everyone regardless of whatever the outcome is. I can't speak to that either. But I do think you all deserve the opportunity to um, be heard and get some of these um, uh, matters addressed. Okay. So now, I'm going once, going twice, going three times. I think I've called on everybody that's on the list. Um, Ms. Borden, did you want to address something now? 
Madam Chair, I believe there was one more citizen, Jean Paul Batiste. Oh, okay. I I'm, thought so, I heard. I'm so sorry. Okay, I can't. Oh, and another thing is, I'm told that here that people are using the chat box. That chat box is an inappropriate way to communicate substantive information. The, the board um, makes a determination based on on everything that is in our record, all the exhibits that have been submitted, as well as um, the testimony that we hear. And all of that is important. The outside external things are ex parte. So as a, by way of example, this board does not have the information that all of this um, does not have the information that was taking place, you know, a couple of years ago because it did not come before the board. So when it comes before the board, then we get you know, information and that is when we start to, to do our own analysis based on everything that we're hearing, including the testimony. So we, we weren't privy to all of that um, it, um, that took place, you know, a long time ago. So, um, um, okay, so Mr. Um, okay, where's this list? John, I, I had it here. Oh, okay, Jean Paul Petit. Petit? Yes, Petit. Petit. Um, good evening. Um, I'd like to um, speak at a later date, but I just wanted to, I don't know if I could just make one simple point, just so it's for the record or whatever. Is that allowed? Um, you, you can do that. All right, so I just wanted to make sure that we didn't realize that the address of this facility is um, Addison Road, but I had more to say and I will say that at a later point. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. And um, Ms. Uh, Klotz, I thank you for, um, I'm glad to see your name. I want to thank you, um, to thank the interpreters for, for your help during this. Um, hmm? um, uh, so I do want to thank you. Uh, you. You may have to go soak after this. Um, Ms. Borden. I'm here, Madam Chair. Okay, so you said you um, you had something to add at this point. Um, well, I again will defer to Madam Chair's discretion. I wanted to uh, sort of speak at the end to um, sort of give an overview of what mandatory referral is and is not, because I think there's a lot of misconception about what it is and a lot of confusion between the state law, the local ordinance, and how it all works. I think we are so at the end. It, okay, so if that for today, would work, for today, I think. Um, okay, so, so, um, so just to just to give a really brief overview, and I will turn my camera on if it makes and, uh, and brief. It let me just say this: um, Does anybody know what time our clock? How much? Ten minutes. Okay, so you have we have to sign off. Okay, go ahead. We have to sign off soon, and then we'll get a new number if needed. Um, okay, Ms. Borden. Okay, I, I'm going to run through very very quickly just a few things that I heard that were just not correct. Okay, mandatory referral arises out of sovereign immunity. All right, because the sovereign from common law in England could not be responsible for following his own laws. That is the law that we brought over uh, when the colonies were formed. Okay. Now you have so, to identify. You have to define sovereign immunity because not not all of us are lawyers. Right. I, okay. That, that's what I'm trying to okay, do. So, you. so the sovereign is not actually subject to its own laws, and for our purposes, the sovereign is the state of Maryland. The state of Maryland is only subject to those laws that it is specifically uh, uh, waiving immunity for. And how it does that is it passes a law that says state of Maryland, its instrumentalities shall be subject to forest conservation laws. That actually happens. And so forevermore, until that law gets changed, the state of Maryland and its instrumentalities, including municipalities and, and uh, counties, will then be subject to the Forest Conservation Act but only if they have a specific provision in state law that, that says that they must be. So zoning is like that, except 
zoning has never been waived by the state of Maryland. Maryland has never passed a law that says that the state and its instrumentalities are subject to zoning. That means that they are not subject to zoning. That means that the county, the municipalities, the commission itself is not subject to zoning at all under any circumstances. That means the commission can build a facility regardless of what the zone says you can build in that location. That means the county can do the same thing. This has been the law forever, for as long as the state of Maryland has existed. Okay, Zoning has never been something that could be enforced upon a government entity, ever. And nothing's changed. The only thing that has changed is when the state of Maryland decided to do this really odd, interesting regional district where they, they created a commission that would deal with the parks and planning function for the two largest counties in Maryland, Montgomery and Prince George's, they decided to create this new process called mandatory referral. The process does not uh, waive it does not waive sovereign immunity for zoning. It does no such thing. The process simply says that the commission shall review public projects within the regional district, which is roughly Montgomery and Prince George's counties, and it specifically says that county projects are under the exclusive jurisdiction of the planning board, the respective planning board under its mandatory referral review. That means that the county is exempt from zoning because it can only be subject to zoning if the state says it is because the county is a creation of the state, an extension or instrumentality of the state. So mandatory referral exists as a process only to review these public projects that are not subject to zoning. And that means that when we have our uniform uh, standards, those that, that's a process manual. That's a process manual that the, the staff has drafted and that the commission has approved in accordance with the law, but it's not the law. The staff does not have legislative authority. They can't write laws and neither does the commission. The commission doesn't write law. The uniform standards are just a, a, a blueprint for how the staff goes about reviewing projects under mandatory referral because there's nothing in the law that tells us how we have to review these projects. So we had to figure it out for ourselves. And that's what we did. And the uniform standards just gives us information as to what we should be looking for so that we try to standardize it, so that we try to make sure that when we're dealing with other public agencies, we deal with them fairly, and we deal with them in a, in a manner that is consistent across the board. It also gives the public agencies the information that they need to plan for their projects, so that they can see that, oh, this is going to take 60 days, or this is going to take 30 days, and they can put that plan into their project schedule. It has nothing to do with establishing findings of fact or conclusions of law because the mandatory referral process doesn't do that. The mandatory referral process only establishes information that we can give and we can decide that we feel so strongly about something that we want to say, you know, this is just not a good idea. We can say whatever we want to say to a public agency, but the public agency has the discretion and the authority to do a project based on what they want to do and they can make that decision within their own process. We do not have the authority to tell any public agency that they cannot build a building or that they cannot acquire a piece of land. The other thing I wanted to make sure utterly clear completely clear. Site selection is not subject to mandatory referral. Acquisition of land is subject to mandatory referral, not site selection. 
the county already owned this property. Therefore, their determination to use this property as opposed to another property to do an expanded shelter is not something that we can review under mandatory referral. Acquisition is something we can review. This was not an acquisition. This property was acquired in 1967. So that ship has sailed. We cannot review that. We cannot do anything about that. Okay, so um, hopefully that explains most of what was going on. I know we had some information about master plan conformance. No, there is no master plan conformance because the zoning ordinance doesn't apply. So you can't have master plan conformance when you don't even have the zoning ordinance that applies to a public project. Um, we look at master plan conformance because that's what we do. We write and, and, and um, develop master plans. We look at transportation. We look at uh, environmental. That is, those are the areas of expertise that the planning department has, which is why we do mandatory referrals, so that we can provide information to other public entities so that they can make their projects better, hopefully. Um, but not so that we can tell them that they can't do their project, because we have no authority to do that. No authority whatsoever. Okay. So hopefully that is helpful, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. I am, I am looking at our planning um, director now to, um, to find out a date in, in January. We have to, we have to um, balance this with our already packed agendas in, in January. And, and looking at her, she's suggesting that the four, January 14th is, is, is a day that's not as, as hectic as some of the others. Um, what I will do, I will, at, but I'm not a motion maker, so we'll see if the motion, um, if this motion fails, then, then you know, we have to, um, if there's no motion for this, then we will go back. Um, um, if, in fact, there is a motion to continue this, Madam to, Chair. just a second, if, in fact, there is a motion to continue this to January 14th, what I would like to do is um, take the time to um, assess our agenda and get notice to everyone and also get an interpreter again or, t or two and and try to hold harmless to a specific time so that you're not um, waiting around indefinitely. Okay, now who, was that you, Mr. Nelson, who was speaking? Um, who was asking? Oh, Commissioner Geraldo. No, that was me, Commissioner Geraldo. Oh, okay, okay. All right, Commissioner Geraldo. I was prepared to make a motion. Okay. Yes, I, I move that the, uh, we continue this mandatory referral case MR 1915A to January 14th, 2021. Um, Madam Chair, it's Commissioner Washington. Um, I, I'd like to second, um, and if we move into discussion, I have some additional comments. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we do need some additional comments, but they can only be like five minutes worth because otherwise you, we have to you, get on another line. Okay. You so, got it. And they're, and they're full of thanks. Uh, and let me begin by thanking, oh, let me turn my camera on. Um, okay. I want to thank our interpreters who have done a wonderful job. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, also thank our staff. Um, who um, did a good job in getting us to today. But, but finally, I think most importantly, um, I just think that today's discussion was an exemplary example of civic engagement by our citizens. Um, you know, Madam Chair, you stated it earlier. A couple of my colleagues um, were, were, were consistent in their comments. Um, but, but, you know, look, we are all Prince Georgians. Uh, we love this community, and everybody loves their own community. And while we are uh, restricted in some ways largely, well, not largely, but absolutely by law in terms of what we could do, um, you, you know, uh, everyone who testified without question, without question, um, indicated that there was no notice and no opportunity for civic engagement. 
and whether uh, and I think Madam Chair, I, well, I not I think you I know you said this earlier. Whether it changes anything or not, uh, at the absolute minimum, you know, collaboration and engagement and input by all who are impacted by anything that we do in this community, for me, is an absolute. I mean, that's that's the starting point. Uh, and for, for the citizens who this may be your first time before this particular board or planning committee, a uh, planning commission, um, but we take very seriously and we admonish everyone who comes before us to ensure that they are absolutely engaging with the community and taking those concerns to heart and making sure that where possible there can be um, uh, you know, mutual resolution or, or, or mutual or, or compromise, if you will, uh, wherever possible. So I just want to I just want to thank you. Thank you all. Um, your, your, again, your, your comments were, were, were thoughtful. Um, and uh, I, I just I know we're short on time. So let me just stop there because I know my colleagues may want to have other comments as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, and okay. I do too. Thank you, Commissioner Washington. And I have comments as well, but I'm going to hold mine to last um, if there's time. So Vice Chair Bailey. Well, since I know we're short on time, I want to associate myself with uh, Commissioner Washington's comments and thank, thank the citizens for coming. Uh, the citizens in that district are some of the finest citizens we have in all of Prince George's County. I know that area very, very well. And, and I thank you all for coming, and I am just so proud of you. And I'm also the, proud of our staff. When I listened to our attorney speak a few minutes ago, we've got some of the finest staff people in, in, the, in the country. And, and thank you all so very much for coming out. And I could say more of what I'm sure other people want to say something, but thank you all for coming. We really do appreciate it. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner. Um, yeah, I'll just associate myself with the comments of um, my colleagues that have come before me. Um, they're, they're much wiser and, and more eloquent than I would have said it, and, and I totally agree. Thank you. Co uh, Commissioner Geraldo. You know, we only have a few minutes. Yes. But I think all of the commissioners have expressed our concern and our love for our county and especially for our residents who express themselves so well there's a lot we, we hear from a lot of residents uh, the ones that were today you can see are committed and we appreciate that we always can't do everything that they want but we always listen thank you um commissioner Gervaldo. and i you know honestly i will just say ditto to everything i think um commissioner washington said it so beautifully and echoed by everyone else. Um, we're truly thankful to the citizens. We hear you. Um, we'll, I think um, this will give us an opportunity on January 14th uh, to hear more and to have more information for you. And, and hopefully through collaboration, at least some of your concerns may be addressed. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so we have a motion and we have a second. We've had discussion. I'm going to call for the vote. Madam Vice Chair. Vote aye. Uh, Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay. The ayes have it 5-0. January 14th. I don't know the exact time yet, but we will try to um, post it. We'll try to get a, a narrow it down for a specific time, especially since we will have a, an interpreter as well. So stay tuned. And um, and if you need, if you have other exhibits, make sure you get everything in on the Tuesday before the hearing. So that would be that by 12 noon on the 12th. If you intend, well, I think those who are signed up today are good. Um, but if um, so, but make sure you, if you have any additional exhibits, you get them in by that Tuesday before the 12th, as I announced. We get week in and week out, and it's posted on our website and um, um, and in the staff uh, and posted in our agenda as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, take really good care, and it is civic engagement at its best. Mr. Hunt, are you on? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm here. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hunt. Is there any additional business to come before the Prince George's Planning Board today? There are no additional business items before the board today. Thank you all. Thank you. Planning Board is adjourned.
Everyone, please stay safe. Thank you. And to the citizens, uh, first of all, happy Hanukkah. Happy holidays Bye. to everyone. Everyone take really good care. Look out, stay safe. T look out for one another. Okay, it's really important. Thank you.